Okay, so let's just share my desktop. Okay, I'm looking at the delay and we're good. So uh, welcome to Perf Matters. And uh, this is a 2020 edition. Thank you for joining us. I know that it's some of you, this is gonna be really difficult because you have all of your Zoomates uh, all around you. Um, but you know what, we're all human. And so if your kids start screaming, if your dogs start barking, that's all part of uh, what we're going through right now. So two years ago was our first edition and we had about 270 people in attendance and it was fantastic. And then last year we had about 320 people in attendance and it was fantastic. And today uh, we are 220 people calling from uh, their homes, all individual, um, all hanging out. Um, and thank you for Alfredo for this picture. Um, a lot of you uh, received a little gift package and this is your care package to make the conference uh, feel like you're there. So included in that is your badge and your bracelet. Please put them on because you'll need that to get into the sessions. You actually won't, but you might as well feel like you're here. Um, so I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors. I want to thank uh, Chrome. They are uh, sponsoring actually the technical part here today. And so we have Jeff and um, and Mark working in the background. You won't see them, but they're the ones who are making this whole thing uh, work and happen. Um, I also want to thank GoDaddy, which uh, without their contribution, uh, this would have been a burden that I would not have been able to handle. Uh, Front End Masters, they are awesome. They are supporting, they have wonderful videos. And uh, by the way, this uh, th uh, we are recording all of these. The banter will not be posted. The party will not be posted online, but all of the um, talks will be recorded and posted uh, to YouTube. And we're actually live streaming to YouTube right now. Um, so they won't be able to actively participate like you all will that are in this room, but the content is gonna be out there. Um, I wanna thank Mozilla. We have a uh, live captioning uh, because of their contribution. So if you, uh, can't hear what I'm saying, which is a really stupid thing for me to say uh, right now. But um, there was an email sent out and it had the live captioning uh, information. And it's also on the 411 uh, document that I sent out. I also want to thank Speed Curve, Precise Moves, and Sticker Mule, their uh, community supporters that have helped make some of the smaller things possible. So we have a code of conduct. And even though we are online, the code of conduct is still enforced. So we, one of the main things about this conference is diversity and inclusion, and we can only ensure that we have uh, diverse um, in, uh, attendees and speakers if we have an inclusive environment. So for that reason, we uh, try to guarantee a harassment-free conference experience for everyone no matter what, whether no matter their gender, gender identity, expression, age, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, ethnicity, religion, or lack thereof, um, employer, employment status, or even their technology of choice. So I tend in my personal days to, uh, to make fun of certain tech stacks. Um, I have stopped doing that a while ago, um, except from private channels, uh, but it's inappropriate. Yes. Um, so we do not tolerate harassment of conference participants or anyone in any form. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate. So we have Slack channels today and there's a photos and there's going to be hangouts and there's going to be conversations. If you would not make that joke to your, H, your female HR director at work, don't make the joke here. It's not funny. Um, so on Slack, on Hangouts, on Twitter, and on other online media that's associated with the conference, don't do that. And don't do that in general anyway. Um, we don't want to see those pictures. 
And unlike, or in addition to all of uh, the code of conduct, which says what you can't do, we actually say what you should do. Uh, we expect participants to be proactively nice, respectful, and inclusive of everyone, from the participants to the speakers, to the organizers, to the tech teams, and to your Zoom mates. So to your dogs and children and other roommates running around, be nice to everyone. Uh, that includes, we are going to have uh, some Google Hangouts. And when someone joins the room and they're not in your little click, uh, you don't say, hey, we're having a conversation here, you're not welcome unless it is a private one, and then you should be creating your own private zone. I mean, if you're in the middle of a therapy session, that should be one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but people are going to be entering uh, the different uh, Google Hangouts later on. And I want everyone to include everyone and to say, hey, come on in, what's your name? Welcome to the conversation. And this is what we were talking about and bring them up to date so that they feel super included. Uh, so our code of conduct, this was the short version. The long version is on the on the website and it's perfmattersconf.com slash code. And if you have any issues, you can DM me on Slack, you can uh, email me, you can um, do whatever um, uh, means necessary. And if you if I'm the issue, you can um, send it to diversity or tickets at perfmattersconf.com and Michelle will review it and handle it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what you received and what it all means. So we are going to have networking options. Everyone who got a care package got four stickers. On the front of the sticker was the face of a fab, uh, fabulous uh, speaker that um, we got their face in time. Some of them, uh, you'd, there's no stickers here for some people because we got them uh, at a later point. We still have rooms for them. So all of these stickers were sent out to people. You got four different ones. On one side was a face. On the back side was an orange, blue, green, or red smiley face on each one. So you got one of each. During the first break, which is the green break, take the sticker that has a green smiley, or in some cases it was a green star because I ran out of smiley stickers. Um, on one side, you'll see that. Turn it around. And during the green break, that is the room you will enter. Um, so, uh, so find those stickers and that's how you know. During the green break, I would like everyone to go to their assigned room uh, because that way everyone gets to meet new people. After that, you'll start meeting people and you can go off and there'll be other hangouts on specific topics. But during the green one, uh, meet people you wouldn't have otherwise met. Um, so that's that for that. Um, I have Schwag, uh, uh, Michelle, who's helping me out with uh, today and the party and helping me keep me on track during this conference organizing, um, uh, built us some fantastic swag. So we have a Twitter banner, a Facebook banner, and um, uh, a desktop and a mobile. Uh, you know, so you can have your whole screen set up. So go to Schwag to pick those up. Uh, we also have the balloons, so decorate your office. And during lunch, uh, you can post pictures of um, of your room in the photos on Slack, or you can post them during lunch and actually raise your hand and say, I'd like to show uh, you my room. So uh, decorate and make this a happy experience. Oh, I forgot to say, uh, if you did not get the... Um, if you did not get the stickers and you don't know which room to enter because you didn't get the stickers, find out what your registration number is. Whatever the last digit is, that's the room you should enter. It was those instructions were sent on the email last, uh, yesterday. So we have a game of bingo. We've sent everyone a bingo card. If you don't have a bingo card, there is a 16 megabyte download of 50 bingo cards. What you do is you do your registration number modulo 50 plus one and that is the page of the bingo that you should pick if that is too complicated just pick one of the bingo cards from that uh, 50 page download and stick to one because uh, you could cheat and you could win earlier uh, but cheating is uh, not fun and I think the winner of it gets a roll of toilet paper 
I'm not sure what the prizes are going to be yet, uh, but uh, we, we will uh, come up with some uh, some uh, prizes. If you need toilet paper, I can mail you some. Uh, we have a talent show at the end and we don't have enough talent. Um, so if you have any talents whatsoever, be that a hacky sack or decorating your office or uh, mixing martinis or non-alcoholic drinks or uh, blowing bubbles or um, flipping your kids upside down or making your dog fall asleep on command, uh, let us know what your talent is and let us know uh, what you uh, uh, what you have to offer, and then we will add you to the schedule of the party. If all else fails, we're going to turn to karaoke. So there is a link in the 411 document, and the, that document that I'm referring to is perfmatters.com slash 411. That is where all the information is, where everything is keeps getting updated. So sign up for the talent show, sign up for, um, pick a song for karaoke. If you have a song that's not there, um, that you want to do during karaoke or during the talent show, let us know ahead of time so we can grab that um, video and um, and get it uh, up for you. Oh, there's also some Perf Matter stickers. So uh, you can, uh, I haven't done it yet, but I have a glass of water. I will make this my Perf Matters water bottle uh, with a sticker later on. And uh, the twisty balloons. Twisty balloons are super hard to blow up. If you have one of these, they're super easy, but most of you don't. So where did I put my twisty balloons? I lost my twisty balloons. Anyhow, if you uh, got twisty balloons, they were in the care package, uh, blow uh, and you have all day to do it, stretch it, stretch it, figure out how to put some air into it. Um, and we are going to be using two of them today for sure. Uh, leave one with one inch, that's approximately uh, 2.5 centimeters at the end at the tip so that uh, for one of the designs we'll make. And then for another one, leave about seven inches at the end for another design we're going to make. So uh, don't hurt yourself blowing those balloons up. Networking demo. So this is a note to me that I should be uh, uh, doing a networking demo. So where is my demo? Okay, so this is the Google Doc. When you it's when it's time to do a demo, you're going to click on one of these. So I'll just go into Trent's the room called Trent. And right here, once a second person comes in this will turn green. Click on this icon right here um, for those, uh, it's, a, it's an icon of a camera and that will uh, make you join. So you will, if you click on Trent, you'll automatically get this chat, but during the breaks, we're gonna have an actual hangout um, in small groups of 10 people. So click on that, that will uh, get, that will call into the void and someone else is calling into the void. You two will get connected and then anyone else who calls in. So you do have to press on that little button. Uh, so back to here, the show, the network demo, live captioning. Um, so this is yesterday's live captioned uh, text. You were sent a URL with today's live captioned text. So we're trying to work on getting the live captioning directly in Zoom, but uh, click on that URL that's in the 411 sheet. Uh, on the Tuesday uh, link, which is the Tuesday link, it's right here. Click on this link right here to see today's captioning. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. And you can see their captioning right there. So that's the live captioning. So if you want live captioning, there it is. Um, and the last one, it says Zoom mates. Um, please, you know, be cognizant of the fact that we are all human. We're doing this from our own homes. People have dogs, people have cats. There's trucks that are going to be driving by. Um, uh, you know, this should be fun. Um, that said, we have a Slack channel 
And we are going to try to make this a COVID-19 free zone. So that is why we are not uh, using Twitter today because we don't want everyone to be on Twitter and to get depressed and stay off your work slack. In fact, we have a bunch of, um, Pipe cleaners. You might be wondering why you got pipe cleaners. Instead of fiddling on your computer, fiddle with your fingers, create little uh, humans or people or dogs with these things. Here I made a head and I can make some arms. Play with these, um, do whatever you can um, to, oh, and we're gonna have a competition as to who did the best one of these. Um, tomorrow you can um, win another roll of toilet paper. Um, the point of uh, these is to keep your fingers busy. And the reason I bring it up with COVID-19 is if you wanna talk about COVID-19, there is a Slack room to talk about that. Please leave the main thread, um, a happy place where we can just take the day off from the news um, and from everything else um, and, just, uh, and just think about performance, web development um, and life from a month and a half ago. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I am going to introduce uh, Katie, if Katie wants to unmute, because she is the other MC. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I should have told you that I was going to do that. That's okay. <laughs> um, we can't see you. So let's uh, see if we can get uh, two faces up at the same time. There, we can get three faces. So nice. Katie, I will let you do the introduction. Yeah, hi. Um, just first of all, I'm Katie Siler Miller. Um, I'm a software engineer at Etsy. And um, this is my third Perf Matters Conf and I am like super, super, super mega excited to be here. I'm glad that we could still all get together and learn a ton of amazing stuff from a bunch of really, really awesome and talented speakers. And um, the first really, really awesome and talented speaker today is Ire Adirinokun. I, <laughs> did I get even close on that? <laughs> and she's awesome. And so yeah, Ire, it, was, it was good. Awesome. So <laughs> Ire has an absolutely mind blowing list of accomplishments on her bio. She's currently the COO and VP of engineering at Bycoins which is a um, cryptocurrency exchange based in Africa where Ira is now. Um, she is a you know, co-founder of that. She's a self-taught web front-end developer. She's written hundreds of articles on topics of HTML, CSS, JavaScript. On her awesome blog, I totally recommend going to it. It's uh, bitsofco.be. Um, she loves to share her knowledge with everybody. And while she's been stuck at home, the way that she's been keeping herself busy is by making a lot of TikTok videos. And I'm an old fogey and I'm not on TikTok and I don't really completely understand what it does or how it works other than uh, viral videos seem to come out of it. So I'm personally gonna like cross my fingers and hope that <laughs> E-Ray becomes internet famous through her viral TikTok videos, so. Um, with that, I will pass it to Iray. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks for that introduction. That was great. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try and share. Let's hope this works because I don't know. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, we see you. Okay, perfect. Great. No technical difficulties yet. <laughs> Um, so hi everyone, um, good morning or afternoon, evening, wherever you are. I'm really happy to actually be like kicking off this conference. I'm sure for all of us, it's a welcome break from all the, the current, I guess, apocalypse is what I like to call it, <laughs> that's kind of going on. So um, like I said, my name is Iri and I'm here to talk to you about the seemingly crazy world of performance metrics. So let's see. So when I was writing this talk a few months ago, um, before the apocalypse, <laughs> I was going to give this whole spiel about how in countries like Nigeria, where I'm from, the cost of mobile data is pretty high relative to minimum wage. So it's about 3% for just one gigabyte of data. 
And that's more than one full hour of work, which is pretty crazy. And even in countries like the US, where the minimum wage is higher, the cost of data is also higher. So minimum wage employees have to work almost two hours just to earn enough to get one gigabyte of data. And I don't know about you, but I can definitely use one gigabyte in like, I don't know, an hour or <laughs> a day if I'm not connected to Wi-Fi. So that just seems kind of crazy to me that it will cost so much. And I was going to discuss how even if you're not building for users that are data conscious out of necessity, having a more performant website is always just going to be like a competitive advantage. And that's why in almost all the popular websites and applications, they're investing heavily in providing light and performant websites or having data saver modes within their mobile applications because they know that being more performant and just using up less of people's data is just gonna make them a better application and more people will be more likely to use them. Because in this day and age, having a performant website is basically just like having good service, except your users are going to be a lot, a lot less patient. I mean, if you think about it, if you went to a restaurant and it was taking like a while before you got seated. You might wait maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And the thing is, the longer you wait, the more invested you get because you don't want to have to go and start all over again in a different restaurant. So you have this really high switching cost. But on the web, it's completely different. Users are 90% more likely to abandon a page that takes just five seconds to load. And that's mainly because there's none of that switching cost. A user can be in the equivalent of five different restaurants at the same time, and they just go with whichever one happens to, to seat them first. But at this point, I think the biggest argument for why performance is important is just kind of looking at where we are right now. I mean, we're all supposed to be in sunny California, enjoying like the conference in person, but in this health crisis that we're facing, everyone's working from home, leaning more and more on internet services, so having a performant website isn't really just like a nice to have anymore. It's just becoming more and more actually critical and important. So um, I already had this amazing intro, so I don't think I really need to go over all this stuff. Um, I am currently in London, actually. Like I was supposed to go back to Nigeria, but kind of got stuck here. So <laughs> I feel like this should be part of everyone's bio. Like, where are you quarantined or in lockdown? and uh, yeah, some other uninteresting information. <laughs> so yeah, we know that having a performant website is important, but what does it actually mean to have a quote unquote performant website? So we all know that there's a time between when a user enters a URL into their browser and when the web page is fully loaded. So making a website more performance is ultimately going to be about reducing that time in between to basically as little as possible or even like zero, maybe one day we'll get there. And the only way we can reduce that time is by knowing what it is in the first place. And that's where performance metrics come in. So back in the day, measuring performance was as simple as taking the time before we get to the onload events, which was when the page and all its resources were fully loaded. And we do something like just take the dates at the top of the document. Then after the load events, we'll take the date again and then compare the two times. And if you want it to be even more fine tuned, like if you were like a real performance expert, you might use the DOM content loaded event to know when the DOM has been constructed. But a lot happens between these two events. And that's kind of what has given birth to the state of performance metrics today. We have a seemingly crazy amount of metrics that measure every bit of process, every bit of the process of loading the page. And it can definitely seem incredibly overwhelming to just have metric after metric all the time. And luckily there are frameworks we can use to kind of better understand these metrics and what they're actually for. I really like these four questions that are adapted from the web.dev websites. And they kind of just organize metrics based on what is the user experience they're actually trying to track. So first the question is their content. And this is just about measuring if there's some, basically any response to the user um, after they've like tried to navigate to the page. And the metrics that are relevant to this are time to first bite, first paints, first contentful paints. 
So time to first byte measures the time from when the browser requests the page to the first byte of the page being received. And this is really useful for measuring the round trip between the user's device and the server. So it's not really a user centric metric because even at time to first byte, the user doesn't get any feedback yet, but it can be really useful to know if this particular round trip is the bottleneck to other metrics. So first paint measures the time when the first pixel is painted on the screen. And this can be any pixel and it's usually something like background image or background color. And it's really just a measure of, okay, when does the user stop seeing just a blank white screen and just gives them some feedback that, yeah, the website actually exists or something is actually happening. Then first contentful paint. Um, it measures the time when the first piece of content from the DOM is rendered. And this can be anything from text, image, et cetera, but it will usually be text since images journey take a bit longer to load. So next the question is the content meaningful. So we have some content on the page, but is it the content that the user actually wants to see? So when do they actually start to see th something that's relevant to them? So largest contentful paint. This is all about which piece of content is actually being loaded. So it measures the time when the largest piece of content within the viewport has been rendered. And it's kind of an approximation to the question, okay, when has the most important or most significant piece of content been loaded? Because obviously it's very useful um, with first contentful paint, we know that, okay, some content has been rendered but we might want to know specifically if a like a specific important piece of content has been rendered and that's what we can achieve with the largest contentful paint and um just as an aside uh, largest contentful paint is actually a successor to first meaningful paint which has been used for a really long time and they're very similar but they just have a few differences which are mainly related to implementation. So for example, first meaningful paint took into account things like content within iframes, whereas largest contentful paint doesn't. And there were also some implementation details with the browsers, which meant it couldn't be standardized across many different browsers. So that's why largest contentful paint was created. So generally speaking, they're doing the same thing and where you might see someone trying to um, record first meaningful paint, you can just substitute that for a largest contentful paint. So next we have visually complete. And this measures the time taken for the content within the viewport to be fully rendered. And this is just a good metric to know when does the user perceive 100% completeness? Because even though it's just content within the viewport, as long as it's all the user can see, then that's when they perceive that, oh, okay, everything has actually been loaded, even if it hasn't. And then we have speed index. And this uses the visually complete metric and assigns a score based on the progression to visually complete. So it's not just the time taken, to get to visually complete, but it looks at how the progression um, looks to the user. So this can be a key difference for things like single page applications, where the user might just see a blank screen for like three seconds, and then at four seconds, everything appears, versus something that's built with maybe like the Jamstack, where it might have more, more of a progression. So it's also like useful to know for that kind of thing. And even in tools like Lighthouse, um, the speed index score you're assigned is also based on the speed indices of other real websites. So it's, I think it's just a generally useful metric to be aware of. So the next question is in the content interactable. So yeah, we've gotten to the point where there's content on the screen, but can the user actually start to interact with it? So what happens if they try and press a button while things are still going on in the background and the page might not actually be able to respond? So first input delay measures the delay between the time a user can attempt to interact with a part of the site and the time that the interface is actually able to respond to that interaction. And this is really important because generally if users, users think that if they can see an interactive element like a button or a form or something like that, they think that that means they can actually immediately start interacting, it, interacting with it. But as we know, that's not always the case because 
if there are long running JavaScript tasks using up the main thread, for example, there might be a delay between when the user clicks that button and when like you actually respond to it. And a really good measure of first input delay is what is called the max potential first input delay, which is like the biggest mouthful ever. <laughs> um, it kind of takes a while to like know what you're saying, but max potential first input delay, <laughs> um, it measures the maximum possible first input delay and it's based on the duration of the longest task. And this is a bit of an easier metric to track than first input delay directly because it isn't just based on user interaction. It's just kind of figuring out, okay, what's the worst case scenario and measuring that specifically. And then we have total blocking time, which measures the total duration of JavaScript tasks between first contentful paint and time to interactive, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And this just kind of gives us an idea of how long a user could potentially be waiting if there are several blocking tasks. So to compare to the max potential first input delay, that's kind of looking at what the longest task is, but total blocking time gives us an idea of all the blocking tasks. And then finally, time to interactive. And this measures the time when the main thread has had up to five seconds with no network activity or JavaScript tasks. And the reason why having up to five seconds clear is important is because that's when the main thread is free enough to reliably respond to user input. So it's a good metric to keep track of to know that, okay, at this point, we're, we're good essentially. So the last question is, are the interactions smooth? And this is about measuring the experience of the interactions and how enjoyable and pleasant it is to use. So first, cumulative layout shift measures the shifts in layouts while a page is loading. And there's potential for cumulative layout shift anytime between when the first content is painted on the screen and when the entire content has been painted. And this video from web.dev um, does a really good job of illustrating the problem with cumulative layout shift. So a user might be in the middle of trying to take an action like go back or maybe trying to place an order and a shift in layout might completely alter what they intended to do. And it can have pretty bad and negative consequences like in this example where maybe they just actually lost money and maybe they can get a refund, but that's like a whole, a whole process. Finally, frame rate is about the responsiveness and the smoothness of frame refreshes on the page. So for example, if you're scrolling down a page, does it seem janky? Or if there are animations on the page, does it look smooth? Or is it just kind of things going on everywhere? And uh, this game created by Jake Archibald really illustrates what slow animations look like. So the top aircrafts are the smooth ones and the bottom ones are the janky ones. So it just kind of illustrates what you should be aiming for and what a problematic animation um, would look like. So these are all the metrics together. And now you may be thinking, okay, so yes, I understand what each of these things mean, but that doesn't really help because there's still like a million different things and it's still incredibly overwhelming. But if we revisit the question, okay, what does performance actually mean for your site? We can see that performance isn't necessarily going to be the same for every site because it's specific. What does it mean for your particular sites? And different sites can focus on different things, which means you don't actually need to worry about absolutely everything all at once. So let's take, for example, a news website, a fictional news website. So again, the first question is their content. So for me, I would probably pick first contentful paint to be the first thing to measure because I think it's the most user centric of the metrics, um, these other metrics anyway. And I think users care the most about what's, about when they see content on the screen, not necessarily about when they see like a background image or something like that. And they're going to be more likely to wait for more content to load if there already is content rather than wait for that first bit of content to load. So next is the content meaningful. So I think largest contentful paint would be really important to find out when the most significant piece of content is loaded. 
And what's really great about this particular metric is that it doesn't necessarily have to be largest. It can be customized to target a specific element. So you could say largest contentful paint for me kind of means when does the headline show? And that might not be the largest, but it's the most significant piece of content to you. And um, like I mentioned before, speed index is also always a good metric to be aware of because again, it's very user centric. And it's if you use tools like Lighthouse, it also helps you compare what your website is like to others um, on the web. So next is the content interactable. So now for a news website that has more passive engagement, I think this is a bit less important than metrics like, I don't know, largest contentful paint, for example, because people aren't really using the website like Twitter, for example, where you probably want to know that there is no blocking time between when a user sees the tweet box and when they can actually just start tweeting. So for a case like this, where I think that the site is not as interactive as others, I would probably pick something like time to interactive, because this inherently encompasses all the other metrics, i.e. you're not going to have a smaller time to interactive number than your total blocking time. And then I think if you then see a problem with your time to interactive, then you can dive deeper and look into some of these other metrics. So finally, are the interactions smooth? And I think the most important metric here is definitely going to be cumulative layout shift because there's kind of nothing more annoying than trying to read an article, something like important, something that might be really long, and then having the page jump around because there's like an ad or an image or something loading. So this is going to be really important to maintain the integrity of how a user is going to read the article to make sure that this is going to be as low as possible. So now we're in a much better state. Um, we've picked the most important metrics for us. We're really happy now. Everything is great. <laughs> and the thing is, as you measure more, you can obviously add more metrics. This is not to say that you will never need to use any of the other ones. But I think just having a few ones to start with and then build on is what would be what would make the most sense. So now you might be thinking, OK, so I know what metrics to use, but like knowing the metrics doesn't do anything, right? You need to know how to implement them and use them. So first we've chosen our metrics and the next thing we're gonna need to do is def define what's called a performance budget. And this just defines specific values to your metrics that your sites should never exceed. So going back to our example, you might do have something like first contentful page should not exceed 1.5 seconds or largest contentful page should not exceed two seconds or speed index you know, exceeds 0 0.43 and all of that and all of that. And so where do you get these specific numbers from? And where I would really suggest you start is sites like web.dev because they give you a really in-depth view about each metric and what it does, but they also provide guidance on what a sensible value to aim for is. Also sites like the performance budget calculator, they provide really nice um, sensible defaults for any website to adopt, adopt essentially. But another great tip is to kind of look at what your competitors are doing and where they are. So while those previous sites might help you know what a good general guidance is, it might be a completely different story when you dive into your particular industry. So it's always good to kind of look at where your competitors are and aim higher essentially. Because the thing is you don't necessarily need to have the fastest website on the planet. Like you don't need to reduce that time to zero. You just need to make sure that you're you know, doing well compared to other people or whoever is like next to you. So you've defined your budget. How do you start measuring? Um, this is pretty simple. I would suggest these two tools, Lighthouse and Calibre, which allow you to choose the particular metrics that you want to use and integrate them into um, their testing tools. So you can say, okay, I want this to be this, and then they can give you specific feedback on how you're doing with those particular um, metrics. So that's it. Um, you can now identify where, where your problems are and you can iterate your site as you see fit, and you can keep track of how your site is doing on each of those metrics as you go along. And you can see 
how specific changes that you make, whether they're improving or having the opposite effect on particular metrics. So thank you very much. You can't hear the whole audience, but I will clap. And yeah, I just realized that. <laughs> In lieu of an audience, I will clap for you. Thank you so much, Yurei. I appreciate that. Um, so next up, um, we have Andrew. Oh gosh, I asked him how to pronounce his last name, and I cannot remember the last for the life of me. Um, but <laughs> Andrew is a senior software engineer at Airbnb, where he's managing their web performance measurement initiatives. Um, and Andrew, while he's been at home, has recently discovered Broad City, and he's getting much more into cooking. So um, I, you know, be careful, though, if you want to talk to him about Broad City during the breaks, because apparently he's been holding off on actually watching the last episode because he wants to drag it out. So don't, if there's any big bombshells, don't ruin it for him. Um, but what I think is more important about Andrew is his story of how he got here. And I really love it because Andrew was actually a, um, an attendee last year at Perf Matters. And he took what he learned and went back home and reached out to a bunch of folks, including me on Twitter to ask for some help and our opinions on how to best measure Perf at Airbnb. Um, he brought what he learned to his team and he put together this really, really cool metric that Airbnb is now using. And he is back this year to tell us all about what he learned, what they're doing. Um, and I think it's gonna be super informative and useful. And hopefully there's someone out in the audience right now who's learning awesome stuff and is gonna come back and tell us all about what they did after the fact next year. So um, is Andrew here? There you are. You can take over. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And let's see. Can you see my screen now? Can someone give me a uh, thumbs up or a yes? Yes. OK, great. Good morning. I'm here in, in uh, sunny California, but I want to say hi to everyone, no matter where you are in the world. Really happy you're here. My name is Andrew Scheuermann. And I'm going to be talking about a multi-dimensional approach to measuring web performance. A little bit about me. I come from a non-traditional background. I actually got an undergraduate degree in business management, and then I went to a boot camp. I'm currently a senior engineer at Airbnb. I've been in the industry for six years, at Airbnb for three years. And as Katie mentioned, I've been redefining how we measure web performance for the past one year. And in my spare time, I like to cook, read, and play board games. <clears throat> so we're all here because we want to make our websites fast. Um, we're going to hear some amazing presentations on how to do that, but I'm going to talk about how we measure web performance. People often say things like, my site loaded in five seconds, or I increased my page speed by 10%. Um, these statements can be a little misleading. Uh, they can be a little confusing because Load is not a single moment in time. In reality, there are multiple moments that affect if a user perceives your site as fast or slow. So I think we should stop, stop talking about performance in terms of a single metric um, because it misses the nuances that are very important to users and can make or break the actual uh, performance of your site. So to illustrate this, I'm going to load a page um, from Airbnb. This is the listing page where you can see a home that you're interested in staying in. Here we go. We've requested the page. We're waiting for a bit. Something has rendered. The fonts have updated. The final image has rendered. And now the loading state is gone. <clears throat> As you can see here, there are multiple moments that provide visual cues that something is happening to the user. And if you can take one thing away from this talk, I want it to be that multiple moments matter and you need to measure them. So at Airbnb, we used to measure, report, and work on improving a single metric called time to Airbnb interactive. 
This was different than Google's TTI uh, metric. Our metric measured when the initial JavaScript bundle is parsed and executed plus one set timeout. In React terminology, it's component div mount plus one timeout. When I started working on my page's performance, TTI was pretty slow all the way out here. I spent a lot of time improving the metric, sending down less JavaScript, and breaking one large task into smaller tasks. Those were good improvements. But I also did some questionable things. For example, I loaded non-essential above the fold elements asynchronously. So if you can see, this little heart icon and the share icon would pop in later asynchronously, leading to a little bit of, uh, little bit of cumulative layout shift for the users. It was a little weird. I also loaded the below the fold sections asynchronously. This means that if you loaded the page and you scrolled down, you'd see a bunch of spinners. And that's not the best experience, but it was what I was incentivized to fix to improve this metric. So my performance improvements were a little bit of a mixed bag, some good, some bad. But more importantly than what I did improve is what I didn't improve. So I didn't improve time to first paint. I didn't improve when the primary image was visible. And I definitely didn't have any time to improve performance after the TTI metric was reached. So the problem was that our current system, and your system might be doing the same thing, incentivized us to only improve one metric. <coughs> we needed a new system, one that measured and improved multiple moments that matter to users. And you may be asking yourself, isn't that what Chrome Lighthouse is? Chrome Lighthouse is an automated tool for improving the quality of web pages. You can run performance audits as shown here. Um, as you can see here, it records six user-centric performance metrics, and it gives you performance recommendations on how you can improve. But Lighthouse was missing one key feature for us. It doesn't measure real user data. At the end of the day, we want to know how fast Airbnb is for real users on their various devices and their different connection speeds. For us, measuring real user data was a critical requirement. So we built something very similar to Lighthouse, but with real user data. So I'm going to talk to you about how we did this and how you can do this at your own company. First of all, the requirements that we had. As just mentioned, we want to measure real user data. We want to capture multiple performance metrics because that's how users experience the speed of our website. And finally, we want the system to be comprehensible. We have over 200 different pages at Airbnb, and our old metric was seconds-based, so it was simple to understand. We didn't want to introduce more complexity and have 200 numbers times three metrics or four metrics. That would just be too much to maintain. So we had to keep things simple. <clears throat> we set some requirements for which metrics we were going to measure. And I really appreciate Erie's uh, talk about this because we're, we're telling a lot of the same story. In fact, we both recommend that you read this user-centric performance metrics blog post by Phil Walton. It was really influential in our performance. Um, sorry, it was really influential when we were deciding which performance metrics to measure. Uh, in this blog post, he recommends that you pick the, pick the performance met metrics that answer users' expectations. They have expectations like, is it happening? Is the page loading? Is it useful? Is it usable? And is it delightful? The second requirement was that we had to have comprehensive browser coverage. Only measuring performance metrics in one browser was a non-starter for us. So we need to cover as many real users as possible and their various browsers. The final requirement was that we needed to support performance measurements for direct requests, which is when you first load the page, and client-side routed requests, which is when the JavaScript for a subsequent page has loaded and you can transition to that page immediately. We have to measure both direct and client requests. So we looked at all available metrics, and we found only four that met our requirements. Time to first contentful paint, 
time to first meaningful paint, first input delay, and total blocking time. Now you might be thinking, wait, didn't I just see a big thumbs down by time to first meaningful paint? What that was indicating was that time to first meaningful paint is no longer being used in the lab, in the Chrome Lighthouse lab. But we have a way that you can measure this uh, actionably and accurately in the field with real user data. And we're going to talk about that. So we're going to see what these metrics look like to real users. And then we're going to talk about how you can gather them as engineers. First, time to first contentful paint. <clears throat> this answers the user question, is it happening? When you load the page, it's the time from navigation start to when something is visible. This is a very important visual cue for users that the page is going to be fast. Next is time to first meaningful paint. This answers the question, is it useful? And it measures the time from navigation start to when the meaningful element is on the page. Now, one of the challenges about measuring the meaningful element in the lab is you don't know what's meaningful. But in the field, we have devised a polyfill where you can simply add an ID of FMP target to any element on the page. And our polyfill will measure how long until that that element is visible, and if it's an image, how long until that image source has been downloaded. The third metric is first input delay. And this answers the user's question, is it usable? Now that the page has loaded, users are going to begin interacting with it. And first input delay measures if that first interaction is slow or fast. After users have began interacting with your page, performance still matters. In fact, total blocking time is a metric that we never stop recording. If you introduce, blo uh, if you introduce uh, blocking JavaScript at any point in the page lifecycle, this metric will capture it. So users are interacting with the page, and total blocking time sums up all of the blocking calf, all of the blocking tasks, which can cause noticeable jank and frustrate your users. So to revisit this film strip, we're going to illustrate what, these what we measure with these multiple performance metrics. Time to first contentful paint occurs here when something is visible. Time to first meaningful paint occurs here when the meaningful element that you've determined is visible. First input delay happens, to be happens whenever users click on the, on the page. And total blocking time is measured from first contentful paint throughout the entire page duration. So for a single page, we never stop measuring page performance. And because our system supports direct request and client-side routed requests, we can measure the entire performance journey. At Airbnb, you load the page, you search, you find some dates, and then you book it. We never stop measuring page performance. Now, you can actually see this live. If you append the PPS equals log to any website or any page at Airbnb, you will see this output in your uh, Chrome console. Um, this is just kind of a fun thing for you to, to play around with this. Now, as I mentioned, two of our requirements were comprehensive browser coverage and support for direct and client-side routed requests. We had to build our own polyfills for time to first contentful paint and time to first meaningful paint to support this. And we extended Chrome's first input delay polyfill so that it could be reset on subsequent page loads. These polyfills are battle tested. We've been using them for six months at Airbnb and they're, they're only two kilobytes of code. We have plans to open source this, but if you absolutely can't wait, you can open up airbnb.com right now and simply copy this script from the head of our document. So checking back in on the system requirements, we have completed two of the three requirements, so we're looking pretty good. But the final requirement was to make this comprehensible. So one of the challenges about having so many performance metrics is how do you incentivize people to improve the right ones? Um, Erie's talk showed that there are maybe 15 or 20 different performance metrics you can choose from. We've chosen four, but how do you report all of these and make sure that people uh, improve all of the metrics that matter. For us, it was important that we reduced all of these metrics 
into one single number. I love this quote because what is measured and reported improves exponentially. I've seen this personally at Airbnb where whatever we set goals on and tie performance bonuses to, that is what improves and other things may be improved, but not uh, as a first class citizen. Um, so for us, we had to keep our reporting simple. So for us, it had to be one single number. So we have these four metrics and I'm gonna talk through how Airbnb turns these into a single number, but I really want to reiterate that you can take a different approach. The most important thing is that you can turn multiple metrics into one single number. Performance values generally follow a log normal distribution. They're clustered around a median value and there's a long tail of really slow values, which is shown here in this chart to the right. For us, the 95th percentile median value for time to first contentful paint is five seconds. This means that if you have a time to first contentful paint of 10 seconds, you're 28% along the curve. Or put in another way, you're faster than 28% of values. If you have a time to first contentful paint of three seconds, you're faster than 67%. For this individual metric, your score is 67. So what we do is we take the scores for the four metrics, apply a weighted average, and add them together. And this outputs a single 0 to 100 score based off of four or whatever number of input metrics. Now, I'm going to share a link later, but we've actually, uh, we've actually shared this calculator so that you can run these for your own pages. So checking back in on our requirements, we've now met all three. The page performance score is what we measure at Airbnb and to measure page performance. We're measuring multiple user-centric metrics with real user data, and we're outputting a 0 to 100 score. Checking back in on the similarities and differences with Lighthouse, the page performance score uses real user data. It has 100% browser coverage. Um, so it's really good for, for measuring how fast your site is for real users. Lighthouse, on the other hand, runs in the lab, and it gives you performance advice on how to improve the, the uh, performance of your page. And in the middle, the overlap between the two is there's a 0 to 100 score, there are multiple user-centric metrics, and there's a correlation. And by that, I mean, if you improve a metric like first input delay in the lab, it will improve for real users and vice versa. So we use both page performance score and Lighthouse at Airbnb. So let's, let's look at some case studies of how we've used these two together. Um, while we're looking at these case studies, we're going to be looking at 95th percentile values and real user data. The first case study is when we introduced a service worker at Airbnb. The way that this works is the first time visitors would download the code for the service worker and repeat visitors would immediately see this app shell when they opened the site. We ran an A-B test for about a month and these were the results. In this film strip that I've created, we can see the non-service worker treatment up top and the service worker treatment on bottom. So without a service worker, people get to time to first contentful paint in four and a half seconds and time to first meaningful paint in six and a half seconds. With a service worker, you see time to first contentful paint one second faster, which then kicks off a client side request for the page. So time to first meaningful paint is considerably slower. The numbers bore this out and contentful paint was 20% faster, meaningful paint 60% slower, and our page views were 1% higher and our bookings were 0.6% higher. So overall, this was good, a good experiment, but we still have some work to do to improve that first meaningful paint. The second experiment we're gonna look at is the calendar. So we're always redesigning things at our company. And we designed a new calendar. We ran an A-B test for about a month. And we noticed that the new calendar was introducing um, performance regressions in the term or in the form of increased total blocking time. This indicates a performance regression caused by the calendar. We dived into it and discovered that we were unnecessarily re-rendering the calendar when users interacted with it. 
So after we fixed the re-render problem, we saw our total blocking time at the 95th percentile reduce by 1.5 seconds. Google Maps. So on the listing page, we show a map of where the home is located. It's located about three quarters of the way down the page and only 20% of visitors will actually scroll far enough to see the map, but 100% of visitors download and parse the code for the map. So when we ran Chrome Lighthouse for our page looking for performance improvement opportunities, it recommended that we reduce the impact of Google Maps. Um, everyone was downloading 600 kilobytes of code, but as I mentioned earlier, only 20% were scrolling down far enough to see it. So what we did was we wrapped that section that the map was in, in an intersection observer, initialized it in a loading state with a shimmer, and then when a user scrolled down to the map, we would load the code. After we instrumented the intersection observer fix, we saw total blocking time reduced by about two and a half seconds. Now the final experiment I'm gonna talk about is client-side routing. As I mentioned earlier, one of the requirements was that we had to report client-side routing. One, because it's faster, and two, because we want to have a comprehensive view of the performance of our site. <clears throat> So on Airbnb.com, uh, you can save homes that you're interested in, and you can visit all of the saves that, you're, that you've saved in the past by clicking the heart in the bottom. So I'm gonna click enter now, and we're gonna see a film strip of the direct request and client side request side by side, and see how these feel to you. Client side route, you get immediate feedback that something is happening, and then they both end at roughly the same time but the client route request gets there sooner. So all of the metrics got better and page views went up by 6%. So because of this, we know that client side routing is a better experiment, experience and we know exactly how much better it got. So that's it for case studies. Let's talk about some learnings that we've gained from instrumenting page performance score at Airbnb. We've been using this for about six months and here's what we've learned. First is that transitioning from a seconds-based metric is a difficult paradigm shift. People are, incorrectly or not, people are used to thinking about performance as a single seconds-based number. And they have an established map in their head about what is good, average, or, or slow. To ease this transition, build off of that map and map whatever your new values are and the appropriate ranges to their old expectations. This will really help you organizationally pitch and instrument a zero to 100 base score. If you remember, we have created a time to first meaningful paint polyfill, but this requires that you as the engineer identify exactly which element is meaningful with this ID. If you don't add this ID on a page, we have no way of knowing what is meaningful. Now the page performance score is based off of four individual metrics. And if one of those metrics is missing, the score is invalid. So rather than showing an invalid score, we show a score of zero if the time to first meaningful paint found rate is less than 80% or some threshold that you can pick. This has two major benefits. The first is that a score is either valid or zero. There's no second guessing a score. And it encourages proper time to first meaningful paint instrumentation because no one wants a score of zero. Another learning that we had was the importance of meta metrics. The first input delay and total blocking time metrics are somewhat opaque. By adding meta metrics around these metrics, you can gain insights into where exactly your delays are coming from and how best to improve it. And our final learning is that we're still learning. Uh, the page performance score is in version one at Airbnb. We have these particular weights, metrics, and scoring system. But like Lighthouse, our approach is going to evolve as our understanding improves and as newer metrics become available. Um, one benefit of transitioning to a multiple metric approach is that when you decide to add more metrics, uh, like frame rate or some other metric, it becomes easier tra to transition to V2 
because you're not having such a huge paradigm shift as you did at the beginning when you went from a seconds based metric to a number based uh, report. So some of the key takeaways from my talk are that load is not a single moment in time. There are multiple metrics that matter to users and you should monitor them for the real user data. And to keep things simple, you can combine all four of these metrics into a single zero to 100 score with some pretty basic math. Here are some resources for you to learn more. Um, this user-centric performance metrics blog post is amazing. You can reach out to me on Twitter. We have polyfills that are going to be open sourced soon. And we have this score calculator, which is available at this link. I'd like to publicly thank Gabe Lyons and Guy Ritger and the Web Performance Guild at Airbnb who all made this possible. And thank you all for attending. All right, that's it for me. Okay, uh, I don't know if I'm seen, but hopefully I am. Uh, that was awesome, Andrew, thank you so much. And uh, I'm gonna wait till my screen is shown so that uh, I know that um, okay now you can see me okay awesome so uh, we are up for our first break so here is a sticker of uh, kind of what I look like um, on the back this is a hand-drawn smiley you most of you have stickers some of you have hand-drawn ones because uh, way more of you replied to the care package than I could have ever expected. And uh, boy, was that a huge job. Uh, I think there was 149 packages that went out. Anyway, you have four of these. Um, look for the one that has a green smiley on the back. Flip it over, figure out who your speaker, um, which room you're going to be in. It's based on the speaker's uh, face, which you have to figure out what their name is by looking at the homepage of the website. And then if you go to um, the 411 information page, that Google Doc, click on the link with the name of that room, and that is the chat room that you're going to go in. Once you're in that room, click on the little green uh, video so that you can join a video call and get to know each other. So uh, one thing I didn't mention is that this is a single track conference. So what we did is we put the speakers in blocks because there's no laugh track. So some people go a little bit longer, some people go a little bit shorter than they, you know, people time it out for the jokes and stuff like that. So we didn't know exactly. So uh, what we do is we catch up the time. So the break is uh, supposed to start in, in five minutes. So uh, we have a 35 minute break instead of a 30 minute break, but we come back at 1115 Pacific time or 15 minutes after the hour, wherever you're located. During that time, uh, please hang out in the room that has the green smiley. Um, get to know new people and uh, and have fun. And we're going to try to put a timer up so that uh, you know when to come back. So there will hopefully be a timer on this screen. But right now, uh, jump off here and go into a Google Hangout. And uh, see you all in uh, 35 minutes.
Hello, can you hear me? Does everything sound fine? Awesome. And then I'm gonna try sharing my screen. We're not starting it. I'm just tech checking. Um, so let's try this. I wonder if I can share just the window. How does that look? I can't see how it looks from the other side. Can you see just the presentation or does it give you the whole? Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, we yeah, see just the presentation. Cool. Yeah, because if I full screen it for some reason, it does like three fourths of the screen and nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. That that seems great. Then uh, let me find my Zoom and all that. Stop share. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. I'll mute myself for now.
Hey, y'all. I think I'm on. A quick tech check. Um, let's do the screen share. Okay. And we go here. There we go. Cool. You can hear me. You can see me. You can see my slides. I think it's working, I hope. Hello, welcome back everyone. Um, hopefully everyone who was able to get into a chat room um, had a good conversation. Um, I'm afraid that I was not in a chat room because I was downstairs for, um, in case we need it later, my children were showing me all of their favorite jokes from their favorite joke book. So um, we're gonna try to stretch out a little bit longer of a break in between the two talks. So. I might ask you some really dumb jokes, but <laughs> um, the stuff we're gonna talk about right now, actually, I'm really excited for. Um, we have two talks coming up. First up, we have Aaron Turner, who's a developer at Fastly. Um, he's going to be telling us about some really personal stories and impact of web performance on real people. Um, Taylor comes to us. He's a skateboarder, a musician. He works on WebAssembly, JavaScript, and Rust. He's actually a team member on AssemblyScript. 
And very much like myself, Aaron has been filling in all of his extra time at home by playing lots and lots and lots of Animal Crossing, New Horizons. Um, and I apologize if you don't play, you really should be. But I'm very pleased to say that Aaron managed to catch a string fish, which if you don't understand, that's like winning the lottery times a million. I have not managed to catch a string fish. So I'm supremely jealous of, of Aaron. And um, yeah, that won't play into what he's talking about, but. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, thanks everyone and give it up for Aaron. Hello, cool. Let me get my sharing all set up. And yes, I did catch a string fish. I'm pretty stoked on that. And uh, it was a lot of fun. So uh, let me get my other window just so I can see my speaker notes. And uh, I think we're ready. Cool. Awesome. So thank you. Thanks for coming to my talk. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you, conference organizers. And uh, this talk is going to be good because it has alliteration in the title. That's always a good sign. So. Hopefully we get to live up to that. So before we get started, let's get into introductions. You know, who, like an owl, who, haha. Anyways, uh, my name is Aaron Turner, uh, like I was introduced. Um, I go by Torch2424 on the internet. I made that name when I was six and it just kind of stuck. So here we are. And uh, um, these are some of the things I do. I'll be getting into these in more detail later, but um, I'm a member of the AssemblyScript team, which is a TypeScript-like language to WebAssembly. Doesn't mean you can just take a React app and compile it to WebAssembly, but we'll talk about them a bit. Um, I'm the creator of Wasmboy, which is a Game Boy emulation library written in AssemblyScript for WebAssembly. So you can play essentially Game Boy ROMs on your web browser. Um, I also created Wasm by example, which is kind of like Go by example, where it's bite-sized examples so that you can just copy and paste for getting stuff done in WebAssembly. I made Made with WebAssembly, which is a showcase of projects that use WebAssembly to perform application tasks and things. And then um, I work at Fastly on their WebAssembly efforts. So using WebAssembly in like a serverless context and running um, applications in the web. Or on the edge. So what are we talking about today? What's our agenda? Um, today we're talking about budgets, but what kind of budgets? We're gonna be talking about the budgets of our users, such as like financial budgets. We'll be talking about resource budgets. For example, how much can a device accomplish with its resources? We will also be talking about performance budgets, um, as in measuring how slow or fast we want, our, uh, want to allow our software to be. And then we'll be talking about building for these types of budgets, like what tools and technologies can we use to help us achieve our budgets that we've now defined. One of these tools we'll be talking about is WebAssembly. Um, WebAssembly is relatively new. It's a portable binary format that runs on the web in both the browser and the server. We'll go into this later. Um, we will also talk about web workers, which is kind of like threads on the web for multi-threading. And then we'll be talking about service workers in PWA, in which in our case, we'll be mostly focusing on how we can use these for an offline web. But first, I wanna talk about people. And to start things off, we're going to start talking about the next billion users, or NBU for short. The next billion users are commonly known as the people who will be coming online in the near future. Um, by becoming online, this can be through a smartphone, a low-powered laptop, or et cetera. And it may or may not be their first experience with technology. And uh, NBU is a very hot topic. Uh, we got Google talking about it. We got Facebook planning for it. We have Microsoft researching it. We have books on Amazon about it. We have TechCrunch asking questions about it. And um, as you can see, this is an actual hot topic. Um, but let's dive deeper into one of these resources and see what they have to say. We will be showing quotes um, throughout the slides, but I'll summarize them. Um, this is a quote I pulled from that Google, Google article I just had a screenshot of and showed earlier. And the quote explains that MBU users have a mobile only mindset, which means they kind of only have access to a mobile experience when they access the web or technology and things. Um, they have this ubiquity need for com computing, as in they want their apps everywhere in terms of device, like on every device they can run it on, and in terms of location. And they want their software localized to them. Um, by localization, the article is speaking about language, but I'll explain how this also applies to performance. Another quote I pulled from the same article mentioned where these NBU users are. And if you look more into NBU and the conversation around next billion users, it really focuses on areas like Brazil, China, India, and Nigeria. And 100%, these are great areas to focus on. And I think there's definitely problems there that need to be addressed. But what if I told you that NBU users don't only exist overseas? And I'd even argue that they exist in tech hubs like Silicon Valley. I want to talk about poverty in the United States of America. So, but poverty is a very strong term. What are we talking about here? Um, well, if we Google the definition of poverty, we get this. And what I'd like to highlight here is that poverty is the condition of a person who lacks financial resources or a minimum standard of living. So let's use the poverty line as our base for financial resources, kind of like this um, line that the government or US Department of Health and Human Services will set 
that kind of says, hey, if you make about this much, you're probably in poverty. So in 2015, for a family of four, if you made less than 24,250 US dollars annually, you are in poverty. But how many people is that? That's 43.1 million people in the United States of America, 13.5% of all people living in the United States of America that are living in poverty. And if you take a look at California, which probably has the largest tech hub in the world, 6.25 million of people living in California or 16.5% of people living in California live in poverty. But why do I care about poverty? Because I was one of the people living through it. After I went to college, I learned and understood more about my family finances from student financial aid applications. And in 2015, uh, my family made 11,205 US dollars. And we were a family of seven living in a two bedroom apartment. And that's well, well, well below the poverty line. So going back to our three points, mobile only, ubiquity, and localization. I heavily relate to the MBU experiences and I feel like an MBU user if I was not one already. Um, people in poverty really experience the same issues with the web. And there's a greater community that is in this conversation, I think, that are also included in these issues. So to show this, I'd like to share some of my early experiences with the web. So I first got online when I was about six years old. Um, I'm definitely young, but I experienced the end of the early web, I would say, or the tail end of it. Um, I heard lots of dial tones when logging online and things like that. I got all my internet access from free trial America online CDs, and I would repeatedly just cancel my account before the month was up of the, of the free trial, and then just get a new CD to the, have internet access at the time. And then my mom couldn't afford a good computer, but it was around the same time when you kind of needed a computer to just do basic tasks that you need to do around your life. So what we had was a Windows 95 e-machine, but it was around 2003. Um, this wasn't my computer, but it looked equally disgusting as the one that I'm showing now. <laughs> So my first experiences with the web were two web games, really. Disney's Virtual Magic Kingdom and RuneScape. They were both very community-oriented type games that I would often play with my friends that I had at school and things after school. But I very distinctly remember that my computer just could not run Disney Virtual Magic Kingdom. Like, it would just try to load the page and just load forever. So the only time I could actually play it was when I was at a friend's house. And uh, for me, this game was not ubiquitous. I couldn't run it on all my devices. I can only run it on devices I had limited access to, like my friend's um, computer and things. And my computer could barely run RuneScape. Like if I let the page load for about 15 minutes, I could then start to use the chat box, but I definitely couldn't like actually play the game and go on quests and do things with my friends that they wanted to do. So again, I never really invested time or money into this game because I could only play it on higher end devices that I had very limited access to, it wasn't ubiquitous. But the price of RuneScape was only about $5 a month. All my friends on RuneScape were members, and I wasn't. Um, it wasn't because my family couldn't afford the $5 a month. It was just we could not afford the upfront cost of a brand new computer so that I can actually get the value out of being a member for this service. So I feel like there's a lesson here. Should we be building our games for Windows 95 Internet Explorer? No, that's, that's not the lesson. But the lesson is that we should really be making our websites or applications ubiquitous. The fact whether or not your application supports a device in terms of resources and performance can affect whether or not a user will join your application, subscribe to a service, or even buy your product in general. Next, I wanna talk about some of my other web-enabled devices. My first smartphone I got when I was about 14, and then the best cheap phone I can get at the time was about an LG Optimus V for $150. And uh, I used Virgin Mobile at the time because they had the best prepaid data plan for the price. Um, but when I heard this, you know, my natural instinct, even looking back, was like, oh, okay, cheap phone nowadays are considered like $300. But uh, a renewed Samsung Galaxy S7, which I also, you know, looked at, um, is about 1% of all mobile devices in the U.S. right now, which is, I think, the seventh most popular phone in the entire U.S. Um, it's $150 if you were to buy it today. And so that $150 price range is still very relevant as in terms of, like, getting a smart device. The only other device I owned for accessing the web was my cheap netbook. I remember my mom saved up for a, about a year, I think, to buy me a $300, $300 US dollar one for my birthday. Um, I needed it for school, but also just general computer stuff as well, just like playing League of Legends and other MMOs at 12 frames per second, because that's what you do when you have a netbook when you're a kid. <laughs> so, uh, but my home internet was never a given for me. Depending on whether or not we could actually afford home internet, I'd have home internet access. So what I'd have to do is hotspot my phone against the phone plan terms for home internet when I had no um, home internet access. So my data plan for mobile also became my home internet. And I would just share the hotspot for both my phone and my netbook. And that's how I got all my internet access for the month. 
And in fact, this is when I'd say around the same time I seriously started developing. Um, I was really into rooting Android phones and I started playing around with Linux and so I can modify scripts and ROM images to decompile APK files and build my own Android ROMs that I could share online. So I really learned you know, how to become a developer, you know, Linux basics and things like that um, how, on my iPhone hotspot. Like I was downloading scripts and things through that. Um, so when you're downloading like literally Linux images that are like gigabytes, you quickly run out of data for the month. So what ends up happening is that you become extremely reliant on free Wi-Fi hotspots. So what I would do is I would go to places with free Wi-Fi. I would download development stuff, applications, music, games, even read news because when you open up a bunch of tabs, like all that JavaScript that's getting loaded, like, you know, you start to notice like, okay, if I use this site, it's, you know, give me out my data plan. So um, I became heavily reliant on my phone and stayed to use the web. Like my phone was just what I had and that's how I accessed the web at multiple points in my life. So what's the lesson here? Um, should we be testing production on McDonald's free Wi-Fi when it's safe to go back outside? Uh, actually, yeah, maybe, maybe we should. Um, design your website or application with a mobile only experience in mind. Um, whether that be making it responsive, reducing your bundle sizes so users aren't encouraged to use it later, or even a completely different version of your product that's hyper optimized for mobile. Some people really have to depend on their entire web access on just their phone. So it could definitely help a lot of your potential users or your current users immensely and encourage them to use their application when they want to, not when they can. But I really don't want to talk about myself all day. I really want to focus on other people actually in ways that I've seen them experience the web. And the most notable story I have about this is probably about Obama. I want to talk about Obama phones. Obama phones is kind of this slang term for a free government cell phone and phone plan. The program wasn't started by Obama, but it was rapidly expanded during their term. And the program is formerly known as Lifeline Assistance. So let's take a look at what this plan provides. You know, this plan, this is one of the many plan providers that you can get that goes to Lifeline Assistance. Um, what you get is a free phone, minutes of talking, minutes of text or talking and texting. And you also get one whole gigabyte of data. And um, if I'm using my phone hotspot as my home internet, like I mentioned earlier, um, which a lot of people do, and actually my whole family did at some point around like 2011-ish, um, you get about one hour of Netflix for the entire month and your data plan is just done. So it gets pretty, pretty uh, dicey, I guess you could say. So let's take a look at how popular Obama phones actually are. Um, and this picture is a picture in San Francisco, like I said, big Silicon Valley tech hub, and it's in the Tenderloin. Tenderloin is what you could say is maybe the low income district of SF. And um, here we have an Obama phone tent. So they're offering people to sign, line up for the program and get signed up and things. And I also see these um, tents all over Long Beach where I live, like in the downtown-ish area. So it's a very popular program. So let's take a look at the performance of these types of devices compared to higher end devices. A lot of people here are probably using such as like an iPhone X and things of that sort and, or iPhone 10 and iPhone 11 things. So um, this is a slide from Christopher Baxter's and Malta Ubel's JSConf US 2018 talk. And um, it shows the Nokia 2 at the bottom, it's that blue line there. And um, it's very popular in the next billion users market and um, it has a very similar performance to these Obama phones I'm mentioning. And you can see it's just getting completely just wrecked in single core performance by a lot of the devices that we use, such as the iPhone 10, iPhone 11, which is um, most web apps are gonna be dependent on single core performance because JavaScript is mostly run the main thread unless you use web workers, which we'll be talking about later. Um, but let's expand on this. Let's look at the performance of devices I've shown throughout this talk so far. So let's take a look at that Samsung Galaxy S7, which I said was um, one person of all US mobile devices, seventh most popular um, device for going on the web with, according to Device Atlas. Um, the S7 is 0.6 the performance of an iPhone 10 and 0.38 the performance of an iPhone 11. Even the Galaxy S8, which actually is 2.98% of all US mobile devices, and I'm pretty sure the device atlas claims to be the number one most popular web device for Android, is just getting decimated um, by performance benchmarks of these devices. So um, let's take a look at these Obama phones I'm mentioning. Um, let's see what types of devices I can get in the program and things. So if we want to splurge a little bit, and instead of getting our free phone, we scroll down and choose a device for $130. Let's pick the Moto E5 Clay. I dare to say if you have an Obama phone, it's probably a miracle that you're using the web. Um, if you splurge and pay for a device on this program, you are getting one tenth of the performance of an iPhone 11. So whatever things bother you about the web or your websites that just kind of slightly annoy you, try to imagine what that must be like to have it one tenth the performance of what you currently experiencing that you already don't like. It is just almost unimaginable. So um, this is why performance budgets are very important. Um, it kind of automates the way the process of having to test on a low budget device and helps you from becoming too slow for an audience that you didn't quite know that you were building for. Um, 
we should still be testing on low budget devices. Like definitely should still be testing on these devices, like actually hold them in our hands and test. Um, but performance budgets are really well, are really great for keeping a reality check and just keeping as your code's being built, checking in on making sure that it's not getting too out of the way of what you want it to be. Um, and if possible, you should set these up from day one because it's a lot easier to just build and have these in mind rather than trying to go back and retroactively fix per a budget. And uh, one more story I have about this is Max Bitaker is an awesome friend of mine. Um, and they made a WebAssembly game called Sandspiel using Rust and things. And uh, from this, they found some really great performance wins in their app. Um, so, but they didn't have a performance budget. So they put their performance into scaling their game. And by scaling, I mean, they have like these maps and they're maybe about 200 by 200. When they use WebAssembly, I'm like, oh, wow, I have all this headroom now. Let me uh, make the map 300 by 300. So um, they tested this on their iPhone. So um, when people started building maps and things in their game, um, they started saving them to the database. And now that the maps are saved to the database as 300 by 300, when they realized, oh, I've been testing this on my MacBook and my iPhone, but what about all my users that don't have those devices? They can pretty much no longer play the game because the map just doesn't have the performance anymore. It's too big for what they can render. Um, and this is something they can't undo, like it's stuck. Like they can't go back and re-architect according to this, it's already done. So um, from this lesson, they. So that I could share here that um, just because you find more headroom in your application doesn't mean it always means you can add new features. Um, you want to have these performance budgets set up because you never quite know like, okay, well, I'm going to build this new feature that depends on more performance. You want to make sure that you're keeping in check with um, your performance expectations for lower end devices. So what's the point here? Should we be testing on Obama phones? Yes, that is definitely the point here. Um, we need to localize our applications for certain communities. We should reach out to these communities, learn their terms like Obama phones and make sure our apps work for their unique characteristics, whether that be language differences, ridiculously slow CPUs, or even the digital divide, which is when people, tech was too expensive before, and this is now their first time with technology, and things that are second nature to us isn't for them. So taking a look here, we can see that there are three main points that I'm bringing up here. Ubiquity, mobile-only mindsets, and uh, localization. They're very common in the overseas next billion users, but also local to the United States, low-income next billion users as well. But how can we solve them? Well, there are technologies today that we can work on all modern browsers that we can use. First, let's take a look at my personal favorite, WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a universal low-level bytecode for the web. Because of this, WebAssembly is great for running logic-heavy tasks, such as image manipulation, physics for games, and heavy math computations. But why is it great for this? WebAssembly offers predictable performance. Um, JavaScript, when it's run on a browser or node or whatever JavaScript runtime you're using, um, it needs to be parsed and then evaluated and then recompiled in the JIT compiler many times. And because it's being JIT compiled, this can get extremely fast or fall off that fast path when it makes the wrong assumptions. But bytecode, it offers a more consistent predictable performance that won't fall off this fast, fast path because it just gets run straight through and it's compiled and shipped down that way. And one more thing, WebAssembly is extremely portable. Um, you have WebAssembly running on the server. So because of this, you can take code that's running on your browser, move it to the server or vice versa, whatever you need to do. Um, you can be running it using Node outside of the browser. Um, and it can also be bundled into NPM in your NPM modules. Um, you can also use um, WASI, which is the WebAssembly system interface and allows you to run applications in your system, like um, on your system with a runtime like WASM time. And um, what that's gonna let you do is do things like file access. And there's um, currently proposals for things like network access, things of that sort. And you can even embed these runtimes, these WebAssembly runtimes like WASM time into your Python server or Rust server, whatever it may be. That way you can have like maybe a request that comes in, run a WebAssembly module that can then be shared in multiple parts of the application and then just use the runtime there. And this is really good for your budget. I didn't mention that at the beginning, but this is something you can think about. You can write your code once and use it in multiple places using an appropriate runtime in the right place. Um, Google Earth gave a WASM WebAssembly SF talk about this. They use WebAssembly to make their code portable across the web and many other applications and systems around Google. It's a talk I would definitely recommend. If you search on YouTube, you could find it. So WebAssembly sounds really cool. How do we get a running start with it? Um, there's this website, Wasm by Example. It's made by me. Um, essentially, it's like go by example, bite-sized, copy pasteable tutorials and examples that helps you learn the concepts in a language of your choice that you can then go and like learn, understand things like linear memory, things of that sort, and then build on top of those concepts with tools that make it a lot easier and convenient in your application. And there's a lot of languages that are outputting WebAssembly right now. The most mature of the three are AssemblyScript, which is that TypeScript like to WASM um, language. Like I said, I'm on the, I'm on the team for it. Um, what it means is that you can't just take a normal JavaScript or TypeScript application or TypeScript React application and just compile it to WebAssembly. 
Um, what it is, it's the super set of TypeScript. It has its own little quirks and things. So you can't just take TypeScript off the shelf, but it definitely has the same TypeScript workflow in which you use NPM. You can use NPM scripts. You have a package JSON and um, it definitely looks and reads like TypeScript. And in fact, there's a TS config that just does a lot of the funny stuff. And I've been able to compile assembly script applications using the TypeScript compiler. So you can definitely, it feels really natural for, for a TypeScript developer. Um, it has some really nice tooling, um, such as Aspect, which is a mature testing library for assembly script um, and things of that sort. And also ASBind, which is something I wrote that allows you to pass data types between the browser and WebAssembly really easily. Um, another language, Rust, has really nice tooling, such as Wasm Pack for bundling your Rust Wasm modules into NPM packages and things. And um, it's a very mature language. And there's also Inscription, which is a tool chain for C. It's extremely mature. Um, it evolved from Asm.js, which was a superset or super optimized version of JavaScript that turns C and C++ into WebAssembly. So next, let's talk about web workers. Web workers is threads in the web. It's really good for parallelization and multi-threading, things of that sort. And uh, Performance Matters is an awesome talk by Emery Berger. Um, I definitely say watch the full talk for all the context here. But the idea is, is that Moore's law is slowing down. We can no longer keep increasing prox clock speed per the transistors. The reason for this is that each single core of a CPU just gets too hot and we can't find a way to dissipate the heat fast enough to keep increasing the clock speed. Thus, we had to start multi-core or putting multiple cores on a CPU, but a lot of apps don't really take advantage of that. The problem isn't unique to the web. It's a problem for computing in general right now. So because of this problem, we start to see this idea of a UI or a main thread. Where the user interaction should happen is one thread in which all the UI and things interact with one another. All of your business logic and computation should happen on a separate thread. And uh, I have a friend, Serma, that is working on resources to help this idea for the web um, currently. Serma has been writing some really interesting blog posts on the topic. And I definitely recommend you read their um, work on web workers and some of the ideas they have around this main thread and moving logic off of it. They also built Comlink, which is a wrapper around web workers that provides a very clean API. It makes isolating logic that's currently on the main thread and moving it onto a web worker. Um, this even allows passing callbacks and functions into the worker, which is extremely difficult to do if you're not using Comlink. And I think it's a great place to get started with web workers and really making your apps a lot more smooth on their UI thread and moving all your business logic off of that. The last technology I want to talk about is service workers, but we'll probably talk about them more broadly as progressive web applications as well. What a service worker is, is essentially it's a client-side proxy. In other words, whenever your website makes a request, a service worker can capture that request and return a cached version of the asset or whatever you're requesting for, or just do anything really special with that request. But this is interesting for us because it enables offline access. Like we were saying earlier, you know, if you run out of data for the month, if you have a service worker, you can maybe get your way around that using offline access and things. And this is huge for people who want to conserve data, um, who run out of the data plan or don't even have a data plan. They only use those Wi-Fi hotspots I was mentioning for communication. Um, it's also really handy for plane rides and tunnels, even if you aren't in those um, financial situations or whatever your phone plan may be. And there's a variety of tools for service workers in PWAs. Workbox is a tool for generating service workers. It has a lot of good documentation. And what I really love is that they have a lot of good visualizations to explain what's going on with these requests in the background. Um, a lot of framework tooling, um, well, PWA by default, such as Preact CLI and Create React App. And um, I personally think framework rules might be a great way to get a great way to get your feet wet with a PWA before committing to one on your production application. So it's a nice way to play around before you go all in. Let's highlight some of the good PWAs that you can play with today. Um, Vaporboy is an open source PWA side project of mine. It's uh, powered by that Wasm Boy, which is that Game Boy emulation library that I wrote in AssemblyScript. Um, it uses WebAssembly to run the actual game ROM emulation um, and then runs that WebAssembly core inside of a web worker. That way, the actual UI you're interacting with, such as the buttons and the menus and things, stay really smooth, even though you're running a game in a, on a separate thread in the background and gives really good performance. And it works offline because it's a PWA built with Preact CLI. So I got a lot of those service worker and offline access for free using my framework tools. And Recipe Sage is another great PWA I love. It's built by a close friend of mine, Julian Poirot. Um, it has a custom built service worker in Workbox, works offline, and it's really good for grocery stores with bad connections or if just maybe your internet goes out and you just want to start cooking because you're bored or whatever it may be. And uh, you can still access all your recipes and things. So that was a lot of um, information. But let's wrap things up. Here are my main points. Uh, normally this is a slide I would say, if you like taking pictures of slide, now's the time to take a picture. But uh, since we're not in person, 
now's a great time to press print screen if you like printing screen of slides. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, budget exists everywhere. Um, they are not just overseas, they are overseas, but um, low income areas, rural areas, they exist everywhere, everywhere you go, your application needs to kind of conform to these budgets of people the users are gonna have. Um, create performance budgets. They give really good reality checks by your app um, as you're building your app, and it's really handy to have. Um, use WebAssembly and web, use WebAssembly, web workers and service workers. They really help you build for budgets. And uh, more headroom does not mean no, more features. Now that I've given you the keys of the kingdom, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be like, oh yeah, like I have the keys now, I can just go and like ruin my performance. Like definitely you wanna keep those in mind now that you have these tools to like start building greater features for your application. Here are my major resources for WebAssembly, wasn't by example, is uh, just those bite-sized examples, really help you learn WebAssembly if you're interested in it. And um, your favorite language, if it compiles WebAssembly, which it probably does, probably um, has language documentation usually that you can refer to. Web workers, uh, please check out Comlink and Sermon's blog posts about web, web worker content. Service workers, there's Workbox, like I mentioned, and your framework CLI tool probably has PWA information about it. And uh, I wanna give special thanks to the reviewers, such as Marcy Sutton, um, Brendan, Kareem, uh, Nana, Serma, Henry, Ben, and uh, friends and family. The assembly script team has been nothing but great. Um, they're looking for sponsorships, or if you just wanna get involved, we just started weekly meetings, definitely recommend those. The WebAssembly community has been nothing but just open arms and nice to me. I love them so much. Uh, Serma and Max for letting me share their stories. And then my friends, family, uh, my partner, my mom, my dad. So yeah, thank you very much for the conference organizer for having me. Thank you very much for watching. Please reach out to me over Twitter um, here at the conference when we have the Slack, feel free to ping me. And thank you very much, enjoy the conference. Thank you so much, Aaron. That was yeah. wonderful. That was a yeah. really good talk. I am super excited to go to vaporboy.net and get totally sucked into <laughs> all of the old Gay Boy games that I used to love. Um, is there like a that asparagus green mode that you can toggle on and off, or is it all just color? I need to work on that. Um, right now it's <laughs> black and white, but yeah, it's something I definitely want to do. I have a whole plugin system. I just haven't had the time yet. Nice. No worries. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. So um, we're gonna take a break just for a couple of seconds um, to give folks a little bit of time to kind of wrap up their notes if you need to run really quickly to the restroom. Um, but come on back quickly because we're not going to pause for too long. Um, so what I can do is while we're waiting, all right, I'm going to pull out the joke book that my kids gave me. And um, I apologize for this. I'm totally like, yeah, this is, these are not very funny jokes, but okay. <laughs> so the first joke is, what does a computer do when it's tired? Any guesses in the chat? Anybody? I know it's a bad. Oh, it sleeps. No, close. It crashes. Ah, bum bum ching. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Here's another joke. Oh, okay. Um, why did the cat get detention at school? Anybody? Why did the cat get detention at school? Oh, this one's a stumper, huh? Because he was a cheetah. <laughs> um, oh, this is another good one. Um, why did the hot dog turn down the chance to star in a movie? Anyone? I see lots of Tiger King references. <laughs> uh, none of the roles we're good enough. Oh, close. Dax came in with roles. I mean, you got close there. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, here's another computer one. What kind of animal is related to a computer? What kind of animal is related to a computer? Mouse, good guess, but no. Ram, yes, Benjamin Monroe coming in with the right answer. Awesome. Okay, well, I'll see if I can, uh, if anybody wants me to pick out more jokes before the next break, I can do that <laughs> or I can drop it. Just ping me and let me know. Um, all right, anyways, so coming up next, we have um, Taylor Fairbank. So he is the co-founder and tech lead at Distribute Aid. 
Um, we are very lucky today, actually, he is dialing into us from Serbia, where he's lived for the past year. Um, he's also been working about 80 hours a week, he said, to help coordinate the international grassroots COVID response. So I think we are extremely lucky that he was able to, to join us and talk to us today about um, the effect of performance on his work trying to um, get you know, ethical technology into very extreme environments. Um, so when I asked him about what he was doing during his, his what little free downtime he has, um, he said that he's become the master of combining Serbian junk foods into dinner. And his favorite recipe is the poor Serbs nachos, which is crushed up tortilla chips, bar. I have no idea what that is. He'll have to explain it to us. Shredded cheese with an egg, mayo and hot sauce on top. So um, we'll have to have Taylor explain to us what, what exactly that means. Um, but yes, I, I foresee a food blog in your future. Awesome. All right, well, let's give it up for Taylor. Cool. Hey, everybody. Um, give me one second here. I'll get the, uh, the screen sharing going. And I think Hopefully you can see the slides. Yep, um, you're good. Great. So, so Ivar is this uh, Serbian um, kind of saucy thing. It's a bunch of like um, wood roasted tomatoes and bell peppers and all of that, and then kind of blend it up into um, a salsa like kind of consistency. Um, so I do the best I can living in foreign countries to, to make some foods that are familiar back home. Um, but diving in, without ado, I'm going to be talking today about uh, JavaScript performance in extreme environments. I got started doing this work about a year and a half ago in the refugee aid movement over here in Europe. And um, yeah, like you said, it's uh, very applicable to other crisis response around the world. Um, glad to be here today. I was really looking forward to, to Perf Matters, and I, I wouldn't miss it for the world. So disqualifications, and wow, that screen is really bright. I'm not an expert. Um, I'm actually just a pretty average web developer, um, which is good because everything I talk about here is something that is a standard technique you can bring back to the day job um, on Thursday and, and should definitely feel comfortable to, to try it out in your own projects. Um, I love Ira's like, you know, point to mention where we're calling in from. So solidarity from Serbia um, in lockdown over here. Um, that's me. I didn't know if we'd have video or not. So this was uh, on one of the trips I took. I think I was in Italy meeting with with eight groups in Rome in this photo. And this is Shorba. Shorba is our lovely uh, street dog mascot here in Serbia. There's a great street dog culture. They're super friendly and well-adjusted and we love Shorba a lot. But this is also the point where I bring up a small content warning. Um, we will be talking about some difficult topics today, including, um, course, like the environments that asylum seekers live in and that aid workers work in. I will show photos to provide context, but not show photos of any people, just of the environments. Um, so I want to make sure I know that we're all probably like a little bit emotional with everything going on in the world. It's totally okay uh, if you want to just mute me or turn your screen off or, or go to lunch early. Like, no problem. Totally understand that. So diving in here. Um, I guess just like a quick overview, I'll go through some background and context for the aid movement, and then we'll take a look at the extreme environments um, together. We'll set some performance goals and look at uh, tips and techniques to improve performance. And then I wanna wrap up with like really why performance matters on a human level. Um, so the refugee aid movement, it's the largest grassroots movement in the world, um, although it might be quickly becoming equipped, uh, eclipsed by the, the current medical aid movement and the environmentalism movement. Um, but just to give you some context, there have been tens of thousands of volunteers that have joined hundreds of refugee aid groups in dozens of countries over the past four years to welcome um, over a million newcomers to Europe. 
the way it's structured is a series of autonomous distributed aid groups. And it's kind of this spoken hub model where in each country or, or large city, you'll have a couple of main groups that are very well connected, like Essential Warehouse. Um, and then they'll work with a lot of local groups focusing on specific individual projects. Um, so this is really great. These groups are super resilient and adaptable. They can shift very rapidly as the needs change um, and current events unfold. And if one group happens to, you know, it doesn't work out, they can't get funding or something, there are other groups that can step in and, and fill the gaps. Um, for the most part, that's what we're doing is that a lot of our work should be handled by the larger institutions um, in our world, but they have failed to do their jobs properly. And and so it's up to us, right? Um, cool. So there are tons of different types of projects. You have everything from kind of core services such as housing and water and food distribution, um, as well as non-food items and hygiene, and clothing. You have education, um, you have technology. There's like every everything that you need to run a society in basic life. There's some sort of equivalent in the in the aid movement um, that is is providing those services or access to to resources. Um, um, to newcomers. Um, cool. So our focus is on harm reduction. Like we don't have the capacity to say like stop the war in Syria, um, but we can make sure that the, the dignity of people that are, are fleeing for their lives is being upheld and that the asylum process is being followed um, as much as we can. We really take this idea of solidarity, not charity to heart. The goal is not to just, um, you know, do something nice for someone else because it feels good, but to, to realize that by creating a better world um, for others, we also create a better world for ourselves. One of the things that I absolutely love about the aid movement, especially coming from a tech background, is that it's super diverse and it's led by women. So on the photo there, on the left, you have Rudina. Um, she's on our board and runs an aid organization herself that puts educational contents on laptops and gets those into the informal schools in Lebanese refugee camps. On the right, you have Stephanie, um, who is a high-level administrator at movement on the ground, um, doing field work um, out on the Greek islands. And in the center, you have Sara, who is our very own uh, director of Distribute Aid. Um, I think it's really important to realize that this is not an issue that is going to be solvable in the sense that it won't be an issue anymore. Um, it, this whole thing kind of got kicked off in, in 2015, early 2016 in Europe. Um, and it, this will be something that we need to um, support uh, and, and, and deal with for the rest of our lives. Um, you know, right now there are 70 million displaced people in the world and 20 million of them are refugees who are fleeing to another country. Um, if we don't get a handle on climate change, the UN estimates 250 million to a billion climate refugees by 2050. Um, so now is the time to build the connections and infrastructure and organizing patterns um, so that, that we can, you know, have a, a real um, humanitarian response going forward. I just want to take a minute to shout out um, Greta Thunberg and indigenous leaders all over the world who are on the forefront of the environmental movement because we we are working on the tail end of that with displaced people and, and they're really working to, um, you know, help help the world and, and uh, at the, the larger picture on the environmental side. So what is Distribute Aid? Um, we're building um, technological infrastructure. Uh, we're an online platform for grassroots aid groups. And our goal is really not to centralize power or control or make decisions for people. We, we try not to have a, an ego about it. Um, we're just trying to surface structured information. So if you remember that spoken hub model where you have these central larger groups and then lots of small different aid groups, um, that's great. It's super resilient, but some of that comes at the cost of efficiency where not everyone can talk to everyone else at the same time. And, and that results in missed opportunities. Um, and when the margins are so small with these like tiny budgets that grassroots aid groups have, um, we need to really make it as efficient as possible. And and so getting structured info onto an online platform where we can then do some matchmaking, make suggestions, not decisions, is a great way to improve that efficiency. Our technology is designed to empower groups instead of uh, 
um, instead of making decisions for them. Um, we are working with refugee aid groups in Europe right now. And as you'll find out at the end of the talk, um, we, we are planning to do global crisis response later, but we're also doing that right now. Um, so distribute aid, all our code is free as in freedom. We have the AGPL license um, so that hopefully everyone who uses it and builds off of it shares that back. It's also free as in beer. I, I couldn't imagine, you know, charging even 20 bucks a month um, from an aid group that has such a small budget because that money they really need to provide their, their core services. We have an all volunteer remote first team. Um, you know, I have calls with folks in Norway, in Brazil, in Thailand, um, and, and people are just putting in time on nights and weekends to help us move along. And there's too many people who've contributed to this project to thank individually, but to the distributed team, um, I love you all. Um, so our supply chain tools, I guess we, we have kind of, we're mostly focused on the supply chain right now with what are the needs, who has what resources available, can we match them, and then can we figure out the international shipping. Um, they were in beta, and we were slowly building them and testing them, um, but now very rapidly are going global. Again, more on that later. And I'm very proud in our first year of operation last year, we shipped over $1 million worth of aid internationally. Cool, so this is what it looks like. Um, as you can see, uh, not super advanced on the front end, but we got the basic sound. We have group profiles. We have, this is our, our first iteration on the um, kind of inventory management and needs and available item matching. Um, we have uh, shipments. So this is uh, where groups can plan, um, you know, what's the route? How can we get other people to contribute to fill up a, a full truck, which is much more efficient than sending individual boxes through the post or something like that. Um, and this is what a shipment looks like. So that's a truck with 180,000 bars of soap. Um, and uh, we also included some winter aid. We had about five different aid groups contribute to this on the supply side. Um, and then that truck gets sent to Greece. Um, like in February, we sent the shipment and it goes to a big central warehouse um, where it's kind of sorted and processed and split up. Um, and then it gets delivered to groups all over Greece or wherever country we're sending it um, who can get it into the hands of the people who need it most. And I think all in all, we were able to get the soap and and split it up to 19 different aid groups in four different locations in Greece. So it's like pretty complex and you can imagine that without some sort of extra support, each one of these individual groups wouldn't be able to coordinate um, you know, in such a large and, and complex shipment. Cool, so extreme environments, what they are and what do we need to be thinking about for performance? Um, and this is where we'll, we'll start to show some, some photos. Um, so maybe not that extreme, um, you know, you can make the call. Um, this is the uh, Moria refugee camp um, on the Greek island of Lesbos. It was originally a prison with a capacity for 3,500 people. And you can see kind of the, the old prison infrastructure in the background of that photo. Um, last year it had 10,000 residents living there. And, and that's why you have all of these tents in the surrounding olive groves, um, kind of overflow areas of the camp. And in January, this is what it looks like. There are now 20,000 people that call the Moria refugee camp home. Um, obviously this is not a, a good situation. Um, and, and we've been kind of dealing with this crisis of the breakdown of the European asylum infrastructure, um, you know, in, in, I guess over the past 12 to, to six months um, already, and now have a bunch of other, other considerations. Um, you, that's the photo of the outside of the camp. It's obviously not a very friendly or welcoming environment um, for, for newcomers to Europe. And this is what it looks like inside on the ground. So this is where we start to talk about performance. As you can imagine, there's not regular access to power. There's bad cell signal in these remote, consider uh, remote environments. Um, basically, if you run out of data or if you run out of power, then it doesn't matter how optimized our tools are because you simply can't use them. And aid workers are, are running around trying to help folks for 10 to 12 hours a day. Every day, I would know because I, I spent 
a few weeks uh, one summer building tents out there. Um, so we have to get the performance right um, and make sure that uh, people are connected and um, we're not draining their batteries and things like that um, so that our tools are actually useful. Cool. Um, there's also lots of other tech projects that work in similarly extreme environments. Um, there's lots of great tech um, supporting search and rescue operations at sea. We also uh, know of other groups working on, um, you know, border violence monitoring and things like that. And this is a photo um, uh, kind of closer to me. This is the Serbian-Hungarian uh, border right there. Um, and these border violence monitoring groups are, are kind of recording stories and documenting illegal legal pushbacks and, and other things that happen. Um, this is the US-Mexico border. Uh, so bringing it closer to home for folks in the States. Um, it just seems like authoritarian regimes around the world really love barbed wire. Um, it's kind of a, a staple for them. So we also get to work in some like really cool places. This is a uh, the old Pampariki warehouse, um, which uh, it's actually the 2003 Greek Olympic basketball stadium. And it was just kind of sitting empty. And they, they asked the government if they could use it to uh, set up a central warehouse for aid groups in Athens. Um, and so I got to go there and talk to our users in person uh, and check it out, um, which was a lot of fun. Um, so just roaming around this place for for a day um, that's what it looks like on the inside you know eight groups are really scrappy and resourceful and they said hey we have access to this empty building we can just set up our whole warehouse in the concession ring area and, and divide up the boxes um, you know and, and sort items uh, using that space but as you can imagine even in this environment um, you know, they, they might have access to power, but if you have to leave your phone plugged in to charge it up because our app drains the battery, you're going to be walking all over. You're going to be far away. You're not going to come back for a few hours. And, and then like, what's the point, right? Um, they do have cell signal there. Um, but again, this is on the outskirts of town, so it's not great. Um, and there's no Wi-Fi in the building. Cool. So when looking at these extreme environments, we need to keep like certain aspects of performance in mind. Speed is one of them. You have high speed, which I would say is most folks connected right now in the States. You have low speed, which is me right now. I am tethering from my phone um, from Serbia because my apartment building shares a single Wi-Fi router for four different apartments. And since everyone is uh, home from curfew, they're all on Netflix and YouTube and stuff. So I, I can't use my uh, my home Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, I'm glad that my, my cell data is fast enough to let me connect. Um, you also have no speed. If there's no connection, like that's just a fact of life. Um, and there's this special kind of situation, which I call maybe speed, which is really interesting. Uh, maybe speed is like, let's say like you're in a camp or a warehouse, you might have some connection or some Wi-Fi, but it's not great, right? It cuts in and out, you go into dead zones and things like that. And what you see there is you see huge latency spikes where things will be running fine. And then all of a sudden it's just like loading, loading, loading. You also see a lot of like really frequent kind of on and offline trends Transitions. So even if you have great offline support, you know, your users might be getting whiplashed between like, hey, you're good to go, a bunch of new notifications, oh, you're offline, hey, you're good to go. Um, so you need to, to build in some way of checking for that and, and making sure that you're not just like pinging your users back and forth between different uh, on and offline states in your application. And of course, with maybe speed, um, race conditions really stand out um, where some files will make it through and other won't. And if there's the possibility for a race condition in your code, it will happen. Um, yeah, and we're looking specifically uh, here at latency, bandwidth, and throughput. So latency is that round trip time to the server and back. Bandwidth is the uh, the size of the pipe, like how much capacity um, your, your connection has. And then throughput is how much you can actually send down the line. And so we have really high latency, we have low bandwidth, and because of those two, we have low throughput. Just on a technical note, um, like I said, I'm a pretty average web developer and there's some really smart people on the call. So if I get anything a little bit off, um, you know, you should, you should correct me in the Slack and listen to the smart folks. <laughs> um, yeah, cool. 
This is an example, it's another warehouse. And to show you like some of the issues with, with speed and this connection, um, that's the admin office highlighted in the back there. So they do have Wi-Fi there and there is cell signal, but not all of the carriers are great. And um, the further you get away from that admin office, the weaker the Wi-Fi gets, especially when you're walking through those stacks of boxes, there are tons of dead zones. So you can imagine like with this maybe speed, you're connected to the Wi-Fi or you have some cell signal, and then you're trying to to, you know, get a count of how many boxes of men's small t-shirts you have and you're in a dead zone and suddenly you're off. And then you step to the left and you're not in the dead zone and you're suddenly on again. Um, can cause a lot of problems. In general, these warehouses are, you can see the giant metal structure, think really large Faraday cage um, to, to a certain respect. So this is another great example. Um, you remember that uh, camp that I showed you photos of a little bit ago? That is in the upper left. That is the Moria camp. On the bottom right of this photo is the Greek town of Mytilene. And the way that they get access to Wi-Fi in that camp is they, they have um, something plugged in in Mytilene. They actually beam it to a water tower in the middle with a satellite dish balance it off of that to a receiving satellite dish in the administrative office in the camp. And then they distribute it through the camp through a series of Wi-Fi repeaters. Um, so I helped set one of those up on the telephone poles. And there are two channels. Um, there's the kind of the aid workers channel um, so that they can do Zoom calls and, and talk to the folks that they need to. But they also provide a connection for folks in camp. You know, boredom is a real problem. People want to connect with their friends and family back home. And so you have a lot of folks who are all trying to, to access this very tiny connection with, with very limited bandwidth. Um, we should also definitely talk about resources. So like I said, um, like here right now, I'm on metered mobile data. You have unmetered, which would be Wi-Fi at a coffee shop or at work. And like sometimes you just don't have data at all. Um, same thing with power. So you can be plugged in, good to go. Um, you could be limited if you're, you're walking around um, and don't have uh, time to charge anything, or your phone could just be dead. Your laptop could be dead. There's, there's no power there. Um, and the last thing to consider is devices. So we're looking at Mostly in the aid movement, people have laptops and phones, not tons of tablets. Um, they use pretty standard operating systems and browsers, um, but they use old donated equipment. So my friend was very kind to give me a photo to show. She does not have a battery in her laptop and she operates an educational center in Belgrade with about 25 students that come in each day. Um, so this is a bit challenging for her. She makes it work, but she, she has to be connected, right? She has to have unmetered power. Um, and if someone trips over the, the power cord accidentally, boom, there goes the last hour of, of work she was doing. Another friend who's kind of driving around doing lots of deliveries or taking volunteers to camp or whatever, um, that's his phone right now. I think that uh, I could do a whole separate tech talk on how to make your app work when only half of the phone screen responds to touch input. Um, but I just wanted to show these photos to, to give you a sense of like what the reality is that, that we deal with every day. Um, cool. And you might be like, hey, so like, this is cool. It's interesting to learn about, but I don't really see how it applies at the day job or to my personal projects. It's actually more relevant than you might think. A slow connection is slow, whether it's a warehouse with bad signal or the basement of an office building. Um, no connection is no connection. It doesn't matter if you're in a camp or your CEO is on a Gulfstream plane. Uh, a dead battery is a dead battery. You could spend a thousand dollars on an iPhone, or you could, you know, pick one out of the donation box. Um, but if the battery is dead, it's you can't use anything. And there's lots of um, different types of folks, like Aaron was talking about, that only have access to older hardware or operating systems. And that's true for aid workers. That's true for a lot of teachers, um, hospitals, because they have lots of legacy systems that might need, um, oh gosh, I don't know, Windows XP or something. They need to still run. That. Um, so definitely keep this in mind and, and try to you know learn from what I'm talking about today and, and figure out which of your users it really applies to. It might not be everything across the board, but I'm sure there are some some folks that that have some of these issues that are already using your app or product. 
cool. So definitely start with performance goals. What are we looking at here? Um, for this talk um, and for our application um, on the devices and speed side, we're trying to emulate a mid-range uh, Android device with a bad 3G connection. So the bad connection we're going to say is 400 kilobytes a second of bandwidth and a 400 millisecond latency um, on that round trip request response time. The mid-range Android device, we can use a six time slowdown in the Chrome web dev tools um, to kind of simulate that. We really want to minimize uh, data and power use. Um, and we're going to be looking at two specific metrics. I'm sure there are a lot more, but we're going to look at two today. The time to first meaningful paint for the initial load of the application and then subsequent loads, and the time to interactivity, um, again, on the initial and subsequent loads. So looking at, we set our performance goals. Now let's look at our product goals. We want to be able to do useful things, like regardless of the circumstance or what um, resources or power or Wi-Fi people have access to, we want something that's useful. Um, even if it's not everything, they can still do something. Um, we've made the decision that we're only going to support modern browsers, so we will support Edge, but we're not going to support Internet Explorer. Um, I think that on, on my end personally, if someone can only use Internet Explorer, I need to go find them a laptop. I have lots of friends in tech, and if, if their computer is that old or they can't upgrade because of a licensing fee or something, then the solution is not to spend a lot of time hacking stuff for IE. It's to get them access to the resources they need. Um, and then we really want it to work offline. But again, we don't have tons of like, you know, I don't have a million dollar budget to hire developers who can build out a fully offline app or anything. Um, it's okay to cut functionality. The maps page, hey, we're loading that from um, OpenStreetMaps right now. And if you're not connected, like maybe uh, we just need to load a photo or, or maybe there's no maps and that's okay. Um, you know, cut content. Maybe we don't need all of the images. Um, or, or we can't cache everything. So, uh, you know, you might get to a page, it's like, you know, hey, check this again when you're offline, but at least it lets you know. And then keeping the user informed, um, user consent to uh, things like downloading data um, and, and setting up this offline functionality is super important. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Business goals. Um, on the internal side, I don't like ultimatums. You know, it, it shouldn't be like it has to work offline before we can launch or something. Let's just take a look at where things are at and how we can improve them one step at a time and continue to iterate. Performance is not a, you know, like, like, check it once and then you release and you're good to go. I think that performance is a constantly evolving conversation on your dev teams um, because the world is constantly changing. You might be getting into new markets with users that have different performance needs, um, you know, or there might be new technologies coming out which, uh, you know, help enable access or, or something like that. Um, on our ends, we need to keep the testing overhead super reasonable. There's no lab. We can't test on like a ton of different real world devices uh, we also are like super busy, so we don't have tons of time for performance testing. So it needs to be simple, reliable, something that any one of our technically minded volunteers can do, um, keep that testing overhead low. And then I think the most important thing is just like asking users and talking to our users about how it's performing in real life. So making it easy to gather that feedback, maintaining strong relationships and connections with them, um, asking them to help with specific tests from time to time is a great way of, of just reaching out and um, both strengthening um, your business relationships with them, uh, but also making sure that your kind of performance testing lines up with the real world and, and the feedback you're getting. Um, I think the last goal is we really need to make sure that this works for people, these human goals. So regardless of the environment and how extreme that is, does your stuff work? Does it load at all? Um, and then related to this, um, you know, I view accessibility and internationalization and affordability. Those are all like really 
big areas, but I think that anyone who's focused on performance really needs to consider those as part of that performance work. Um, and again, like I'm not an expert on all of these areas and I might mess up from time to time myself, but that should be an active part of the conversation you're having um, with your front end developers, with all your developers, and especially as part of the, uh, the larger performance conversation. Cool, so let's dive into some strategies and tools and techniques. Um, and this is where we get into the really fun technical stuff. I'm gonna go through a lot of uh, the standard techniques kind of quickly. Um, the goal is to kind of show you what's out there and what you can be doing. And then watch this on YouTube if you're like trying to, trying to dive in and actually implement some of this stuff. Um, and, and really, again, not the expert, go find a blog post written by someone who's much, much smarter than me. Um, this is our stack, uh, at least it was up until nine days ago. Um, so we were running an Elixir Phonix um, backend um, using Nginx to serve it up on a $5 DigitalOcean droplet. Um, we used Webpack to optimize our front end assets and our front end is super simple. Um, it just uses some jQuery. So not a lot going on on the front end, which is actually good as you'll see. So to minimize um, power, right? Just looking at my notes. Um, there's a couple of things that we can do. Um, we really are focused on two things to, to reduce the drain on battery. We wanna cut out as much antenna use as possible because that is a huge source of battery drain. And we wanna cut out as much CPU and GPU use as possible. So like screen time and stuff, people are looking at the screen, that's fine because they're using your application, but how can we minimize activating that antenna and sending requests back and forth? And how can we minimize you know running something that's CPU or GPU intensive. Um, yeah, so there are a few strategies here. Um, the first one is we can batch requests. Rather than sending out a whole bunch of requests every 50 milliseconds, could we batch those out and send them out once a second, perhaps. Um, related to that, polling is not a great technique um, for, for kind of heartbeat polling or sending tel telemetry and like kind of user usage data. Um, you really wanna use a service worker to kind of queue that and batch it and send it. Um, really as much as possible, you want your request to be user driven. So the user does something and then that's a great time to send that request along with a number of other ones. Um, yep. WebSockets are pretty good, actually. If you can get a WebSocket going, they'll they'll idle. Um, I was worried that they would keep the antenna active the whole time, but they'll actually idle and slow the antenna down or like like shut it down. And then when you send the next request, um, they'll activate the antenna again. Um, you still need to to batch those requests, but at least you you can confidently use WebSockets without continually running um, the phone antenna. Um, and HTTP2 is good because there's less connections that are open. Um, I, was, I was wondering if that would work well and it looks like it does. On the um, animation and kind of you know timers and event timeouts, you, you really want to minimize animation. Again, if it's not requested by the user, don't have a giant loader spinning. You can just say loading, right? Um, don't be playing a giant GIF in the background unless the user's like actually scrolling to that page um, you know, or, or wants to see that. Um, Timers can be synced up. So if you have like one timer that hits every, you know, I don't know, 100 milliseconds and one that hits every 250 milliseconds, how can you adjust those timings um, or, or kind of combine the timers and, and have them go in sync so that you're not spinning up the CPU at a whole bunch of different times? Again, it's this, this whole idea of batching. Um, and use event timeouts. Like if you have a scroll event, any of the standard stuff there um, is going to be helpful so that you don't have tons of events hitting the CPU um, and, and triggering a lot of processing when maybe you don't need all of the results of those events. You just need to update it uh, once in a while. Cool, and so this is Google. Um, when you type in a character into Google search, it sends a request every single time. So like, obviously this is really hitting that antenna hard on your phone. It would be much better to just let the user type out what they want and then press the send button and make a single request. Um, you know, it's nice that Google like has that kind of real time results as you're typing, but in these extreme environments, it actually makes it much less usable. 
Um, this is a site that had a bunch of spinners on it, and you can just see how hard that's hammering the uh, the CPU and the, the GPU there. It's just like every time that there's an animation going, um, it's doing a lot of work. Now, I'm not an expert on kind of the animation or graphical sides of things, and there might be more techniques here that you can use to improve this performance. But in my view, it's just easier to not not have this issue by not dealing with it, right? Again, don't show a loading spinner. You can just show loading if, uh, if your stuff needs to work in these environments. Um, we have another strategy here. We want to minimize data use. So we want to compress payloads as much as possible. We want to only load content as needed if it's requested by the user. We want to cache anything we can very aggressively. Um, and for pre-caching, it's really important to get consent, right? So like if you're going to do something like I want to, you know, look at all of the links the user could click on on the page and then take the top 10 of those that they're most likely to click on and pre-cache that next load that's great but if people are on tight budgets and are paying you know for data as you go you want to let them know that you're going to do that and, and get them to say yes this is useful or no like i'd much rather um not potentially waste the data um or, or waste the money yeah um cool so i think that was it and then the last one is speed um again same technique as reducing data. If you compress the payloads, if you cache aggressively, that'll make everything a lot faster. So it's nice. You get kind of two wins on two different um, angles on the performance side um, just by, by using the same technique. Server-side rendering is really important, um, especially when we're looking at um, you know that time uh, to first paint. Um, because that'll that'll just dump a bunch of HTML down, even if it's just like a welcome message or a loading message. You know, show something on the screen, and then if you have like a, um, a single page application or something, you can kind of like load up the data in the background and and fill out that application window um, as you go. Yep, and you want to minimize the critical path. Um, so anything that doesn't have to run right away or load right away should be delayed as much as possible. A great example there is, is image loading, right? So if you can load images that are below the fold after um, you get the uh, time to interactive down and users can start using what they can already see, then that'll really speed things up. And we'll see how that works in a minute. Um, so this is the page that we're doing our tests on. Um, I like this as about like 30 or 48 groups listed on it. It has some user generated content, um, the names, the images, so lots of images to play with. And we're gonna try to see how quickly we can get this to load. Um, again, our performance goals, uh, our setup here is that we have a 400 um, kilobyte a second round trip time um, and on the latency side. And wait, I'm sorry, we have a 400 millisecond um, round trip time on the latency side, and there's a 400 kilobyte a second um, pipe that's open. So that's our that's our throughput right there. Uh, we also have a six time slowdown using the uh, the Chrome Dev Tools um, to simulate a bad Android device. And the initial load, we already have some goodies out the box because we're using Elixir and we have a very simple front end. We get server-side rendering. We're already using Webpack for minimization and uglification. And um, Phonics on the server side has built in cache busting. So, so it actually allows us to cache uh, resources like our styles or our vendor scripts or whatever um, out of the box. Kind of good, kind of bad. Um, so the first meaningful paint takes about five seconds. The time to interactive though, whew, that is not pretty. That is 20 seconds right there. Um, and we've sent just uh, over a megabyte of data. Um, just if I didn't say it earlier, our goals uh, for the first meaningful paint, we want to get that down to two seconds or less on the initial load and one second or less on subsequent loads. Um, and for time to interactive, we want to get that down to five seconds or less on the initial load and two seconds on subsequent loads. So we are definitely not hitting our goals as it is um, on the initial load. And you can see just how long a lot of that is taking right here um, in the networking panel. Um, and a lot of that is just straight up loading things, um, which uh, we will deal with in a minute.
Subsequent loads, that's a little bit better. I think we actually have hit our goals there um, just about. So it's one second to first meaningful paint and time to interactive. Um, we're only transferring uh, 12 kilobytes. Um, and then it's loading a lot of the scripts because we have that caching built in from the start. Um, so it's loading all of that. So you can see right here, we're just getting the HTML content um, for the groups page to see if there's any updates, but all the style sheets, all the um, you know images and fonts and stuff are already cached. So that's a big win out of the box. Um, let's look at some speed improvements. How can we make this faster? Um, we added Broadly and HTTP2 through Engines. We added bundle splitting um, through Webpack. And we have a very simple strategy there for now. We have our application styles in JavaScript, and then we have our vendors. The, the idea being that the vendors can be bundled up together, and those change a lot less frequently. So that'll live much longer in the cache. And then the application styles, because it's under active development, um, and our JavaScript code changed more frequently. Um, and so by separating the two, we can have this long-lived cache and then a much shorter-lived cache as we get improvements out the door week by week. Um, we've also resized group logos to display dimensions. So we actually use, um, what is it, image magic or something on the server. And when the user uploads a logo, we kind of cut that down to different sizes and to really make sure that we're only loading an image as large as it needs to be um, instead of loading like the original format or, or something that's too big. We're going to add lazy loading. So if you remember that list of groups with all their logos, hey, if you have the group name there, we can load the logos in the background and those will come in over time, but that's maybe not the most important content on that page. And then the last thing was that I was loading all of the uh, font off some icons at once. And we've cut that down to just the icons that we're using. Um, so that's what we're doing for speed improvements. And the results are fantastic. Um, on the initial load, we're hitting our goals. Um, we are under two seconds um, for the first meaningful paint. That's a 66% reduction on, in time. And then the time to interactive is under five seconds, um, which is a 79% improvement. We just cut out basically, like if you don't need it, don't send it down the line, right? So we cut out a lot of data. It only had to transfer 215 kilobytes. Um, um, and then it loaded uh, 511. That's after it gets uncompressed. So the compression helps cut down 50% of the amount of data that we had to transfer there. Um, and you can see that. You can see like on the right, that's where all of the group logos and stuff are being loaded. Um, and on the left here, um, that is the initial thing. You can see the first meaningful paint on the timings there. Um, so once we get that initial HTML response, it can load it um, right away from the server. We don't have to do a bunch of JavaScript to then generate the page or process the template. Um, and then the time to interactive, uh, I'm not sure where that is. But the point being, like, these strategies really made an impact. And, and you can see what that looks like here in the Chrome DevTools. Um, subsequent loads are great as well. We cut that down. So we're definitely hitting our goals at this point. Um, yeah. So the last thing that we wanted to add in um, at this point was a service worker. The goal is to really cache all of the static uh, assets up front and then serve static assets with a cache first approach. Basically, if you have the vendor styles or the distributed logo already in the cache, it's probably fine to just serve that. Um, and, and then maybe in the background, once that's on the page, you can go check and see if there's anything new. Um, we also want to cache pages as they are visited. And so as you go through the site, you know, you hit that home page, maybe you go check out a few groups profiles. To me, that says you're interested in those groups. So let's go ahead and cache those pages. Um, and uh, we'll serve those with a network first approach. So if you go back to the page and you're connected online, it will try to grab the latest content in case the user data has changed. Um, but if it can't do that, if you're offline or if that times out or something, then it'll serve what's previously cached. And I think it's OK. We don't really ask ask for the user consent to cache stuff that's already loaded. Um, but if we wanted to grab like a list of all of the group profiles or something like that, that's when you need a big button to like, hey, download it and make it work offline. 
Um, so this again has huge improvements, except we're uh, transferring quite a bit more information, um, but that's like such a small number. It, it doesn't really matter as much. I guess that's just like the service worker code that had to be added there. Um, but now we've gotten our first meaningful paint down uh, to half a second, the time to interactive down to six tenths of a second. Um, and we're, we're loading, uh, we're only transferring about seven kilobytes. Um, and then once that gets uncompressed, it's about half a megabyte there. Um, so I'm really happy with this on the initial load. Um, and you can see a lot of that happening right here where there's no network time. Like look at how little network time there is. It's able to just pull everything up from the service worker. Uh, as much as possible. Um, and once we get the service worker, if it's offline, right? So when it's online, it does try to grab, um, you know, the, the updated user content, like it will hit at least for the main page um, and, then, and then serve up the cached images or styles. When it's offline, it's all coming from the service worker and from the browser cache and it is blazing fast. I mean, you know, 100 milliseconds for first meaningful paint, 150 for time to interactive, nothing transferred. And then it, it just, um, you know, loads up about uh, half a kilobyte again from the, uh, the service worker cache. So I'm really happy with this. Um, oh, that's short again. Basically our, our strategy here, um, we can go to eight groups now and say, hey, like, grab the latest version of our application, you know, like, like give your consent, download that when you're at home at the beginning of the day, go walk around camp and help people and not worry about it. Just like hit airplane mode and do what you need to do. And then go back home, unhit airplane mode and, and load that up. And that's a perfectly valid strategy um, for these extreme environments. Like we can ask our users to, to do things in certain ways if, uh, if, if that makes the most sense for them. So this is Shorba again. This is um, oh, another content warning. Uh, this is where I'm going to start talking about our recent work in response to COVID on kind of the, the global grassroots movement that we are playing a key part in developing. Again, totally understand if this is not your cup of tea at the moment. Now would be a great time to uh, pause the call or mute me or something, get an early start on lunch. Um, and I'll be wrapping it up here. I just wanna make sure I'm not going too far over. So we got like a few minutes and then, uh, yeah, cool. So performance really matters. Like it's it's not just a tagline. I love, I love the name of this conference because it really makes a difference, especially once you get into these extreme environments or, or in situations um, like we're dealing with COVID where things are happening so fast. Um, but I wanna actually not talk about technical performance right now. I want to talk about organizational and societal performance. Um, and so what we're looking at is kind of in the big picture, you have um, governments and like larger societies and how they work and how they're organized. Um, some governments have been really smart and acted really quickly in response to COVID. Other governments are still not doing enough, um, which is tragic. Then you have like corporate or institutional uh, performance at the organizational level. And as we all saw in the past couple of weeks, that's been a pretty poor response. Um, where Wall Street is the ones getting the bailouts and they're still worried about, you know, that, that bottom line instead of just how are we going to get through this. Um, fortunately, uh, as you'll see, there are a number of corporations that are taking the COVID response very seriously and doing what they're trying to help. But overall, I'm like not super impressed with the corporate world or the larger institutions. What I love, of course, is the kind of grassroots and community level response. Um, we're not able to do as much um, overall, but we're, again, super resilient, super adaptable, and really can reach out because we know our communities to make sure that the people who need help get it. Um, and then finally, the individual response, which I hope everyone is doing a good job of with the uh, social distancing um, and things like that, uh, but also making sure you're not, you're not over consuming resources, right? Like hoarding is not something anyone should be doing right now. Take what you need, stock up for a few weeks, um, you know, but there's no reason to be uh, featured on MSNBC because you have 10,000 rolls of toilet paper in your house. Um, cool. 
again, on the grassroots level, um, what I love about these scrappy aid groups, whether it's refugee aid groups, medical aid, or, or some other issue, um, like street outreach teams, is uh, that they're really fast and nimble. They're very low cost and efficient. They are lower volume. Like we are working with the resources that communities can spare to help each other, but they're everywhere. And I think that's what makes up for it really is that we can really fill those gaps and, and you know work with folks who often get lost in the nooks and crannies of society. Um, and that is almost more important than the larger scale response, which is often too slow and, and too blunt. Um, and yeah. Um, we're able to work around red tape very well. There's a lot of very gray legal areas that my friends and I operate in. Um, it's nothing super illegal, but it's, it's you know, nothing that you, yeah, I don't know. Um, like the, the most important thing to us is just working around that red tape and getting help to the folks who need it. Um, and we kind of set up these Walter White style delivery networks, um, you know, where it's like, okay, we need to move something into a country. We need to get medical supplies somewhere. Um, rather than having to deal with a whole bunch of difficulties at customs, can we just throw them in a backpack um, or a uh, suitcase and have a volunteer who's flying out there anyways, bring them as a carry on, right? Let's be creative because, you know, as, as we've seen with the government response, um, they're not taking things seriously. And, um, um, and, and we need to be, and if they won't, then we'll work around them. Cool. So just on distribute aid side, um, we were really lucky and we got 120,000 bars of soap to Greece in February, which was able to be distributed through an emergency distribution to say about 30,000 folks on the Greek islands um, before aid groups started losing access to the camps. In the first two weeks of this month, we got 50 plus pages of uh, knowledge and info sharing resources up in two weeks. And we're starting to get those translated in 10 languages. And oh my goodness, someone forked my code base, which is terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Um, we're working with Masks for Docs, which is a really big, they're probably like the, the US uh, grassroots response um, to COVID, um, but they're, they're really good about focusing beyond the US and making sure that they're sharing resources and, and helping folks around the world. And they're the ones who forked our code base. So within a week, um, they've had over a million hits on their website. They have 2000 volunteers organized. Um, they're basically creating a new worldwide mutual aid movement and we're very happy to help uh, share our experience and share our code and support them doing that. Um, and maybe I shouldn't give this talk anymore because they've thrown out my beautiful performant front end code and are, are replacing it with something that um, is more applicable to the medical aid scene. But I think because like I've spent this time doing this performance work, um, we can continue to work that back in, right? Performance isn't like a one-stop shop. Um, it's something that you have to be continuous about and you have to make trade-offs for. Um, but can improve over time. So I don't want to be too corporate-y. There's a lot of great groups that are working on this COVID response at all levels. Um, and we also, of course, are really paying attention to the aid organizations that we, uh, we love so dearly and making sure that no one is left behind, right? We, we need to make sure that everybody everywhere is protected from COVID because it is truly a worldwide crisis. Um, and, and that's the type of performance to me that matters the most today. Cool. Um, join us like on the individual level, take care of yourself, check up on your neighbors, help your community, stand up what's right at work, and don't wait on governments to make a better world. Um, you can get involved at resources.distributeaid.org, massredocs.com, and on the refugee aid side, indigovolunteers.org. And thank you. There's our Twitter handles. I would love to connect and talk and geek out. I'm sorry for running a little bit over time. Cool. That was awesome. Thank you, Taylor. I appreciate it. I, I learned so much. I think that you're not allowed to say that you're not an expert anymore. Um, <laughs> definitely not an expert. No, you are definitely an expert. That was wonderful. Um, I feel like that was a big old shot of empathy right into my veins and you know, it's so important to see the actual impact of this work and this stuff that we talk about in a very sort of like theoretical way and the meaning that it really has for people on the ground. It, it really means a lot to me. So thank you so much. 
Absolutely. And thank, thank you. you. Thank uh, you for uh, all you're doing to help refugees yeah. and to help with the, the crisis response. It means a lot. All right. Well, um, I'm going to drop or hand this over to Estelle, who's going to um, tell us about the, you know, the process for lunch. And we'll see you back here in a little bit. So um, <clears throat> for lunch, we are taking a lunch break. Uh, hello. So uh, if you want to network with people, you might have met some people that you want to hang out with. Um, we are still continuing on with the green room. So the room you were in before is the room that uh, we encourage you to go to. If your room had less than three people, uh, pick out one of the other rooms um, and you can see how many people are in the room. Uh, subtract one person because we have we had to set up the room. So uh, Michelle is in each room and she's not actually physically in each room. So there'll be one person less than shown, but pick a room where you see six or more and uh, jump on that one if, uh, if there weren't enough people in your room and you wanna meet more different people. However, if you were happy, it's your green room and we will come back. Let's make it, a f uh, we were 10 minutes over. So let's give you still uh, 55 minutes instead of an hour for lunch. So uh, come back at uh, 1235. I mean, 135 or 35 minutes past uh, whatever your next hour is, wherever you're located uh, in the world. So see you in 55 minutes. I should have said, go grab a lunch and then go into the meeting. Thanks.
Hello. Melanie, did you want to do a tech check? Yeah, can I? Um, oh, okay. Let's share my screen. Let's find a. Let, go, go ahead. ahead and, We're doing it now. Yeah. Okay. I just want to. Uh, do I share first and then? Nope. Okay. Share screen. Okay, hold on. I'm going to move. Does that look okay? Looks good and your sound's good. Lovely. Thank you. See you later. Bye.
I just discovered if I make the screen taller, I can actually see the timer. And we have 14 seconds left. So everyone should uh, start making their way back to the main room. All right, so I hope everyone had a good lunch. Um, I went outside and played a little basketball. It's actually kind of nice in Boston for the first time in a while. So um, I hope everyone got a little downtime. Um, so next up in our schedule, we have Melanie Sumner, who's a senior software engineer at LinkedIn. Um, Melanie is another person with an incredible resume of accomplishments and things that she participates in. Um, not only is she working on accessibility at LinkedIn, but she also works on accessibility and open source software. She's very active in the Ember community. Um, she's on the Ember JS core team. She's an organizer of the Ember Chicago meetup. Um, she's a member of the Long Now. Um, she's a judge for the CSS Design Awards. Um, and when I asked her, you know, how she's handling all of this downtime, she said that she's super introverted and so not a lot has changed in her life. And I am not super introverted, but I do work remotely from my house. So I also feel like not very much has changed for me, um, except, you know, there's now three other people in the house with me all the time instead of being alone, which I guess is a net positive. Um, and Melanie also is a big Animal Crossing New Horizons on the Switch player, like big ups to all of us. Um, she's in need of cherries and oranges. So if you um, have those on your island, then find her on Twitter so you can share friend codes. I have oranges, so I will definitely be sharing friend codes with Melanie to give her some of my oranges. Um, and with that, I'm really interested to hear about this talk. I think it's gonna be a great one. And we'll pass it to Melanie. Oh, thank you. All right, let me share my screen and we'll get going here. Let's see. Oop. Here. And there we should be good to go. Hopefully you can all see. Yes, good. Okay, great. Uh, oh, wait. Okay, so hi, um, I'm Melanie Sumner. Thank you for that excellent introduction, Katie. I'm a, my slides will be available online on Notist, uh, N-O-T-I dot S-T slash Mel Sumner slash H-Zero-P-L-C-Q. Uh, so yes, I'm a senior software engineer at LinkedIn. I am on the Ember core team. Um, I am a judge for the CSS Design Awards. And uh, before all of that, I was actually an intelligence analyst in the US Navy. Uh, yes, that means I was a spy. It's not as glamorous as you might think. I was mostly in inside buildings, but with no windows. So my situation has dramatically improved, I think. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, uh, Melanie R. Sumner. Uh, I absolutely love to share pictures of my life and, and love to see pictures of other people's lives on Instagram. Uh, and also if 
you're into the more business side of things, uh, you can find me on GitHub and on Noticed as Mel Sumner. Uh, I would have the same handle everywhere, but turns out there's another Melanie Sumner. She's a writer, which is pretty great because I have like a doppelganger who's an accomplished author. Uh, so we just can like, I don't know, share accomplishments. Not, not really, but it's pretty awesome. Anyway, one of the ways that we introduce ourselves in meetings at work, uh, since I work for LinkedIn, is to share something about ourselves that is not on our LinkedIn profile which is a really fun icebreaker. And hopefully uh, you can learn something new. Um, for me, it's usually one of two things. First, uh, it's either that I met my husband uh, while playing a video game. We were both playing Final Fantasy XI. He was a ninja, I was a white mage, match made in heaven. Uh, the other is that one of our favorite video games is called Portal. And we named our cats actually after characters in the game. Uh, on the left is Atlas and the other one is Peabody. Um, they are ridiculously photogenic. So my Instagram feed is mostly them. Today I wanna to talk about um, this idea of shift left. We'll talk about how people learned how to code, how pattern documentation should work or how I think it should work anyway, and how to make sure that your documentation is uh, up to par and how you can kind of adopt this shift left mindset because I think this will really help improve the quality of our code bases and prevent regressions in our code before they even happen. Uh, additionally, I think it will help us level up in our craft, in, in what we do as, as web developers, as engineers. Uh, so uh, I am an excitable person uh, in general, especially when I'm talking about something I really enjoy doing. And uh, one day my son brought home some coding homework and I was excited. I was dangerously excited, uh, but you know, I tried to play it cool since he was born. I've had programming books just, you know, around casually. No pressure. You can read them if you want to. I mean, they're for me, right? But you hope he wants to pick them up, right? So he brought home this homework and I'm super excited about it. Um, all my dreams were coming true, right? Anyway, his homework was uh, kind of like that lightbox code game. I don't know if you played it, but you can learn about procedures and loops and conditionals while you help a little character move around the map and jump up on things and turn lights on and off. Um, I helped him get through his homework, but he's 13 and it was homework. So he wasn't as excited as I was hoping he'd been, he would be. Uh, I didn't cry bitter tears of disappointment, but I did start to think about how I learned how to code, which of course led me to think about how other people learned how to code. And then of course, that led me to think about the different kinds of learning paths there are and how that really can affect our work. So what about you? How did you learn? Do you remember? Maybe it was a hobby that you turned into a career. That's what it was for me. It was coding was my hobby. And I thought, oh, I want to do this for a living. I like this way better than being in the military, right? Um, maybe you got a degree in computer science. Maybe this is your second career and you went to a boot camp and that's how you learned. Or maybe you just decided this from day one and yourself, but you're self-taught. Um, all of these ways are equally viable but they are unavoidably incomplete when we're building for the web. If the past 31 years of the web have taught us anything, it should be that change is a constant and any learning path that you choose is going to inevitably leave something out. And this is especially true, I think, when it comes to crafting accessible performance experience for the web. Continuous learning is an absolute must and I don't mean in a theoretical sense. There's also, there's always something new to learn for front end web development and excellence goes far beyond lines of code. And to be clear, I don't think that there's only one way to do this. I think it really depends on what part of the stack you're focused on, uh, how you learned how to code and what your interests and goals are. 
For example, if you have a computer science degree, but you're building UI components, you'll probably have to do some additional study in user experience and design. If you're a bootcamp trained developer who finds themselves learning tooling, you're probably going to have to study a little more computer science to improve the tools that you create. And no matter what kind of education you've gotten, you're going to likely need to study accessibility and assistive technology because that's not really included in any curricula. Another example or an example of this in real life is in soccer or football, if you name things correctly. I know, naming things is hard, it's fine. Anyway, players will usually develop the basic skill sets of the game, endurance, ball handling, and game strategy. Uh, and then they'll find kind of their niche. Uh, do they like to play offense or do they like to play defense? And then an area of the pitch, uh, left, right, or center. As a result, you can end up with different play styles or career tracks, if you will. I've identified three of them. Uh, there's a kind of player that develops as an all-around player on either offense or defense, but can play in any area of the pitch. Uh, someone like Thomas Mueller, who plays offense, but can do it from any area of the pitch, left, center, or right. His specialty is finding whatever space exists and then playing offense. Sometimes, even after a player has trained for their niche, a coach can ask them to switch things up. So you get a left back like Gareth Bale becoming a left wing, switching from defense to offense. And yet other times, players will develop their niche and stay there no matter what team they're playing for. Uh, Fernando Torres, or club they're playing for. Fernando Torres was a striker for his entire career. No matter what kind of developer you are, think about the position you're playing right now and further develop your skill set accordingly. Some percentage of your time must either involve deeper knowledge of the niche you are already in or balancing out your skill set by increasing your knowledge of the domains that will be affected by your work. Here's my tip. Think beyond the words of the task you've been given. There are a lot of other things that we should be automatically applying to our work, and excellence cannot be spelled out in a JIRA ticket. Let's look at this painting, uh, The Milkmaid by Vermeer. Now let's imagine this is a JIRA ticket, right? Like a normal JIRA ticket. It'll have an epic. It'll have a story, user story. I'll have some subtasks, and it will have story points. We'll give it five, because, you know, paintings are hard. Uh, and this, let's look at the subtasks. Gather materials, paint the picture, bring the picture to the gallery. But does that really capture what's going on in this painting? In the subtasks, it didn't have use perspective accurately or paint a scene that's vivid and evocative or use super, superb lighting techniques to create depth. Like those things are just expected when you're an artist. Well, there's not a direct one-to-one -one parallel since we have user experience designers and visual designers to support us now as developers. I still think the point holds up. There are parts of our expertise that we must bring to the task, every task, every day. These are things that should not have to be spelled out for us every single time. But I do think that they're easy to forget when we're in the hustle and bustle of the everyday and we should have shipped that feature like last week. So to help us remember, we can do what doctors do. We can use checklists. Uh, for example, I've got a few things you can keep in mind when you are doing, if you're a UI developer and you're next working on a UI, here's some things to think about. Would you, as a user, enjoy this UX? Could you perform this workflow with your eyes closed? Like keyboard navigation, if you had to listen to it, could you do that? Do you know what the accessibility DOM looks like? Uh, if you blurred your vision and you looked at the screen, could you still tell where the focus outlines were as you tabbed through the interface? If you pulled this up on your uh, mobile device, could you, what would happen if you had the accessibility turn, settings turned on or 
would it perform well? Uh, do you know what this looks like in high contrast mode? For every feature that comes in, every feature request that's assigned to you, do a little bit of a self-check. Uh, do you know how this new feature will affect user experience? I think so far we've heard some really powerful stories about uh, performance on lower end devices, on lower end data plans, on remote locations. And uh, it's really encouraging to, or reinvigorating, I guess, to really just think about those things in our everyday web development. And I want you to encourage you to especially think about this the next time that you start to engage with a designer on a new feature. One way to do this is to find common shared understanding through UI patterns. When you think, when you think about mm, what's a pattern, what comes to mind? So a uh, typical pattern, right? Um, we have some basic examples to show you how to use it. We have some variations. So you know, oh, in these cases use it a little bit differently. Uh, we have some, some way to copy and paste the code so you can use it in your own IDE quickly. Um, and like a, an example of it rendered so you can see what it would look like. And while this is pretty typical, I think they're missing some essentials. Now, maybe you're thinking, yes, but Melanie, this is enough for me to ship my code. This is enough for me to get my job done today. Uh, I, I don't think that's enough. Here's why. Maybe you think it's someone else's job to consider performance or accessibility, uh, which can help us rationalize really that kind of thinking can help us rationalize any number of challenges that we face on a given day. Um, not great management or general accessibility or performance ignorance, or sometimes even just like, but I just don't want to, right? Our own laziness. We have to battle those things like all the time. The thing is the most concise framework code in the whole world won't matter if we're not thinking about the future code that we're creating on a daily basis. Uh, uh, the patterns we create should be beautiful. Like that's something we should expect. Um, they should be easy to use for developers with step-by-step -step instructions. Like how to install them, how to add the markup, but some basic styling even maybe, I don't know. Do what works for you. Uh, but if it's missing essential information, it could be unusable for a, a significant portion of your user base. But we can confirm this by doing some math. What does an optimal DOM tree look like? Less than 1,500 nodes, max step 32 nodes, no parent node with more than 60 nodes. Now, not only will the suboptimal experience feel kind of sluggish, which really that should be enough on its own for us to revisit uh, implementation, but in some instances, it can make our screen readers crash. Uh, and if we're working on any kind of uh, code that needs to scale globally, we really need to be aware of this. So what, what are we missing out on? I think we need to not accept the quick answer as the complete answer. It's really, really fantastic that we can find solutions quickly on places like Stack Overflow, but a solution, it's not enough. Patterns should tell us what to do and give us some reasoning as to why. This will help our brains with long-term learning. Patterns should also include anti-patterns, what not to do and why not to do them. By investing the effort to create patterns that are the complete answer, we're giving ourselves the tools to craft better solutions for our users. Here's the thing, if a pattern or anything is missing information about things like performance and accessibility, then it's not complete yet. This is not meant to make anybody feel bad, but just get you to think a little bit more. It should be a signal that we're just not finished solving the problem yet. And don't stop till you get there. I've seen too many features that need a complete rewrite later because they didn't think about accessibility or performance until after the fact. 
If you think about these things as core requirements though, you'll have a better MVP instead of more technical debt to pay off later. By equipping ourselves with a more holistic view of our digital products, we're enabling developers to stop issues sooner. We're enabling ourselves as developers to stop issues sooner. We can prevent bugs before they happen. We can increase the percentage of our code base that doesn't regress in the first place. Do you know how many bugs your product has? Do you know how many accessibility specific or performance specific uh, bugs your product has? Who do you talk to when you have a concern about either one of these things? What is your process when you're handed a design that's not performant or accessible? When you discover that, what is the process in place at your place of business to do something about that? How do you me measure performance in your application? Do you know? If you don't know these things, you need to find out because Audits can help us with these things, but they're only part of the answer. And if we wait till the audit, we've waited until it's too late. And this is why I want us to think about this kind of shift left mentality now. I, I wanna encourage us to use template linters, to look for accessibility and performance in testing, to use performance benchmarking tools. Uh, we have these tools as developers that can help us before we even ship any code to production, before we even commit code, we have these tools to help us. We need to do that. And I think like, for me, this is really big. So I wanna really reiterate this, preventing regressions before they happen. It's less frustration for us and it's just good business value because we have Template linters like ESLint and Ember template lint to help us statically analyze our template code. And in these days, we even have it in our IDEs, uh, thanks to language servers. Um, in, because I work in Ember, in Ember template lint, uh, it's in Ember language server, which is supported with VS Code and IntelliJ. Um, and I'm sure other languages have these as well, but like we can know these things. And with these linters, we can analyze our code. We can customize what we analyze. We can even fix our issues through linting tools. But why else should we use tools like this? Because it's okay not to know everything. It's okay to accept that there's things you don't know yet, yet, and depend on your tools to back you up and help you out. Linters can provide you with the support for some things that you might not know yet. For example, did you know that you don't always need to add the alt text, but it always needs to be there? If the image is for presentation use only, use the rule of presentation or none along with an empty alt attribute on the image itself. If the image is essential, then a valid alt text or appropriate alt text should be provided. Template linting rules like require valid alt text in Ember template lint can help you and not just you, your whole team, no matter what their skill level, no matter where they are in the world. You're expanding your knowledge to everyone. Or did you know that you need to associate labels with inputs? So you need to have used the the label element or aria label, or if you're doing a search, aria labeled by plus the button. Uh, again, there are rules that will help catch this issue before you even commit a single line of code. Pretty cool. Uh, by actively using Linter, we benefit from actionable insights that we can use to make our work better in the moment that we're doing the work. We don't have to wait till later. We don't have to wait for an audit. We can do it while we're developing that piece of code or that feature. And we can increase our own confidence in what we produce. But this isn't the only way to get actionable insights. Performance analysis tools can also give us these. Uh, Chris Selden at LinkedIn created a tool called Tracerbench out of a desire to have more accurate performance analysis through macro benchmarking. 
developers can struggle to find and analyze performance regressions in a way that would allow them to make iterative changes within their local development environment, especially if working in an app that's scaled for global use. You're only working on a tiny piece of the code. And sometimes, how do you know if that's really going to perform well or not? Macro benchmarking is about holistically evaluating an app's performance. Performance at load time needs to consider a lot of interde interdependent, uh, concurrent things. And this is just the sort of benchmarking that Tracer Bench focuses on. It allows you to reliably test the performance implications of a change to your app by running a series of automated Chrome traces, collecting a data, sense, a data set of performance metrics. Not only does this provide low variance performance data, it also include, it introduces more statistical rigor in the benchmarking process. It encourages peer review by packaging a runnable benchmark, so no more but it's fast on my machine. And it's not just our apps that benefit from this. In the Ember uh, framework, we've used TracerBench to ensure that new framework features don't cause performance regressions in existing applications. This is important in Ember because of our commitment uh, to backwards compatibility. Proactively generating more elevated quality code before you push your code means that we can reduce the number of JIRA tickets that we have, which will give you more time for your next big idea. I think this is the best reason for using these kinds of tools. You're giving your future self the gift of time. Instead of working on bugs, you're working on a different feature, a new feature. That's pretty cool. So I have a challenge alert. Mia, Mia that's the, this is Mia here. And Mia wants to know, what will happen if you run a linter on your code base today? Do you know? Try it and see. That's the challenge. Try a linter out, see what happens. Next time you're in your code base, uh, run it and see what kind of issue it reports. Because audits will reveal these issues and more that we you know, don't have a way to test for yet. So why not fix the ones we know how to fix now? We've started working on ways to test for common accessibility failures. That's something that hasn't existed yet. Uh, as we work out how to put these automated tests into place, every developer will be armed with better decision-making support from the moment they start writing their code. But we still have a long way to go. So we need to use the tools that we have now to fix these things. Now, I know we're focusing on performance today, but I generally talk about accessibility. And if you've heard me talk before, you've heard me refer to accessibility as the final frontier of the web. Uh, and here's why. Here's why I think that's true. Because uh, intent matters. What is this designed to do? What's the purpose of it? And accessible interfaces are ones that can be used in the way that were designed or intended to be used. But we still don't have a really great way uh, beyond the roles that currently exist, a set list of values, we don't really have a way to say, but here's the intent of this piece of code. How we use the web has gotten a lot more complex. So uh, we need to be able to say, but this is what I intend for this. And, and until we have that, we're going to have gaps in our automated testing tools. Uh, until we have had to really look at the full scope of the accessibility test automation problem that we face right now, we probably also won't be willing to say this is how you do it and this is how you don't. So once we start establishing, once we start figuring out better ways to declare intent, uh, we will streamline our process a lot more. And this is what I mean about the need to shift left. Don't wait for the audit, move linting and performance analysis into the development workflow. So usually it's like design, develop, test, audit, move it from the audit, oh, back over, shift it left into the developer workflow. I genuinely believe that by understanding the needs of users, especially users with assistive technology, we will understand the clear path forward for the web. And we'll also increase our holistic understanding of what our code needs to look like to create the next generation of user experiences for every device. 
Yeah, I know. It's a pun. I'm sorry. Here's the thing. To me, accessible code is performance code, is valid semantic code. And this kind of code has a higher degree of quality to it, an elevated level of craft. Whether you started writing code knowing about these kind of quality standards or not, it should be your eventual goal. It's good to have goals. I want you to go home and try something. Oh, wait, we're all at home. So hmm, later, tomorrow, Thursday, yeah, Thursday, um, try something. Set a meeting time on your calendar or an alarm on your phone, something that allows you to set up a little weekly check-in. Take a little time for self-reflection. Check in with yourself. Did you have a today I learned moment this week? If you didn't, figure out why. Challenge yourself to make this idea happen. Keeping the today I learned mindset is essential for success in our field. Maybe you do this by working with performance analysis tools like TracerBench. Maybe you do this by starting your day with a code challenge. Maybe you do this by learning how to use assistive technology. Or maybe you do this by reading some spec. Maybe you do this by thinking about what spec doesn't exist yet, but needs to. Until the web as a platform is more stable, we'll be continually required to grow our knowledge skill, our knowledge set, our knowledge base, and we need to contribute to specification that doesn't exist yet, but needs to. I hope that I'm not the one breaking this news to you. Sorry, if I am, uh, this will be your today you learned, if it is. But our chosen career path uh, requires three things, passion, patience, and persistence. We have to figure these things out. We have to look at what's already been done and learned from it, and we must decide where to go next. The thing is, conference talks can be really inspiring. They call on us to imagine the future and they show us the bleeding edge of tech and inspire us to reach for excellence, which I hope I've done some of that in this talk. But what happens when we go back to work the next day? Figuring out how to change that conference inspiration into reality can be super challenging because reality, as we're learning, is often a bummer. The great news is, at least where the web is concerned, we can influence that reality. Accessibility is a journey. Performance is also a journey. So let's take that journey together. I want to thank you for the gift of your time today. Uh, I hope to hear from you. You can find me on Twitter or on the Ember Discord chat server. It would be great to see you there on um, Melanie. You can just find me there. I'd love to hear what you thought. Thank you. Yay, thank you, Melanie. That was so great. Um, yeah, I particularly love um, that you mentioned, you know, what happens when you go back to work and, and everyone is getting all of this great inspiration and how do you move things forward? And I think that's something that, you know, I always think about a ton when I'm in coming back from a conference is how do I actually make, make change happen? So thank you for all that excellent advice on like real actionable way to make changes happen back at your organization. It was great. Um, so now I think we're gonna um, take another just really short break if folks want to um, step away, use the restroom, finish up their notes and then come back fairly quickly. Um, so I'm going to share in the general channel um, if anyone wants a brain teaser I know I keep like talking about my kids but my kids wrote a coded message for me using symbols instead of letters and I am having a heck of a time trying to figure out what it says so um, I shared it in the general channel in Slack and if you feel like taking a couple of minutes to try to take a crack at it and tell me if you can figure out what the message is. That would be totally awesome. Um, and in a couple of seconds, we will um, start the panel. So I think looking back and thinking back on my notes, um, some of my favorite quotes today are, um, I like Melanie said, think beyond the work um, and think about what you know, 
more than just what's in the JIRA ticket. I think um, I really like Taylor's list of human goals and saying that accessibility, internationalization, affordability, and of course, like performance are human goals. Um, I really liked Aaron's point that the next billion users are not just overseas. And um, Andrew's insistence that PERF is about multiple moments and they all matter and we need to measure all of them. And then um, of course, I, Ira, pretty much everything that she said was amazing, but um, I really liked how she explained PERF metrics, which can be really confusing and like a really attainable and um, easy to understand way. So awesome. Well, I think um, all of the panelists are ready to go. So um, unfortunately, Doretti Herpa um, could not be with us at the last minute. So Estelle is going to be taking over and moderating the panel along um, with Lori Voss, who is a senior data analyst at Netlify. Jed Humble is a developer advocate at Google. And Jeff Lumbeck, I totally forgot to copy and paste his title into my document with everybody's names in it. Um, so he's gonna have to tell you himself. So I'm at that, I'm gonna pass it off to Estelle. To uh, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll start by uh, introducing everyone and uh, bear with me as I just picked up this task just a few minutes ago. But we have three fantastic panelists with us uh, today. We have uh, Jez Humble, who uh, used to uh, be, I think, the co-founder or the CTO of uh, Chef, wrote a few books, and uh, he lives out in Oakland with his partner and two fantastic kids. Um, and um, then we have uh, Jeff Lumbeck, who is an engineering manager at Ease. And he is out in the middle of nowhere with his parents, his partner, and his uh, child or their child um, all living together at their parents' house because they got stuck in the middle of a trip to visit their parents. So they even he even has his siblings there. And then we have uh, Lori Voss, who was co-founder of uh, uh, Amazing, uh, which was a, kind of like what Bitly uh, is. And then he was COO of, um, of uh, NPM, uh, but mostly he uh, is uh, newly engaged. And I believe he got engaged to his partner because he's in love with the dog. Um, so, uh, and uh, Jez knows all too well that when I meet people, I make fun of them. Um, so I'm glad he's covering his face and he's afraid of what I'm gonna say about him. But mostly uh, we have uh, the three of you. So why don't you go ahead and, and do a little bit more introduction of yourselves and then I'll start with some questions. You wanna nominate us? Who I'm should sorry. go first? Jez, go first, please. Okay, yeah, so just to clarify, I did not co-found Chef. I did co-found a company called DevOps Research and Assessment LLC, which was acquired by Google last year. Uh, my co-founder, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, um, was well, CEO, uh, written a few books on technology, and uh, I also am a lecturer at UC Berkeley. That's me. And his last name is Humble, but don't let that fool you. Yeah, my wife says humble by name, insufferable by nature. <laughs> Jeff, do you, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, I'm Jeff Lembeck. I am normally residing in Seattle. I had engineering manager for ease. Uh, fun fact, Lori and I worked together at our last job. Uh, so we, we have experience being on one of these screens. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I am I am stuck in Eastern Washington for the time being. A lot of, my daughter helped me decorate with these balloons. We couldn't blow up the long ones. <laughs> we tried really hard. I'll show you a trick to do it later. And uh, Lori, would you like to go next? Uh, yeah, one second. So this is the dog. <laughs> uh, his name is Guff. It's supposed to be a secret. That that's why my marriage is happening. But OK, cat's out of the bag, I suppose. Uh, I am um, primarily a web developer. 
Uh, that's what I think of myself as. Um, but for the last 10 years, I founded a couple of companies. One was called Awesome, not amazing, but I could see how you got there. Um, and uh, the other one is NPM. Um, and now I'm at Netlify, um, which is a very fun place to work if uh, you're building websites. Um, so uh, that's me. Okay, so um, we, here we have a, um, a, a panel with three very accomplished uh, cis white men. So I assume that the topic is going to be men in tech. <laughs> so, uh, let me ask you a few questions about being a man um, in this field. Um, so let me start off with like, how do you balance your, your personal life with your work life? Who goes first? <laughs> I think you just volunteered yourself, Laurie. Don't. Um, how do I balance my life, my, my personal life and my work life? Well, at the moment, it's extremely easy because I'm trapped in my apartment and they're the same thing. Um, uh, in general, though, I, have, I think I find it, I have it easier um, than even most white men, um, since as a gay man, uh, I just have, you know, the needs of my partner to occasionally consider it, plus the needs of the dog, um, and no uh, dependent, no other dependent mammals um, to take care of. So uh, I'm not usually required to do anything past that. So you know, easy mode has an even easier setting for me. I think. Jeffrey, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, I. Uh, Prior to the um, gigantic apocalyptic settings that are going on outside, uh, I wake up when my and and take my daughter to school in the morning. Uh, my wife and I work a separate. Uh, she works a little earlier, and I take care of the mornings and take care of my daughter or take my daughter to school, and then she can pick her up from school in the afternoons. Uh, but since I've worked remotely for the past eight years from my office in my house. I then just walk downstairs uh, afterward and get on at 9.30 and then get off at 5.30 and leave my computer in there. Um, I have uh, uh, that, that is the, the ticket to my sanity. Um, Can you ask me to show the artwork that was made for you today? Oh, yes. Uh, I have some I have some Play-Doh in my house, and so my daughter made this little girl for me uh, for art class today. So that was done with the uh, the kit. I see you've done a great job decorating your office. She she is uh, she is quite the artist. Um, but yes, takes up every waking hour that is not work. And Jez, how do you how do you manage your work life balance? Uh, thanks for asking. And, you know, just because I know that um, uh, sarcasm doesn't always work uh, cross-culturally, I just want to clarify, obviously, this is a satirical question, because men never got asked how they balance their work and life, because the assumption is that they have a partner who will, who will handle all that kind of uh, uh, externality, basically. Um, uh, but I think the thing is, like, as men, we should think about that a lot more. And I actually, especially coming from Europe, where there is a concept of work-life balance that is supposed to be real, uh, and we do actually, in general, take our holidays, I think it's really important for, for men to do that. So I am pretty good about, you know, stopping work at five and coming home, and then doing my best to transition to, like, actually be present um, with about a success rate of 50%, probably. Um, and... Uh, Behind me, you can see the desk that my daughter is using when she's uh, homeschooling because we're not allowed out because of the virus. Um, so I am actually in charge of homeschooling my daughter and my wife is homeschooling our, our youngest daughter um, because, um, you know, certain dynamics involving teaching particular subjects. I, I've got my eldest daughter. Um, but I, you know, my main wish is like, men should take paternity leave and they should take it for as long as they possibly can so that that's normalized and men should go home and turn off their phones and not answer their emails when they go home and not normalize the fact that you're supposed to work crazy hours uh, and let's as men model the things that uh, we want to be the case for everyone so that that's normalized and i try and do that just selfishly because you know uh, you know, I love working all hours that God sends, and I would much rather be working 24 hours than doing anything else. 
That was sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fundamentally lazy. Uh, so, uh, so you've reached to where you are today. So I want to know how can we get boys more interested in improving their communication skills? Um, and the other soft skills that make uh, people really successful in the workplace? That's an amazing question and so important. And I think this, this just goes to the heart of, of everything about computers that, um, you know, there was, there's, there's some great books, which I should have had with me because this is the time when we need them, um, which talk about how in the early days of computers, it was women who were doing the computer programming in the days of mainframes. And then basically when, uh, men realized that this was the kind of thing that they could uh, dominate and uh, and get paid a lot of money for. They booted all the women out. Um, and they designed these tests to try and assess if people should uh, were suitable for a career in computing, which basically tested for uh, being very socially awkward and being able to just sit down and sit around computers and, and not talk to people. Um, and which is why when you Google hacker on Google, there's a picture of someone with a hoodie sitting at a computer in a darkened room because, you know, that's, so we want to, we want to get rid of that. I think, you know, so, someone on Twitter who I wish I remember the name of notably said that extreme programming is basically like a program to compensate for the lack of social skills um, of, of, of dudes in programming, which I, which I thought was pretty spot on. And I think, you know, the answer to this is, you know, that individual performance isn't a thing what's the thing is teams performing. And in order to do that, we have to help people work effectively on teams. And I think this should be part of basic developer education. Certainly anytime you onboard someone, part of the training should be how to work effectively in a team. When you do performance, uh, as we do at Google and other companies, how you work on a team should be explicitly considered for performance. When we're giving rubrics for promotion, um, how you perform on a team and, and your ability to do that should be part of the rubric for promotion. This stuff should be everywhere. It should be part of our education. It should be part of how we hire people explicitly. It should be explicitly part of how we promote people. And we should make sure that we reward people who are good at that and, and help people who are not good at that. Um, it sounds like, Jeff, you also have a daughter and no sons. So we don't have any sons here. But how do you think in general we could get uh, boys in? Uh, interested I think I mean I think that was a, a great general answer but how um, also specifically can we get boys interested in improving their soft skills how can we convince them that it's that it's important um, before they get to Google and don't get a promotion or actually it would be any other company and not get a promotion because um, they're you know they're not inclusive and not helping uh, people grow because they're focused on themselves or 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 they're hacking and not realizing uh, that you have to bring people up with them, with you. Yeah. So uh, th this may be at the at the seeing this through a lens of having a five year old, but I feel like a conversation that happens a lot and that doesn't I I, I don't hear it as much. Or I don't hear it becoming a regular thing as much with little boys, but it happens a lot with my daughter is when it's making sure that when she is feeling a feeling very heavily to try and see if she could name it. Um, because the concept of being able to address and name the feeling that you're feeling makes it so your norm, your automatic response is not necessarily what automatic response for, well, I mean, was on the playground when I was a kid hit. Um, we have largely, uh, from my, you know, from my point of view, largely promoted the idea that um, young boys and young men are supposed to stoically go through things by themselves, um, burst out in violence or in uh, when something is not going their way, uh, and you know, handle things alone without stating what it is that they're actually feeling or addressing it at any point. And I think that starting there uh, is, a, is a really good way to get people to, um, to get boys uh, to the point where they can speak on these things. Uh, and then I also think that we should 
absolutely drill home writing. Um, writing cultures tend to, uh, the, the best software developers I've ever met are all phenom phenomenal writers. Uh, and I think that that uh, hitting them earlier with creative and conceptual writing and making sure that they have to, like things aren't tested just in isolation, but presentations and writing assignments, et cetera, will help with those so-called uh, soft skills um, because that's really where they all are is in how you communicate. Okay, so Lori, I mean, uh, building off of what Jeffrey said, you've hired um, a lot of people um, and you built a really excellent team at NPM. How were you able to interview and filter to make sure that the team that you were hiring was made up of good writers who knew how to label their feelings? Huh. Um, or, or were you successful at that? I'm not sure. I mean, it sounds like you were. But... It's, it's an excellent question. Um, uh, both Isaac and I um, are very, we care a lot about writing. Um, and that was something we noticed very early on about ourselves that was very um, unusual is that we were like, the quality of the writing of, of our coworkers was something that we appreciated and noticed. Um, so we explicitly made it um, a, a hiring criterion. We were like, you know, communication skills means that you have to be very comfortable with writing because the, um, the work pattern, especially with a company that had a lot of remote people meant that you had to do a lot of writing, right? You couldn't, you know, you couldn't sort of bumble your way through a meeting and get past it um, because a lot of people would be, you know, in different time zones or reading it, you know, a day later. And if your, if your writing wasn't clear, it didn't work. So um, we definitely started looking for that kind of stuff in the writing. Um, fortunately, resumes are kind of like, they're not actually a very good test or, or a demonstrator of very many things, but they are quite a good demonstrator of how good you are at writing um, because they are an, they're an exercise in uh, summarization and, pre and presenting information in a written way, right? Like that's the challenge of a resume is making something that, you know, is condensing your whole life into a couple of pages. Um, so it's one of the few things you can tell from a resume is whether or not this person is, is going to be any good at writing. Um, but um, to uh, go back to the earlier question, I think the, um, which is sort of related to this is like the way that you get those, you get um, men and boys to focus on those skills um, is just by demanding it, right? Like there's, um, I can't tell you how many times in previous jobs, uh, you know, there's been a coworker where people have gone like, well, you know, he's really bad at, you know, he's really bad at giving presentations, but uh, you know, you can tell he knows his shit. Um, and I never heard anybody say that about a lady. I never heard anybody say that, oh, she, you know, she's really bad at presenting, but I'm sure she knows what she's talking about. If she wasn't good at presenting, the assumption was she doesn't know what she's talking about. In fact, even when she was good at presenting, the assumption would be she doesn't know what she's talking about. Um, so as is going to be, answered, be the answer to many of these questions, the answer is like, there's an unconscious bias there and you just have to be aware of it. Like you cannot give men a pass. If, you, if men are repeatedly told, well, you know, that was a good idea, but you didn't talk about it properly, then men will get the idea that talking about it properly is part of the job. Um, that's a, a thing um, when I was hiring that it was a big, um, it was a big challenge early on to sort of instill into our hiring and recruitment process that like only, you know, at most 50% of your job as an engineer is the engineering and 50% of your job as an engineer is talking about what it is that you're doing and communicating what it is that you're doing. Because if you do really good code and nobody knows what it's for or why you wrote it, then it's as if you didn't write the code. The communication is just as important. So uh, thank you for that. And so just to follow up um, and can be answered by you by anyone, but like how do you filter through all those applications when um, you have a bunch of uh, people who are completely overestimating their skill set on that resume? <laughs> that was a huge problem. In fact, I got into, I, I remember very clearly getting into trouble in like, I think it was like month three or four of, um, of NPM because I was filtering through hundreds of resumes. Um, and I actually tweeted, I was like, I was like, dear women, if you have got 
more than a year of experience at something, it is fine to call yourself an expert at this thing. And people immediately started shouting at me like, you are demanding that women change their behavior to match men and that's sexist. And that was true. That's exactly what I was doing. I was like, I was like implicitly Sex saying- not experts. Sorry? I said men should not label themselves as experts. If it's only true. Why does a man who has a year of experience in anything immediately label himself as experts? But you know, I have read thousands of resumes and that is the bar as far as men are concerned. If you have been doing something for a year, you label yourself as expert at that thing. Um, you know, some people have been doing it for six months are like expert level at this thing. And I'm like, you don't even know what that is yet. You've not even tried it. Um, so again, it's like I said, the answer to this question is going to be the answer to a lot of these questions. It's an unconscious bias. You have to know that when a man is writing the resume, they are going to be overestimating their skills and you have to grade everything down. And you have to know that when women are writing their resumes, they will be saying, oh, I only know this a little bit when actually they've been doing it for five years. Um, yeah. One of the things that I found very, very interesting um, was uh, at NPM, we got an unusually high number, I think, um, of, of queer candidates because we made ourselves, um, we made it very clear that we were a very queer friendly company. Um, so trans candidates were often the wild card on that. Um, it was very hard to tell from a resume uh, a trans, when, when, it, you know, when I knew somebody was trans, it was very hard to tell where their resume was landing until I interviewed them. Like the disparity there was much larger, right? Sometimes trans people, sometimes trans people would like would write a resume uh, as um, as their gender, and sometimes trans people would write their resume as uh, the gender they had been perceived as growing up, um, and it was very variable. So we had to we, we usually had to go to go to in-person interviews to figure out what was going on with trans candidates. Um, so maybe for someone else to either answer that question, do you want to follow up or should I um, have my follow up question? I, mean, I, I do have a I do have a quick follow up on this. I mean, well, one of the things that a lot of places try and do is anonymize um, resumes, uh, strip out the, any gender specific terminology or race specific stuff as well, because, you know, talk about gender. <laughs> But if someone's saying they have their expert versus someone saying they're novice, that defeats right. Them. So this is the problem, right? It, it, that that then removes the piece of information that allows you to correct for the fact that men, um, and there's been studies done on this, that men uh, are willing to call themselves experts and kind of self-aggrandize in the way that in general women are. So that's a problem, right? So I think one of the things that um, can be done is let's talk about objective facts and, and strip everything out that is subjective. And there's only so far you can go with that, but instead of asking, you know, how would you assess your performance in this thing? Talk about, you know, how many years have you been doing it? Um, what, what actual experiences have you had and, and stuff like that? Um, I'd be really interested to hear if anyone has actually done that. We were anonymizing for a while. Um... Uh, until it, it it became very very expensive to anonymize basically because it's very you, you know any kind of machine generated we are going to anonymize this thing is fucking impossible that never works so we had to have an actual human whose job it was to anonymize things um, and uh, you know when we got three thousand candidates for one job we, really, we can't do that right now um, but uh, Jez as you mentioned like the you know even just asking how long somebody has been doing something. Like a man who had, you know, 5% of their job being doing this thing for a year will say, oh, I have a year's worth of experience for that. Mm -hmm. And it was often my experience that women who were like, oh, well, it was only half of my job. So I didn't count it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. Um, it's just a minefield uh, because it's very hard to, um, it's very hard to read something out of, out of somebody that they haven't put in there, especially when you have something as low signal as a resume to work on. So engineering requires a lot of multitasking. So what I'm wondering is why do you think men keep getting hired when we basically know that women are more experienced at multitasking? Yes, but we, we correct for that by making them <coughs> sit in a darkened room with headphones on and uh, posting blog posts about how meetings are evil. So that, that's, that's how we correct for that by uh, creating a work environment that strongly favors the inability to uh, multitask. I never thought of it before, but that's exactly what we're doing, isn't it? Brilliant. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, really improve on that. You're basically we call it 
That's we so call good. our inability to multitask flow. Flow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried so much. Uh, I, the, the amount of systems that we have created to make it so uh, developers can stay on task is amazing. Um, the, the, like, here's a Kanban board, which by the way, I love because I have to have a list that is in very specific order to make sure that I follow the thing that is prioritized because I, man, am not necessarily good at this. Uh, and there's whole systems around building these things to make it so people stay on task. And God knows every, God knows it's really, really difficult and requires like consistent pushing to make it so the average man who's reported to me historically actually like keeps track on that board. Um, but they probably need it more uh, than the women who always just fill it out. And I always know exactly what they're doing all of the time because they are like, oh yeah, I finished this thing and then this thing. And then we've got these priorities shipped and here's this. Uh, you're going back to communication is what you're saying. It, this is like the the concepts we like we just create communication tools um, over and over and over again to try to fill in this hole of where people don't necessarily go to. And I think you know the reason one of the reasons I think women feel the need to communicate more is so that people will know that they're actually doing what they're supposed to do maybe because we assume that men are you know men haven't told you anything for a couple of days is because they're terribly hard at work. Um, so we kind of have this, this, this assumption maybe as well. And going back to my theme of uh, uh, XP being uh, compensation for, uh, <clears throat> for like men's inability to, to do certain things like multitasking. I, had a, I used to work with this guy who um, took a lot of drugs and did a lot of partying when he was young. And he used to say how much he loves doing test driven development because when you're doing TDD, you only have to remember was I writing a test or was I writing the code that made the test pass? Um, so it's basically, again, a crutch for those of us who are not great at multitasking um, to, to be able to like stay on track and, and achieve play. Never, It's never occurred to me how much of the stuff that we've, how many of the systems we've built are just like mental crutches for men's inability to multitask. Now I'm gonna see it everywhere. Continuous integration. Continuous integration forces you to integrate your code into trunk. Version control is a communication tool, primarily. Continuous integration is basically saying, don't go off on your own for three days in a darkened room and write loads of code. Stop every hour and check it into trunk. And developers hate that because it means they have to talk to other people. Also, uh, close to my heart, um, uh, modularity, one of the, one of the uh, sort of founding principles of NPM is that like the more modules you have, the better. Um, and one of the things about, of, about modularity is that the average size of a module is about the size that one person can work on by themselves pretty effectively. Like there are some that are violations of that rule. Um, but the reason there are many, many, many small modules is because men find it easier to work on one module at a time. And then you only need to know about the interactions between the modules and not how the modules work together. Um, and it's only just occurred to me that that is also gendered. Yeah, so so much, so much of everything, all like good practice around how we work, how we architect, all this stuff is built around stereotypes that we've created as a culture, which is and, and, and right, let's not forget about race as well, because, you know. So let's talk about race a little bit. Um, I'm not the right person to talk about it, but basically, uh, you, you know, we've, we, we've all had to, we should have all had to address it. And yet some of us have only, only if some people have addressed it. So what I'd like to know is how you can use your privilege to spread that easy setting. Who wants to go first on this one? Well, I've got some, I, I was somewhat prepared for a question like this. I think, you know, one of the things that it's super important to do as a, as a dude is, you know, and I, there's like the, the micro stuff, like, you know, if someone is getting talked over in a meeting, making sure you're like, hey, can we listen to what X said? Or if someone says something and then someone else claims it as their idea, 
without crediting someone with like, oh yeah, that was a great idea of X. So there's like all these micro things that we can do, like saying, so uh, X, I know you've got an opinion on this um, that I was really interested in. Can you talk about that? Um, like when, uh, you know, and, and I teach, I'm a lecturer at UC Berkeley, and this is something we have to be aware of when we're calling on people in class. Some people don't want to speak up. Some people are introverted. Um, you know, again, white dudes tend to feel very comfortable speaking up in a way that non-white dudes might not. So we have to find ways to compensate that. And, and that's true in our work culture as well. You'll find some people are very good at like loudly expressing their opinions. And then there's some people who don't. So design thinking is really good for this, for example, which is anytime you're going to discuss something, make people first write down their thoughts on sticky notes and then stick them on the board and then discuss them as a group. That's one way to make sure that everyone's opinion gets shared on the, on the team, not just the opinion of the person who shouts out. So using like design thinking techniques can help with this as well. So there's lots of these like little micro things that you can do. Uh, you know, obviously when someone's being a dick, find a way to say, maybe don't do that. Um, and then there's also macro things as well. Um, things like uh, making sure when there's an internal leadership position posted that we actually post it and actually assess candidates and make sure that those candidates are representative of, of the wider population, that we don't just say, oh, well, there's this, we really need a, someone to lead this. Uh, I know Dave would be really good at it. So let's just have Dave do it. No, you know, let's treat this the same as any job opening. Let's make sure we're looking at these metrics like um, retention. How long are people staying before they leave? Is that gendered? Is that, does that differ based on race? How long does it take before people get promoted? Does that differ on race? Does that differ on gender or other protected characteristics? So there's these macro things that we have to be doing as well. My, um, this question to me is mostly about inclusion, I feel. Um, and um, my experience of, of inclusion is mostly at uh, much smaller companies, I think, um, than you've worked at, Jez. Uh, and um, the single most effective thing that we did to increase inclusion, at least at the hiring stage, um, was simply leaving um, job postings open for longer. Um, because uh, hiring has strong network effects. People hear about jobs from people who already work there or people who you know, already follow that company. Um, so people who are similar to you are generally speaking closer to you in your network, right? Your network is full of people who are like you. So if you are looking for people who are more unlike you, you have to give them more time to get the news, right? Um, so uh, I, I never did uh, stats on it, unfortunately, when I had when I had the stats available. But I, anecdotally, um, I definitely noticed that you know the first wave of job applications for when we open a new position, like first three days, like it's all, you know, dudes and usually dudes I knew, um, and then like two or three weeks later was when people who I didn't know about and had never heard of before started showing up who were just as good, but it had taken them three weeks to hear about the opportunity because they were just that much further away in the network. Um, and so we began to have like, we, it cost us a lot because um, you know sometimes a really good candidate will walk in the door on day one and you know we're like, well, we hold this job position open for three weeks. And by three weeks later, they'd already got a job. Um, so, you know, we lost candidates that way, but I was like, the this is what increases the diversity of our pool. Therefore, we must keep job positions open for three weeks. And the thing is, the person who could get a job like that is someone who's networked anywhere and can work anywhere because they they, um, they already are on the easy setting. I mean, it's amazing how many people were laid off last week and already have a job this week. Uh, so uh, we just have a couple minutes left. So I did have three more questions, but instead of asking my questions, um, why not just ask um, if there's anything that you really wanted to, to share um, or sum up? I just want to give a shout out to a couple of some books. Um, this is Nathan Ensmerger's The Computer Boys Takeover, which is about some of the things that we were talking about, about the history. Uh, this is uh, Ma Hicks' book, Programmed Inequality, uh, which is about how Britain discarded women technologists and lost its edge in computing. And I don't have it to hand, but also Frida Kapoor Klein's Giving Notice, Why the Best and Brightest are Leaving the Workplace and How You Can Help Them Stay, I, I found interesting. Um, somebody in the, in the chat asked, uh, to ensure more inclusive hiring, should the hiring team uh, be composed of a more diverse makeup? Um, 
Uh, and the answer is definitely yes there. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I noticed about NPM in particular was that um, to an absurd degree, the diversity of the team that started the company was the same, exactly the same level of diversity it became as it grew. So when we started the company, there were two queer people, there were two women. Um, there was one person who um, identified as Latino. Uh, so, you know, two queer people is 40%, two women is 40%, and uh, a single Latino out of five people is 20%. And that shouldn't work like that. But when we were 100 people, well, not when we were 100 people, when we were 50 people, that's almost exactly the levels we were at still. We were 20% Latino, we were 40% queer, which is ridiculous. Uh, and we were 40% women. And it was, it was, it was just the, the company you are at the very beginning is the company that you stay forever. Um, so it's uh, whenever I'm on a panel that is asking, that is talking about diversity and inclusion, I'm always like, I don't know how to fix it once the company already exists. I only know how to fix it right at the very beginning. And even then, I don't know how to fix it if you don't start with 10 people. <laughs> um, uh, I think I think um, one of the companies that I most admire for the sheer amount of effort and money that they poured into um, being diverse and inclusive right from the very get-go uh, was Slack. Um, it's been pointed out by a couple of people that Slack was an unusual IPO and it created a number of black millionaires. Um, and there aren't a lot of IPOs with a, of, of, of which that is true. Um, and it was not an accident it was because from the very beginning, I was hearing about what they were doing and they were pouring money into DNI efforts and, and uh, hiring, uh, hiring diversity in particular. And they put out a great product. I mean, that helped. No, I mean, no, but the thing is, I think it was because they had a diverse team that they put out a great product, not the other oh, way. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if we didn't have teams and organizations and companies filled with white dudes, maybe there'd be less uh, startups that are focused on doing laundry and, and getting food and, and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> oh, just, just spitballing here. Nail on the head right there. Uh, I'd like to add on there that um, it, speaking from a management position, uh, the hiring and making sure that you like in your att to attempt to break the mold that the company has already set is is an incredible amount of effort. Um, the amount of time that people put into hiring right now as management, which I. I know because I've seen several times over, they will not know a thing about the candidate until they are five minutes before speaking. The amount of outreach that one must do in order to try to buck these trends, to make it so people feel safe applying at a place where a team is 10 people and all of them are white and two of them are women. Um, if, you know, in some cases that that's better stats than others. Uh, the, to make somebody feel safe to join that is, is a task that you need to understand as part of the job and that it will absolutely make you lose sleep at night. And that is the job that you have taken on. And, and I think also it's just so easy to spend all that time on that and then have an executive suite full of white dudes who all look the same and behave the same. and and just don't emphasize it. And then you may as well not have bothered with any of that stuff. And, and that, that's, I've seen that many times. Well, I wanna thank you all for, um, for being on this panel. Um, and I also wanna reach out to the attendees and say, I hope that you picked something up and that it's, um, it's not enough to, to just be like, yay, I agree with everything, but it, you, I hope that you try to be an ally and an ally is not someone that says, yay, I agree with everything. It's someone who actually doesn't say anything about yay, what I'm doing, but actually does it. So I encourage you all to, um, when you see something at work, put your, you know, walk the walk. We don't need to hear people talk the talk as much as we need people to walk the walk. So when you hear someone being um, spoken over at work who has a good idea, be that ally. Don't tweet about being that ally. Don't post pictures of yourself donating stuff. Just donate stuff. Donate your time, donate your energy. Um, 
So thank you very much. And I guess that is the end of this uh, block of talks. So we're going to take a half hour break or actually a 25 minute break. And um, then we'll come back. And right now, um, if you can go into the red room. Um, and uh, if you don't know what room that is, just pick one of the first five rooms on the on the list and hopefully we'll have at least 10 people in each room and we can meet some new people. Um, and then there is uh, the Estelle room is going to be a networking room. So if you're looking for a job or hiring, go to the Estelle room. Otherwise, pick one of the first five um, on on the um, list or the one that you were originally doing it. Um, and do we all get cookies? Uh, I will. I was actually the speaker gift um, is going to have something homemade in it, but it's not cookies. And you already have cookies because you're on Zoom and they're tracking everything about you. So the yeah, there's cookies there. So uh, see you all in um, in 25 minutes.
Are you straight with the video? To necessarily learn about some of the details of serving images in a more performant way. So who am I? I am a developer in New Orleans and who clearly also likes creating her own content. Did that weirdly speed up? Hello everyone, my name is Sia Caramelagos and I am here to talk to you today about responsive images for the web. This is going to be a great talk for those of you that are either new to
Hello. There we are, that should be better, I think. So I checked earlier on, so I think I should be should be good.
Hello, everyone. My name is Sia Caramelagos, and I am here to talk to you today about responsive. Oops. I think was that a little, I think that was a little uh, tech hiccup, a little preview of Sia's talk for later, which um, of course is pre recorded. So, um, actually, coming up right now, we have Mr. Phil Hawksworth, who is a, the principal developer experience engineer at Netlify. Um, I've had the extreme pleasure of hanging out with Phil a couple of times at various conferences and, and getting to know him and, and making fun of his accent. Because um, <laughs> I do a very poor British accent. Um, he was teasing me earlier about my jokes. I hope you all are prepared because oh, yeah. I have new jokes hand selected by my children who are six and nine. So if you're going to um, have any complaints about the jokes, I you can direct them to them. And um, I hope that no one is cruel enough to ruin a six and a nine year old's <laughs> life by <laughs> telling them their jokes are bad. <laughs> Um, anyway, so like I said, Phil, he's, um, he's at Netlify right now. Um, he has more than 20 years experience building web applications for a long, 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 long list of companies. And more recently, he's been getting really, really into the Jamstack. He wrote, a, um, he co-authored modern web development on the Jamstack. And the thing that's been keeping him busy from while well, he's working from home is that he recently joined a choir and since lockdown they've been rehearsing over live stream which I am like baffled that that would actually work first of all and secondly um, it means his neighbors have to listen to him squeal squealing and squawking and squarking <laughs> he actually said he wrote squarking I don't know what squarking is but maybe we'll hear it later during the karaoke we'll hear a squark mm. from Phil <laughs> all right let's take it away Phil all right, thank you so much. Let me uh, share my screen first of all. Um, and let's see if we can get this going. So, are people seeing the right thing? Are we seeing, uh, seeing my slides at this point? Yes. Excellent, okay, great. Well, I will, I will dive in then. First of all, thanks for such a lovely introduction, except for the, the shenanigans making fun of my accent. I should have, uh, I should have seen that coming. I so richly deserve it. That's that's fine. I was giving Katie a hard time about the jokes. Now I know that I was making fun of her children. I feel terrible, but uh, we shall we shall soldier on. Um, so uh, so let's get started. So first of all, yes, indeed, I am. Uh, my name is Phil Hawksworth, and uh, I am. Uh, well, I was going to say I'm happy to be with you. Uh, I wish I were with you, but I'm uh, happy to be joining you on the live stream. Um, it's been great to be able to watch some of these some of these fabulous talks and the and the panel and what have you. Um, so I'm joining you from uh, just outside London in the UK. Uh, so it's it's a little bit late at night here. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, my talk about web development won't be keeping my neighbours up through that wall there. But uh, as Katie said, they've been hearing plenty of my singing uh, in inverted commas uh, over the last over the last few uh, few few uh, days and weeks. Um, I'm uh, I'm conscious uh, that I've tried to be very fashionable and uh, use this word old school uh, and I've spelt it with a K to try and be hip. Uh, I don't feel as an Englishman that I'm particularly well equipped to be doing that. So apologies in advance for that. Um, but I do feel I was equipped uh, pretty well as an Englishman to use the word boring. Um, so I think one counteracts the other quite nicely. Uh, and so this, this idea of betting on boring is what I'm gonna be getting into, uh, talking a little bit about maybe building things for the web in ways that we might have discarded more recently because there are more fashionable things. I think there are real opportunities there. Um, boring is a word that you're very, you know, you take your life in your hands, putting that in the title title for a talk. Uh, of course you want excitement and you want interesting things at a, at a conference and an event. Um, so the fact that someone's gonna come and talk about boring uh, and no, it's not the process of digging a hole uh, that's not what we're talking about. Sadly, it really is indeed boring, not interesting, tedious. That's that's my starting point. Uh, it, seems, it seems like a, a crazy thing to be uh, setting off with, but uh, but here we go. Um, before uh, I do anything else, I should probably say I'm not trying to uh, by saying we should be doing boring things. Uh, I'm not 
saying that we should be doing the opposite of all the clever techniques and the kind of interesting insights that we've been hearing from other people at the event. Uh, there are smart people, there are invaluable insights coming through from this conference. Um, so I'm by no means uh, undermining those. Uh, but what I do want to think about for a tiny bit is what can we consider as our starting point for when we're building things and what are kind of the, the, the table stakes, if you like, and some of the baselines that we could be building upon that could actually get us a lot further than we think. So by all means, all of the other techniques and the insights we're being hearing about, those are those are just as, uh, just as valuable as ever. Uh, I'm just th thinking about a slightly different perspective uh, as well. Um, and we might want to think for a moment just a little bit about why do we build things for the web? You know, why we as, uh, as, as practitioners build things for the web? I mean, certainly we can build things, experiences that kind of delight our users and hopefully entertain our users. Many of us might be building things for the web because we want to educate uh, and perhaps inform. Um, certainly at times like now, you know, we might be wanting to build things for the web to, to offer support or provide support to people. Um, these are, there are lots of wonderful reasons that we might want to build things for the web, and these all sound lovely and they're absolutely you know, spot on as far as I'm concerned. Um, but there's another thing to bear in mind as well, and that is that a lot of us are building things for the web because it's our job. Um, you know, we, we have a, a day job which involves building for the web, and those, can, those jobs can sometimes include some complexity and some, uh, some other factors that might be a little bit different. You know, we, if we have a job, we probably have bosses and we have clients, um, and that means that what projects that we're building on might not be exactly as we'd set out uh, them if we had complete freedom ourselves. Um, I've, I've kind of shown this in the past, and it, it feels really pertinent at the moment as well, thinking about you know, how lovely it is to have you know, the perfect project timeline that starts with the brief uh, and ends in the awards like any good web development project does, of course, um, except as soon as we start putting anything between those two dots in the timeline, we realize that it's not really a perfect project timeline. It's just a, it's just a project timeline, you know, and things go south as soon as we think about how we, we need to start doing some work, of course, at some point. And before we can reap the rewards, uh, the awards at the end, uh, we need to launch something. Um, and before we can start the work, we'll need to figure out what the scope of the project is. Uh, and before we can launch it, we'll probably need the client to, to give us some kind of final sign off to say we built what we said we were going to build. Um, before they'll do that, probably, they'll probably want to do some kind of a review of what we've built. Um, and so already we're seeing that our beautiful, wide, long timeline is getting nibbled away at and there's less time to do stuff than we might have hoped. But we start, you know, we start building things, getting things out into the world. Uh, perhaps sharing them with the client, starting to see you know, progress as we build things, um, at which point normally that's when we rescope um, because we've started to actually make some headroom here and uh, some headway here and seeing what we're building and starting to understand the problem space a little bit more. So often we rescope um, and start things again. So now pace is picking up. We're moving a bit faster now. We're building with a bit more urgency, getting to that all important client review so we can get that sign off. And after the review, there's feedback and there's changes that need to happen. So the pace quickens again and things get a bit more frantic and we're starting to build um, a little bit more urgently and uh, maybe some of our processes are falling down, which is normally when something like this happens, where we've now we're deploying things and we're not exactly sure what's going on. Something maybe has fallen away, but the next deploy we know will be absolutely on the money. We'll be back on track, except this happens. It's like the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, it gets a bit frantic. So then you know, the pace quickens again to get that final sign off. Uh, and then we reach our final sign off, um, ready for launch, except then we discover that final sign off was final sign off. It wasn't strictly final. So we've got a few more things to do before we launch. Then the launch day comes and we're ready to sit back and enjoy things after we do a few more bits of builds, some fixes go out and then we're done. It's, it's chaos from start to finish. Uh, we'd love to say it never is and all projects are smooth, uh, but we know that often projects are a bit lively. So really what I'm saying here is that there's more than enough excitement to go around, particularly between you know, you know, these phases, these parts of the project uh, that I'm talking about here. So I'm all for introducing some boring uh, into this process. I'm all for introducing some things that are perhaps predictable. Um, you know, always behaving or occurring in the expected way. That sounds like a lovely thing when we're building things for the web. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about that and I'm looking at how we can introduce simplicity. Um, but it's not 
only about making things you know repeatable and predictable um there are reasons to simplify that impact uh, performance um and uh, uh and resilience uh, i'm noticing i'm getting comments are we are we okay we're all good okay so yeah there are lots of reasons um that uh, we might want to uh, i'm going to go back where are we here we are um yeah there's not not only um the reasons of simplicity and being able to uh, be confident in what we're what we're building that we might want to uh, relook at you know how exciting and how boring some of these things might be but also for reasons of performance and resilience and reach we'll get onto that in a little while i think it's fair to say that you know we've come a long way uh since the first the first web page was published um i know we're playing kind of buzzword bingo feels like this site should be on there as well i don't know if it's come up already i haven't seen it along the way um but no no conference like this surely would be complete without it but we've come a long way since you know that that site came came online um the experiences we make now are very very different we've got much more sophistication uh in the kinds of things that we're building in terms of the experiences that we're building uh, the users uh their expectations and their their um anticipation and their their abilities much more sophisticated now than when we started and likewise for things like the tools that we're building with and bringing to bear uh, on our web development projects um i think it's fair to say that as developers we love to invent we love inventing things that's what we've been doing all along since we started building building the web and building for the web uh, we love to invent we love to iterate on the processes and the tools that we're using improve things and reinvent things as well and that's something i want to i want to get on to as soon as i let this cat out of this door here you go here you go never ever had to do that during a conference talk in the past um it's a new one on me so we like to reinvent things um it's something that developers do for sure and that's fair because you know new challenges are coming up all the time and often they warrant new solutions but i'd urge you a little bit of caution here um i i love this quote from uh, uh, eric severy um who, who said you know the chief cause of problems is solutions uh i like i like having quotes like this from people who have have wise things to say although he also said dealing with network executives is like being nibbled at, nibbled to death by ducks um I, okay i don't know how to really apply that one although nibble to death by ducks does feel very kind of reminiscent of this stage of the project where lots of things are happening in lots of different areas and so i can kind of convey that a tiny bit i guess um but you know when you're talking about the chief cause of problems being uh, solutions it's a bit tongue in cheek of course but i think it's fair to say that we as developers in the web development community we love inventing new hammers you know we we might find that we've got a solution that's perfectly uh, viable for an existing problem but we love finding a new and creative way to solve that problem um and you know hammers keep changing all the time and you know i kind of wonder are they better hammers that we're creating well i think yes um some of them are but not all of them and therein lies the rub you know which which ones are the better better tools which are the improvements which ones should we use and I'm going to invoke a term here that I'm really I'm cautious of using but I think it's a really important term to uh, to have in your back pocket when you're thinking about these things it depends um we say it all the time and it feels like a ridiculous kind of throwaway comment something to wriggle out of giving a proper answer but I actually think that saying it depends is hugely important I think it's a precursor to lots of important questions um and if we're going to choose the right tools wisely we must ask questions we have to ask questions of what we're building why what it needs to do uh, and in fact you know again if we go back to our diagram of doom over here you know we we ask questions in this in this timeline you know the scoping exercise is exactly that it's the opportunity to ask questions and gather requirements to do with you know what the functionality is going to be the functional and non-functional requirements of a project getting these things gathered is critical and it helps us avoid frankly just defaulting to the same tools that we're just enjoying using because not every project of course is the same so i want to just give a very very brief very light example of something that surprised me uh, that's kind of pertinent to this 
Um, and that is in, the reason it's relevant is just the uh, perception I encountered of what tools I might have used to build this little thing. Um, so this is a little while ago now. Um, many of you may recall that there's there's a bit of a bit of a stampede to to liberate some content from from Medium a while ago. Lots of people were were grabbing content and and wanting to re rehome it. Um, and I thought it would be useful to build something that would would do just that. Would make it very simple for someone to say, "This is the the URL of where my content lives. This is my feed." grab that for me and create me a site which has an index page and then a page for every one of those articles. It's a very, very simple project, um, but I, I built this quite quickly, released the code uh, on into the wild and uh, and kind of thought thought not too much more of it. But then I started getting feedback and questions and a lot of the questions were to do with the performance of it. People were saying, wow, it performs really quick. It's really fast. It renders, renders really quickly. Um, how how did you do that? And you know, I, I kind of responded on Twitter saying a few people have asked me what I did to make this so fast. The answer is nothing. I just didn't add anything to make it slow. And I'm conscious that that sounds a tiny bit flippant, but really that's that's exactly the case. If we kind of think about what this what this thing is, there's not a lot going on really. I mean, I got the data, I made that data into HTML, I put it somewhere that people would be able to access it. And then when they asked for it, I gave it to the user. That's that's kind of web web pages 101 in many, in many ways. Um, but if we kind of look a tiny bit, um, uh, this is a slightly different angle, um, maybe through a slightly different lens. Um, what's happening is making an API request, and then with the data that comes from back from that request, we're rendering out some HTML, um, and then that gets deployed to somewhere that people can then access it later on, some kind of hosting environment. And then it's a traditional request response that that delivers that. Um, and so, you know, when you start to look at it this way, you know, again, it's 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 the building blocks of the web, um, but it's starting to introduce one or two terms that uh, that people latch onto. Uh, and this is one in particular that kind of surprised me. Um, someone who I who I won't name to protect the innocent said, "How are you rendering so fast?" that caused me to kind of think a little bit that kind of caused me pause right rendering what are we talking about when we're saying rendering and yes i know that i used the word rendering here in this diagram but um it's not so long ago that uh, i think I, I think i was made fun of after a conference uh, a few years ago where i talked about rendering something on the server and i was pulled up and someone said to me do you mean a server that returns html like web servers do and i said yes uh, but rendering has become a term that we use more often now because it's become a slightly more complex um, landscape. So I wanted to just talk for a moment or two about rendering and talk about the different types of rendering that exist. And I think there are there are three kind of particularly kind of um, prime examples of of popular rendering. There's client side rendering. So in other words, JavaScript in the browser manipulating the DOM to generate the view. Um, there's server-side rendering at request time, which is what you know web servers have done uh, for a very, very long time. So in other words, generating the markup on request at the server and then transmitting it to the client you know, when it's been requested. And the other, other um, one that I, I tend to think about is, again, server-side rendering, but this is at build time. Um, and that's generating the markup at build time so that it's ready to transmit when the client then comes later to, uh, to, to request it. Um, I often used to talk about server-side rendering at build time as, as pre-generation or pre-building or pre-rendering. I just find that uh, those terms seem to introduce lots of lots of confusion uh, and people talk about server-side rendering, but they're often conflating request time and build time. And I think there's a really important distinction there. What I was doing in this kind of naughty little example was I was doing server-side rendering at build time. It was, it was built uh, early. Um, and it was doing what Aaron Swartz kind of popularized when he, he used the term bake, don't fry. You know, it's baked in advance rather than fried up on demand. Um, and so that seemed to make a lot of sense to me. And it seemed like the obvious thing to do. But I was kind of surprised that people were, were asking, how, how have you done this? Um, I think this is a really good example as well of a process which is nowadays very repeatable. You know, this kind of column here, this kind of hollowed box column. Um, all of these processes are very, very repeatable and automatable. Um, there's nothing exciting or exotic going on with those, um, but they're very easy to, to repeat. Um, I think a little bit about um, 
the the model of uh, whether things need to be read very often or written very often, how often they update and how often you need to update a view of something. This kind of thing doesn't need to be uh, updated and refreshed every time any user comes to it. This is the kind of thing that might need to be updated once a day, twice a day perhaps, once an hour at a push. I suspect not, certainly not for things that I was, I was publishing. So it's, it's a perfect candidate for this kind of repeatable process. Um, the thing that shocked me really is why anyone would ask, what, how did you make it fast? Why would this ever be slow? I think, I mean, look at the, look at the site, uh, look at what's on there. It's the kind of thing that ought to be lightning fast. So I think it's a real sign of the times that people are asking, how did you render this so quickly? Um, the answer is I did the boring thing. I just used, turned it into HTML and served it as a, as a bunch of static assets, uh, nice and simple. Um, so modern tools support various different types of rendering, and I'm not bashing those at all. I think they're incredibly valuable and incredibly important. Um, and the question is, which is the best one? And the answer, of course, is it depends. Um, I'm very keen on assessing or like reviewing a requirement, the requirements before choosing the tooling. And it's, it's often a hard habit to break. If we consider these two sites, Katie mentioned at the beginning that I work at, work at Netlify, and I'm going to shamelessly use the example of two Netlify uh, websites to illustrate this point. Uh, the one on the left is our dub 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 site. It's our homepage. It's our blog. It's our pricing page. It's our documentation. It's all of that stuff. It's the website. The thing on the right is our web app. It's app.netlify.com, and that is the the application, the product that people interact with. Um, and they have very different profiles, and so they have very different tools. So the one on the left, you know, is updated regularly, but not constantly. It's read very very often. Um, as of certainly in, in contrast to how often it's written and updated. Um, I think of it as a viewing site rather than a doing site. Um, and so it's a good candidate for being rendered at build time and not at request time. Um, so it's a static site, a static site generator that builds this and then deploys it as a bunch of static assets for us to very boringly and efficiently uh, uh, deliver. The one on the right is, is different. It's updated constantly because it's personalized um, individualized content that's that's uh, that's there. It's read and written very very often, and so it's delivered as a as an app shell because this is a doing site rather than a viewing site. So um, I think Taylor mentioned earlier on about uh, rendering statically an app shell and then using client side rendering to enhance that pro with progressive enhancement, and that's what happens here. This is a site that's um, that served as some static assets of HTML and JavaScript. That's JavaScript as React. And then in the client side, it's doing client side rendering uh, to then pull in APIs uh, and enhance things that way. Two very, very different things and two diff very, very different tools. So I think it's important when we're choosing how we're going to build things that we need to choose wisely. Um, the, uh, the tools that we, we, we might use for one project aren't the tools that we'd necessarily use for the other. But I'm always keen on being as boring as possible and as mundane as possible to take out the risk as much as possible. Because infrastructure, for instance, can be complex, right? If we think about how we serve things on the web, you know, we've got a, a browser that makes a request to some infrastructure, perhaps it hits a load balancer that then hits one of one of, of our web servers, which then you know needs to get some data from somewhere, maybe a database server to return that to the web server for it to be mashed up with a template to create a view that we pass back through, comes through the load balancer and finally into the eyes and the browsers of our user. There's a lot of moving parts and a lot of lots of lines and boxes there. When we think about our deployments and how we update things on the web, um, that means that you know, whenever we make changes, we might need to be changing configuration here at the load balancer, code and logic and content maybe in the web server, more content in the database server, servers, I should say. There's lots of places we need to make changes whenever we make changes. Um, and this, of course, isn't just in production. This is in production and staging and testing and development. All of these environments that kind of could, should be the same. So there's a lot, lot of complexity. Ideally, you know, in production, we'd probably, you know, take some of the things uh, that can be served statically and move those out to a CDN. And then some of the requests are going to a CDN instead of to our infrastructure. It's a very common pattern, particularly in the enterprise. Um, and that, of course, then means that we've got to be deploying things there. Sometimes that's deployed from the web server. It gets complicated. It gets very, very exciting. And that's what I want to avoid. I want to avoid that excitement in the infrastructure um, because, of course, you know, back to our diagram again, 
every time we make changes here, at every one of these terrifying points on this diagram, we're talking about making changes to all of those bits of infrastructure and keeping those the same. So my challenge is, can we do this stuff at build time? Can we bake and not fry? Can we move this kind of exciting uh, infrastructure something to something closer to this, where everything is pre-rendered and pre-generated, uh, server-side rendered at build time, if you like. Um, so it's everything can be at the CDN. That gets us to this lovely kind of boring scenario of asking for stuff and getting stuff and everything else kind of going away. Um, not interesting, tedious, great. I love that. Um, because apart from anything else, it has implications, not just on the development workflow and our confidence, but also on things like performance. You know, if we're able to get to the point that we don't have all of that infrastructure and everything is being served quite boringly from just, just the CDN, um, that's a huge advantage over what we might do in more exciting stacks. Uh, the, the more exciting stacks might, you know, for the sake of performance, add static layers to improve, improve performance. And what I'm talking about there, of course, is caching. You know, we've seen this, seen this uh, ourselves and many, many of us when we're building projects that get complex. Um, where do we add caching? Well, you know, in the web servers, we'll add layers of caching. Uh, we'll cache common queries and databases, even through the load balancer. And of course, the CDN itself is, a, is just a big cache. The fact that not all of these things are cached and just some of the aspects are cached and some of the things are happening dynamically introduces some complexities there. And that's why you know, managing, managing this kind of infrastructure is, is big business. What if instead of that, we could just serve everything from the CDN, just say there is no logic that needs to happen that we need to manage. It just simply happens at build time and we push everything there. It's not as exciting, but the results are quite different and the performance profile is way different. Likewise for scale, you know, um, exciting stacks add infrastructure in order to scale. Um, the, uh, the fact that we've got uh, caching uh, introduced, of course, helps massively. But if we start to so think about how do we scale, and, and in other words, how do we handle increased loads, um, lots and lots of uh, requests, the traditional way to do it is we'll add infrastructure, we'll add more servers, we'll plan for more servers and cost more servers and get those in there throughout our infrastructure. Um, and that, of course, is something that needs to be maintained throughout the project. Uh, and we need to be able to deploy our, our code to all of these things and manage it. Far from boring, uh, alarmingly exciting, I would argue. Why does this matter? Well, I really think it's it's particularly pertinent at the moment. And I thought twice about putting this, this next slide up, but I, I thought it was it just it couldn't really be ignored. Um, this is uh, a, a post from, from Eric Meyer uh, a couple of days ago. Um, a week or so ago rather and he was talking about static as well and he was talking about um how at this time when there's lots of uh, lots of sites that are serving critical information um for people who sorely need it lots of infrastructure is failing lots of um architecture is not standing up under the load and i'll, I'll just call out this this one thing that he said which is too many sites are already crashing because of their cms's can't keep up keep up with the traffic surges and too many sites are using dynamic frameworks that drain mobile batteries and shut out people with older browsers. That's annoying and counterproductive in the best of times, but right now it's unacceptable. As I say, I thought, I thought twice about putting this up because I, I didn't want to just be too emotive, but I can't think of a better example of demonstrating why building things with the best possible principles and built to scale in, in ways that are you know, less exciting and exotic is really important and has huge dividends. Um, and is, is particularly important. But you might say static, static um, sites, static assets, deploying things directly to a CDN, not having a dynamic web server behind the scenes, that gives boring experiences. Uh, and actually, no, um, there's lots of techniques to work around that, and that's because the whole landscape is maturing. Uh, Marcus Shork, who's a CTO uh, at uh, a part of Unilever, um, kind of coined this term of static first, which I kind of like because it kind of puts me in mind of progressive enhancement, but he's thinking about this from you know, an infrastructure point of view. Um, and there are examples where you can start to think about how you can embellish you know, static hosting environments with serverless. You know, serverless functions can come to the rescue kind of as an enhancement. So in the little time I have left, I'm going to rush through uh, a rapid example. Let's see how quickly we can get through this. Um, I might be a couple of minutes over. Um, so this is a silly example, but it's just to demonstrate that 
without adding lots of exotic infrastructure or indeed exotic code or frameworks in the front end, we can do something that feels a little bit more dynamic. Um, certainly it's a little bit more playful than the territory we were in a moment ago. Um, but, uh, but we can also start to capture things like user generated content all without that kind of complex infrastructure. So this is a little site I made, uh, a bit more playful than the, than the last one called VLolly. The idea is that you can click a button and fill in a form where you can choose the colors, flavors of your lollipop um, and send a message, which is just a form. Uh, and posting that message will create uh, a new entry, if you like, on a URL that you can send to a friend uh, and give them a smile. Um, it's a silly example, but it demonstrates a few things. And you know, what would I use to build that out? Well, it depends. What are my requirements? Requirements I gave myself were um, wanting pre-generated pages with real URLs. Uh, I'm a URL nerd. I think URLs are important. Um, even for the user-generated content here, I wanted real URLs for that. Uh, data stored in the database, um, because I, um, I, but I don't want to become a, a DBA. Um, uh, and then also uh, access, uh, instant access to the new content. You know, we talk about um, uh, rebuilding sites and building things ahead of time and putting them onto a, some hosting infrastructure, but I want instant access to that that new content. I uh, didn't want to wait for a rebuild. So the tools I used for this, for this example, were um, I used Eleventy, which is a static site generator. We could have used anything for this example, any static site generator. Um, I used FaunaDB as the database, because that's a database as a service with an API that I could use. Um, and for the instant access to new content, I use Netlify functions because I'm familiar with it. Any serverless function provider would have been able to do just the same thing. So I'm going to show you a diagram. Oof, diagram, we'll dig into it really quickly in my oof, minute or so. I waffled at the beginning, so I'm going to go over by a couple of minutes. Um, so the, uh, um, the view uh, that's, that we see of, uh, uh, of any lollipop is something that's pre-rendered uh, ahead of time. It's a static asset. We just see that on the URL. But what about the, uh, the um, but how do we populate that? So we populate that with you know, some code that we run at build time. I'm not going to make you read this, but suffice to say that we authenticate with the database where all of our lollipops is held. We query for all the lolly datas, and that returns a, a, a promise uh, for that query. We resolve the promise of lollies, uh, and then we catch any errors. And this generates uh, a data object that we can we can then use our static site generator to give us a page for all of those lollies. Um, I also just wanted to be able to have a slide that says resolve the promise of lollies. It's a wonderful thing. Um, what about uh, how we uh, create these things? Well, this is another static view. It's a page with a form on it. Um, uh, and that form, where does it post? It posts to a serverless function because we have no servers. But we can post directly to a serverless function, which saves the data, pushes it to the database, and then sends us to the view of that lolly. Sadly, though, we're waiting for a page to a site to rebuild. So when we make a request to that new URL, that'll 404. But that's fine, we can handle that. And there's a couple of things that come to our rescue. Triggers and automation. I talked earlier on about uh, of, uh, generating content and being able to automate that kind of flow. We can do that here as well. And also we can trigger builds. Lots of infrastructure and lots of services now allow us to run build based on an incoming trigger, like a webhook. This is what that looks like uh, in this service. You know, I have a webhook, which is just a URL uh, that says, uh, there's a new freezer in the, in the lolly, a new lolly in the freezer, rebuild the site, please. Um, and what happens then is uh, that's fired uh, at this point with uh, when I call the save, save data function. Um, again, not going to make you read this. We authenticate with the database. We post the data. And once we posted it, we call our function, uh, call our API to, to rebuild, our webhook to rebuild. And then we send the, send the user to go and check for the, for the new page. And if, if when we check for a new page, if there is a page there that's been rendered already, then we uh, return that with a 200 static file. Great, we're done. Um, if it's not there, we're serving a 404, but we can do something clever with that 404. That 404 can actually be served from a, from a, uh, a serverless function. So we can re render a dynamic view kind of as an enhancement. Because uh, although the page doesn't exist here in our pre-rendered pages, it does exist, the data does exist in the database. So this serverless function uh, over here can go off and get that data and return it. So this is what the code looks like for that. You know, we uh, pull in our page uh, template as a JavaScript literal. We authenticate with the database. We get the lolly data. 
we serve the lolly as a response, an HTML response. Uh, and if there really is nothing there, then we break the bad news. And this is my proudest moment in this project, uh, creating a 404 page that looks uh, like this. Uh, this is this is my, my crowning glory, um, having a lollipop stick and uh, nothing there. There's some enablers that make this thing happen. So it's custom 404 routing that you can send to um, serverless functions. This is becoming more widely available now. It's really, really powerful. Um, events and triggers and automation can really unlock all kinds of uh, really interesting possibilities without having to add lots of other complexity. I know what I've shown looks a little complex there, but I've actually uh, illustrated quite a few things uh, all at once. Um, functions as a service uh, really uh, unlocks all kinds of possibilities as an enhancement. You know, this is the kind of thing that enables us to go further than we might have gone gone before with creating static assets and putting them on a file server or a CDN. Um, this example, you know, had no frameworks, had no client side rendering. Uh, there are no web servers. It's kind of boring, but I I like what that that gives me. I like the possibilities uh, that 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 gives us. Um, I can I'm I have to say I love JavaScript. You know, I'm a I'm a huge JavaScript fan. Uh, I think of it a little bit like salt. Uh, it can really make or break a dish, but you just need to be careful not to over season. Um, I think it's important that we kind of find the best recipes, find the best way that we can we can uh, uh, deliver the kind of things that we want as an experience and find the base baseline for it, considering what seasoning we need, and then we can serve it in kind of cool ways and then enjoy that. Um, some of these tools might be boring, but that's that's perfect for me. I'm I'm sold on that. Um, I'm sorry I had to rush through the last end of that. I'm a little bit over time. I apologise, but I'm done. Uh, thanks ever so much for for listening and for having me. Um, very happy to answer questions and uh, follow up. Uh, my Twitter is there on the screen at Phil Hawksworth, and uh, uh, and also post my slides a bit later on. Thanks ever so much for listening. Yeah, thank you, Phil. That was great. I I think that JavaScript is like salt. Is at least so far the quote of the conference for me that pretty much <laughs> that sums up pretty much exactly how I feel and I struggle to explain to other developers at work like eh, JavaScript is great but in moderation so yeah yeah you know, I think uh, Alex Russell often talks about I think he talked about it as like CO2 it's like we need mm -hmm. it too much will kill us <laughs> which I think is is exactly the same message but I think I, I think it's a slightly uh, different level of drama yes um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it's the same kind of sentiment, I think. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for staying up very late and dialing in to join us. We all appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. So um, while we are switching between Phil and our next talk, um, we're going to take another one of our short breaks. I'm afraid um, this is not going to be a joke break. You're going to have to wait for the jokes because I have some more important jobs to do. Um, firstly, I need to make sure that we thank all of our sponsors again. Um, the sponsors for this year are GoDaddy, Google Chrome, Mozilla, Frontend Masters, Speed Curve, Sticker Mule, and Precise Moves Chiropractic. And really, this is a very small event. Estelle does it practically all by herself um, and without the generous help and sponsorship from those um, companies, she wouldn't be able to do this. We wouldn't have been able to pivot from an in-person conference to a totally online conference because, hey, it turns out all of this stuff costs quite a bit of money. So personally, I just have a, I wanna say a really big thank you to everyone who um, helped sponsor and keep it going. Um, some other kind of housekeeping things. So um, don't forget that we have a live captioner um, who is typing up everything that the speakers say. If you go to perfmattersconf.com slash 411 and follow the link to the main Google Doc, there's a section um, accessibility and under there is a link that will take you to uh, the live caption feed for today. Um, <clears throat> also, don't forget that we have a party um, coming up after the last speaker is done. Um, Estelle has our favorite balloon artist who has come to the after party for the last two years and is an amazing balloon artist who's going to teach us all about how to make a couple of different balloon animals. 
I'm not cool and I didn't actually get any balloons. Estelle, come on. Um, but <laughs> I'm gonna try to dial in so I can, you know, take home something new and interesting and different from a, a web performance conference. Um, yeah, I think, okay, those were all the things that I was meant to remind everyone of. And so maybe there is actually time for just one joke. Let's see here. I'm gonna see if I can find a good web related, computer related one. Oh, this is a good one, okay. Why did Sally's computer keep sneezing? This is kind of a softball. Why did it keep sneezing? It had a virus, yes. James Steinbach got it, bam, yes. <laughs> All right, let's do uh, one more. What's the next one? Oh, this is a good one. Okay. Why didn't the skeleton go to the ball? Why didn't the skeleton go to the ball? Mm, this is a tough one. He had no body to dance with. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> All right, I think that's probably enough of the jokes. Um, you're probably all sick of my bad jokes, but um, coming up next, we have Sia Karamalagos. Um, <laughs> sorry, Phil, Phil, Phil got the joke super, super late. So I'm laughing at how late the response came. Um, anyways, Sia Karamalagos, she's a developer. She um, speaks at conferences internationally. She's a prolific writer. She's a Google developer expert, a women tech makers ambassador. She co-organizes uh, the GDG New Orleans and its main event, DevFest New Orleans, um, founder and lead developer for Clio and Calliope. And she was recognized in the Silicon Bayou 100. So one of the, as one of the 100 most influential and active people in tech and entrepreneurship in Louisiana. Um, that's an amazing list of accomplishments. And on top of that, she's a really amazing artist. When I was chatting with her about what she's doing <laughs> to keep busy, um, she, and she shared with me that she has a couple of Etsy shops. And since I work at Etsy, um, that is right in my wheelhouse. So I went and took a look at her stuff and it is really good. She has two shops, um, designs by Sia Shop, where she sells her charcoal drawings and coloring pages, which are super gorgeous. I'm gonna to have to buy some and download for my kids to color. And then crochet by, she, by Sia where she sells her crochet stuff. So, um, you know, right now it's really important to be supporting artists and small business people. So if I can plug my employer, um, go to Etsy and, and buy stuff to help keep small entrepreneurs going. Um, so with that, um, Sia's gonna, gonna say hello and kind of introduce herself and then she's just been having um internet connectivity issues today so we're going to play that video that you caught a little um, preview of and then at the end we'll chat with her again so take it away see ya all right thanks so much for that introduction and for the compliments i'm excited to talk to you all today as she mentioned my internet isn't so great and also my co-workers don't always follow the rules in the office space. So um, we're gonna watch a recorded video and I will field questions live in our Slack channel too. So if you have them, I can put, I can answer them there while we go. And um, I'll also post a link to the slides right after we queue it up. All right, uh, Jeff, you can go ahead and start it. Hello everyone, my name is Sia Caramelagos and I am here to talk to you today about responsive images for the web. This is going to be a great talk for those of you that are either new to performance or never had the time to necessarily learn about some of the details of serving images in a more performant way. So who am I? I am a developer in New Orleans and who clearly also likes creating her own costumes for Mardi Gras. And you can find more about me at Sia.codes or you can follow me on Twitter, I'm at the Green Greek. Now you don't have to rush to copy down anything on these slides. 
they are deployed at bit.ly slash web dash images dash 2020. And all of these are links. So you can click on them and go to the places for all the resources I provide. So why do we even care about images? Well, images account for 50% of the bytes transferred as a median needed to load a web page according to HTTP archive. So let's take a little bit closer look at that number. What does that mean? For desktop, that's nearly a megabyte for desktop. And then for mobile, that's nearly 900 KB for mobile. So that's a lot of bytes coming down the wire for people on you know, sensitive data plans or just low bandwidth or on phones that can't necessarily process a lot. So that's the median. What if we take a look at numbers beyond the median? Well, if we go to the 75th percentile, we can see that we're pushing over two megabytes for images. And then if we go to the 90th percentile, we're pushing five megabytes. That's a lot of images to be pushing down the wire to people that may not want it or maybe on bad internet. So what are our goals when we talk about images? Because performance is always a balancing act, right? Well, one of our goals is that we don't want users to have to download unnecessary bytes. But on the flip side, we want our images to still look good. In addition to that, have you ever been like reading an article on, the, on a news website, <laughs> especially right now, and you're reading and you're reading, you're like three or four paragraphs in, and then all of a sudden the whole thing shifts down and you have no idea where your spot is anymore. So we want to stop the layout shift. We just want to stop it. <laughs> so let's get started and let's look to see what's in our toolbox for performant images. One, we're going to talk about file formats. Then we're going to talk about size and resolution. Like what do we need to give our browsers? We're going to talk about art direction and the context of responsive images for the web. And then we're going to also talk about lazy loading. So let's dive right in. Let's talk about file formats. So choosing the right format can be way more important than any flashy new technique. I'm sure many of you already know the difference between raster and vector, but just as a review, raster are images that are coded pixel by pixel. So this pixel should be this color, the next pixel should be this color. So when we scale them, they look pixelated because they're only meant to be viewed at a certain size. Whereas vector, image, vector images are a set of commands for drawing an image. They can scale infinitely, but it would take a lot to describe a really complex image. So that informs a little bit of our choices. SVG is a format that we use for vector images in the web, and it's written in XML, and it's basically a set of commands for drawing. So it's really great for simple, limited colors, sharp lines, um, basically your logos and icons. They're also a great alternative to icon fonts. So you can bypass some of the issues by having to load extra fonts by just using SVG icons instead. GIF. So just don't. This is actually a video. You can download GIFs as videos. And if you ever have tweeted a GIF, Twitter actually converts all of those to video. Well, why? So GIF is a lossy compression format, and it uses this averaging technique that just looks terrible. And then animated GIFs are essentially flipbooks of multiple GIF still images. And for one, that makes them huge. And for two, maybe even more importantly, is that they're not very accessible. You only have access to an alt tag with a GIF. But if you use video, you can actually provide captioning. So we don't want to use GIF because they're large and they look terrible and there's better alternatives. Let's talk about pings. So pings or PNGs are great for photo-like images that need transparency. For example, this amazing cutout of my dog which you can probably see on my video backdrop right now. I put them against a galaxy. So it's really great for this when you just want like a head popping out of a page, for example. 
it's the lossless format. So what that means is that it's kind of like zip files. When you zip a file, you don't lose any of the data. The data is just squished together more. It's not lossy, which is good in some ways, but in other ways, it makes the file size bigger. So JPEG is our workhorse for images on the web. They're great for photo-like images that don't need any transparency. So here's my dog, Harry, again, but in the garden acting like he's growing a plant. Oh, and it looks like he's been up to some trouble in that garden. So if you, you can also use JPEGs for images that you show as circles. You can just add a border radius. So that's good to know that you don't need to employ a ping when, in that case. Now, what else about JPEG? What makes them so great? They are a lossy format, but it was a joint photographer's expert group who came up with this compression format. They wanted to mimic more what the human eye can and cannot see. And so what they chose was to compress by hue, which is something that we can't detect as easily. And so it's compressed in a way that we don't really notice. So we can serve smaller file sizes than an analogous ping but it still looks good. What are progressive JPEGs? Well, per, a regular JPEG rasters from top to bottom like the cat on the top row. And a progressive JPEG kind of does a pixelated blur up, which can be really interesting. Some people are a huge fan of these, but some people aren't. And one reason why you might want to consider whether this is the right choice for you is that it may be difficult for a user to determine when that image is finished loading. So they might just think it's a crap image and then that may or may not reflect poorly on your brand. So just know the downsides of that. It's also important to note that there is no size penalty. Progressive JPEGs are about the same size as regular JPEGs. WebP is kind of the best of both pings and JPEGs. It's, it supports both lossy and lossless compression. And it can also do transparency and it comes in at smaller file sizes. So it's great for um, getting our file sizes even smaller, but also using all of the techniques that we can with pings and JPEGs. The downside is that it's not supported on Safari and on Internet Explorer. So that's not great, but there's a way that we can still use it by providing fallbacks. And we'll get into that a little bit later in this talk. So just to review on file formats, what's our little cheat sheet? Well, SVGs are great for logos and icons. GIF, just don't. You want to use a JPEG for a still or a video for animation. Pings are great for photo-like images with transparency that have to have transparency. Otherwise, we want to convert those to JPEGs, which are photo-like but with no transparency. WebP is a great alternative to pings and JPEGs, but you need to provide fallbacks. All right, let's talk about size and resolution. So device pixel ratio, what does that mean? That means on a 2X screen, for example, a retina screen, you need an image that is 200 pixels wide to look good in a spot that's only 100 pixels wide. So in your HTML and your CSS, you say this image should be 100 pixels wide, but the image that actually needs to be slotted in there needs to be 200 pixels wide. Otherwise, it might not look great. And so in this example below, I've taken a screenshot of this dog in a bantha costume from my retina display. And on the right-hand side, I have a 2X image that's served in there, which is appropriate for that screen size. In the middle, I have a 1X. And on the left, I have a 0.5x. So basically, it's too small, and you can clear that. You can see clearly. You can see clearly that it's not clear. It's blurry. It doesn't look good. Um, so definitely serve at least the size image for the slot. And then it's it's a bit of an objective choice between the two on the right. If you can see through this broadcast. The image on the far right, the dog, I can see his eyes are sparkly. The, some of the lines are a little bit crisper. But if I hadn't seen that one on the right, then I might have been satisfied just as well with the one in the middle. So sometimes we don't necessarily need to um, provide 2x. It just kind of depends on the use case or how important the image is on that page, like visually. 
So how do we actually provide different images for different resolution screens? Well, now we have an attribute in HTML that we can use for the image tag called source set. And what a source set does is it tells the browser, it gives it a set of files and it tells them their widths. And then the browser can make the decision itself. We are not involved in that decision. We just provide candidates to the browser so it knows which one is the best to serve. So in this case, I have this place kitten that slash 300 slash 200, and that's the source. So that's the file location. And then the 300W means it's 300 pixels wide. And then I have a comma, and then on the second line, I do something very similar, but it's a wider image, and I say it's 600 pixels wide. You still need to provide a default source for browsers that don't understand the source set. And of course, we always need our alt attribute if it's important to the flow of the page. So what this does is it gives browsers a set of files, and then the browser knows the screen size of the user and also their device pixel ratio or the resolution of their screens. So the browser can choose the best image based on that information to show. The only thing that happens in this case is that it always assumes that the images are 100 view width, so 100% of the screen size. But that's not always the case, right? So in cases where we're not, where we don't have images that are 100% of the screen size, we can use the attribute called sizes and it looks a lot like a CSS media query. So in this example, I have some max widths. The last condition has no media attribute because it's a fallback if none of the other ones match. The order matters here, the first match is used. You still need your analogous CSS. All this does is help the browser understand more about the context of that image before it has to download and parse the CSS and then no, because if we waited until then, it would take even longer to render our page. So if I take a look at a waterfall so we can better illustrate this point, I have my HTML on the first line and I have my CSS that starts downloading immediately. And then I have a lot of images that start downloading. And if I wanted to force the browser to choose an image based on the different sizes from the CSS, these would not even begin downloading until after the CSS was downloaded and the CSS on was created. So we don't want to do that. We want to start downloading our images right away, but we have to give the browser a clue as to what's going on with the images. So here I have, again, my source set with different images, and I say what how wide each of those images is naturally. And then the sizes tells the browser at the different screen sizes, how wide will that be viewed? Well, this is starting to look a bit complicated, right? So one of my favorite tools for responsive images is this Resp Image Lint Bookmarklet. It's essentially a, a little piece of JavaScript that sits inside of a bookmark. And when you run it, you get an analysis of your page and it will tell you if you know, all of your images are really served at the right size and what percentage they are off. And then also what it will do is if you just drop a source set in there, it will then tell you the sizes attribute you need to use, which is really awesome because sometimes that can get a little bit complicated that. And also you might be surprised by what you thought you did in your CSS and what actually is happening. So this is a great little tool. There's a link down here to it. So how many different resolutions do we actually need? Science suggests that humans can see 720 pixels per inch when they are one foot from a screen. That's pretty close. The iPhone 11 is 326 pixels per inch and the MacBook Pro is 227. So in most cases, you're safe providing just one or two X. You might consider four X in the cases of really high resolution projectors or displaying art or something that's really visually very important. But note that most screens won't be able to show it much better than 2x. Let's talk about art direction. So art direction means much more than what I'm about to talk about here. Art direction in the context of images for the web 
is really about drawing attention to the most important parts or targeting specific features of an image when it's viewed on different sizes or platforms. As we can see here in this kayak image, on the very large screen, we can see the kayaker and a lot of the lake around him and the wake that he is producing. But then when we get on smaller screen sizes, we want to zoom into the part of the image that is most relevant, which is oftentimes the human element. And so in there, you can see that we have actually cropped it much closer to the kayaker. And we can do this with the picture tag. And so in the picture tag, I can provide an image. You always wanna provide your base image because if browsers don't understand picture or source, they'll still render the image with its source. And then I can provide different images for, with different media conditions. So I can provide this wide angle image and this narrow angle image. So if I wanna look at that in practice, this is the exact code. You see, I have this woman with her dog in the, and there's a Grand Canyon in the background, and this is a smaller screen size. But if I go larger, it'll switch to seeing more of the Grand Canyon because I have more screen space to show more, even though the eye is still drawn to the woman and her dog. We just don't want her to get too tiny on small screens. So the picture tag lets us do that. And then when it comes to performance, it also lets us provide bleeding edge file formats like WebP. So this is really exciting. What we can do is of course provide our image and its source. We always want an image and its source as a fallback for browsers that don't understand. And then we can give a source with source sets that provide WebP file formats as long as we give it the type of image slash WebP. And so browsers that understand WebP images will use that as a source. The first match will be used. So always remember that, the first compatible file type. So this is a great way to use bleeding edge file formats without breaking Safari and Internet Explorer. We can also do media queries for DPR on background images. You might wanna use post CSS or auto prefixer to get the right prefixes. All right, we've talked about a lot. We've got WebP, source sets, sizes. Oh my gosh, this is getting so complicated. It's a lot, right? So here I have my WebP as my first set, but I also have a source set with different images and sizes attribute, and this isn't even a very complicated sizes example. So it's starting to be a lot. So let's talk about how might we generate our images and mark up a little bit more easily. Well, for one, when I do things manually, <laughs> I always forget my command line um, commands for images. I like to use image magic and CWebP and there's an SVG one in there too. I'm just forgetting the name of it right now. But if you go to this link, you'll get this little reference. It's just a GitHub readme for that reminds me of how I convert images to different sizes and whatnot. So check that out. If it's helpful for you, feel free to fork it and make your own. But um, it also links to the different tools I use on the command line because I'm a developer. I am a terrible designer, so I don't have tools like Photoshop, but there are great command line tools. There are also paid services. If you don't want to do that manually yourself, Cloudinary is a great example. A lot of people use them. It looks like Netlify also has a service called Large Media, which I want to check out. And there's a lot of others that kind of do similar functions. And how they work essentially is that you have a base URL and then you use the URL itself to tell it how to transform the image that you have saved in the service. So you would get, you would upload a high resolution image and then you could do different query params to get the image that you want. And then it'll also automatically slot in, for example, a WebP if that browser understands WebP and then it'll also cache the images that it creates for the different requests that it receives. Cloudinary has this image analysis tool as well. And I have a star next to that because we're gonna talk about that. And what you do is you drop your web page URL in here and it will process and process and give you an image analysis result. 
Now, this is a Perf Matters website, but don't get too hung up in the score. It tells you overall what it can, how Cloudinary could, for example, serve up smaller images. But let's take a look in detail because it will tell you image by image how it could be improved, which you can also use to just improve it yourself. And some of these are great. Like it's like, oh yeah, WebP. Of course on Safari, that wouldn't be the case. They'd have to stick with JPEG. Um, and these are background images. So it's a bit more complex to try to serve that yourself. And, but then you have a few cases that it chooses JPEG XR. So if we look at, can I use JPEG XR is not really supported <laughs> on modern browsers. So essentially take it with a grain of salt. It is a great tool, but don't get too hung up in the numbers. Just use it for what it is and know that it can still give you a lot of performance, but um, don't take the actual numbers as gold. So what are some other tooling options? Some people choose to use a server or a serverless function to select the best image to serve once they receive a request. Uh, and there's some build tools too, like various Webpack loaders, but most of the ones that I've seen can't handle sizes. They could do a source set if, um, if you had a source set that didn't require sizes. So only basically 100 view width. A responsive loader, Gatsby image, Gatsby, Gatsby transformer sharp. I mentioned image magic earlier. Sharp is also really great, especially for um, writing JavaScript scripts to modify images. Just remember, display none is not a performance strategy. Some browsers will still load those hidden images. Let's talk about layout shift. So remember earlier I was talking about I'm reading, I'm reading, and it comes in and it moves. This is really annoying, right? Like you lose your place, especially right now, and I keep reading the news, I really shouldn't, but I get very frustrated. I'm like, I can't anymore. I need some of these people that work for these online <laughs> news companies to watch this talk because we can fix this. What we can do is if we have height auto set in our CSS and you put a height and width on the image itself, that tells the browser an aspect ratio. It doesn't matter if you're serving that at a different width. What this does is it tells the browser the right aspect ratio and it blocks out that size on the screen so that you don't get that jank. And Jen Simmons did an excellent video to kind of talk about this and also the alternative if you use it with width instead. So it's a great tool. Unfortunately, if you are doing, using for example, the picture tag to do art direction and you have different aspect ratio images, it's not really gonna work on those. So hopefully browsers will come up with a solution for that soon. So let's see our after. In the after case, we can see that it loads without moving my text around. Yay. All right. Let's talk about some loading strategies. Well, we have access to a loading attribute called lazy now, and it uses the intersection observer. So it won't load an image if a user isn't even scrolling near it. So which is really great for performance, right? Like, oh my God, unicorns and cats and rainbows and pizza and champagne, all my favorite things. But sadly, it is only available in Edge, Chrome, Opera, and some Android browsers. It's not available in Safari, Firefox, and of course not Internet Explorer. So that's very sad. In the meantime, you can use a tool like Lazy Sizes. There's also um, a way that you can lazy load embedded YouTube videos because they automatically kind of eagerly start loading in their iframes. So if you wanna change that, uh, take a look at that link. All right, so let's review our little toolbox. We wanna use the right image type or format. We wanna serve it at the right size for the user screen width and device pixel ratio. We don't wanna give them more and we don't wanna give them less and it looked terrible. We wanna compress images. Some tools I like are Image Optim, Tiny PNG, or um, their Webpack plugins too. I just, um, depends on how long you want your build process and what works best for your team size. 
You can also use newer improved formats like WebP, but serve them with fallbacks like JPEG and Ping. And then we can do lazy loading with a tool like Lazy Sizes. So there's some other resources down here at the bottom of the screen that you should definitely check out if you want to learn more. There's some great ones out there. And I want to thank you for coming to my talk. Once again, you can get the slides at bit.ly web-images2020. And I did a Twitter series on performance if you want to check those out, which is different performance tips. And then finally, of course, you can learn more about me at sia.coz or follow me on Twitter. I'm at the Green Great. Thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sia. That was great. That was chock full of a ton of information, but like prevented and presented in like a really good like progression of things to like build on top of what you learned before. That was really good. That's a really, really dense topic. So I appreciate it. Thanks nice so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I hope it was helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it was great. I saw you in the in the Slack channel um, answering questions and helping folks out. So um, I'm sure if anyone has any more questions, they can jump into Slack and ask you about them and definitely go check out her Etsy shops. <laughs> 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 I'm biased. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so we have just a couple minutes here where we're going to take a very quick break uh, while we wait for our last speaker, Tim, to come on. Um, and Estelle really wanted me to make sure to remind everyone to um, stick around for the party. Be ready for balloon animals. If you have a chance to blow up two of your balloons, um, the twisty balloons, you have to leave one inch extra at the end of one and seven inches on the end of the other in order to make the balloons. But please don't hurt yourself trying to blow the balloons up if it's not <laughs> that easy. Um, also, there's spots left still for karaoke and the talent show. Um, there's a channel, there's a karaoke dash sign dash up channel in Slack where you can go and sign up to do karaoke. Um, if you have a talent, no matter how small you, it may seem, we would all love to see it. Also, um, all of your Zoom mates are welcome to attend, um, eight o'clock EST is my kid's bedtime, but I'm going to let them stay up until 8.30 so they can come and watch the balloon artist. So, um, because the first half hour or so is gonna be super kid friendly. So um, I think that was everything that Estelle wanted me to remind everybody about. So I think I have two more jokes left to just give everyone a couple more minutes before Tim comes on. All right, I have another phone one. It was also phone and dog themed. So it works in a lot of levels for today. All right, what do you get when you cross a dog with a cell phone? What do you get when you cross a dog with a cell phone? Nobody, okay. A golden receiver. <laughs> okay, that's enough jokes. Um, <laughs> so next up, uh, we have Tim Cadlick. Tim, are you there? No, nope. I don't know if they put Tim's. How about now? Can you? Hear there me? you are. Yay. Yeah. Yay. Um, yeah. So Tim is an independent web performance consultant. He is a very, very, very big fixture in the web performance world. Um, I've been very lucky to get to know him in the last three years. You know, I think yeah, three years ago at Perf Matters was the first time I spoke at a web performance conference and I met Tim and I just have to say I know I said this before but WebPerf is far and away the most amazingly kind and welcoming community that I have come across in web development everyone is super friendly happy that you're here happy that you want to learn we're all here because we really care about the web and people's experiences and um, and I think I, 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 this is going to make Tim blush, but I think out of all of the nice people in web performance, Tim is probably the nicest of all of them. Um, if you want to listen to Tim, he does a really, really good podcast called Chasing Waterfalls. He's written a couple of books, high performance images, um, 
which is probably full of lots of information that we just heard from Sia. And then Implementing Responsive Design is another book that he wrote. Um, and he writes really well on um, timcadlick.com. So if you enjoy this talk, which I am super excited, I know we're all gonna enjoy it a ton. And you wanna see more of the nice Tim Cadlick, you know where to find him. So <laughs> you know, take it away, Tim. <laughs> I know. Was, yeah, was, <laughs> He's looking at me. <laughs> that was overly kind. Um, thanks. Appreciate that. I was just gonna say I've been enjoying the jokes. Uh, my kids know I have a very cheesy sense of humor, so each year it's been a thing. Um, one of them, or like they kind of, couple of them usually chip in around my birthday in November and uh, buy like next year's daily joke calendar. And if you can read any of them, they're terrible. Nice. They're terrible. Like like what happened to the noodle that went down the drain? Uh, he passed away, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's good stuff. But So tomorrow but you're going to tell the jokes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Um, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and uh, see if I can start this up and share things. And is everybody seeing uh, donuts? Yes. Yeah? Awesome. Good. You all get hungry right before the party. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so this is, this is Margaret Hamilton. Now, if anybody doesn't know who uh, Margaret is, you probably should. Uh, we don't get to be doing what we do uh, and in like talking about this kind of stuff, doing this kind of work, having an event like this, if Margaret doesn't exist. Um, before her, software engineering wasn't really considered an important discipline. Uh, it was certainly considered to be less than anything that's hardware related, certainly less complex and less significant. Um, it was, you know, the, the work that you gave to the lesser folks. Um, and she really fought against that. She was the first person to use software engineering as a term. Um, she really advocated for like, hey, this is actually an important thing that we need to focus on and pay attention to. Uh, and her work was influential in, in, in really sort of kickstarting that. So anything that's software engineering or a derivative of like that, like the web development, front end engineering, all of that kind of stems back from her. Uh, she also had one heck of a resume. Uh, in the late 1950s, her husband enrolled at Harvard Law. So she took a job to support the family at MIT. Uh, not a bad place to, I guess, if you're just looking for a job to support things. Um, her first job there, her introduction to computers and to programming was to develop and program a system that did weather analysis and prediction. Uh, just to sort of compare and contrast a little bit, because I always think that's kind of interesting. My introduction to computers and programming was to build a uh, web page that had bouncing basketballs and a spinning email. GIF, 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 GIF. Um, yeah. So pretty much the same thing. I would like to point out that I have, a, if you notice in the bottom right corner, there is a Lightspan StudyWed Academic Excellence Award. I remember getting that over email and I was very excited. Um, I don't think Margaret got one of those. Uh, <laughs> but no, so she, this was her start, was predicting weather. Um, and then two years later, she was writing software to detect enemy aircraft. Uh, so I suppose if your introduction to programming is building a complex weather analysis system and detecting enemy aircraft, you probably get a little bored. You're looking for something a little bit more challenging and complex. Uh, so when a job opened up for her to start developing software to send people to the moon, she jumped at the chance and took it. She started writing software for, at first, unmanned Apollo missions. Um, but what she's probably best known for is leading the team of engineers that built the software that powered the Apollo 11 mission that got Neil and Buzz to land on the moon. Uh, the Apollo 11 spacecraft was comprised of three modules. There's the command module, the service module, and the lunar module. Um, the command module, that's where the crew sits during the mission. It's what they fly up to, and it's also what they return back to the Earth in. Uh, the service module is kind of the dumb box out of the three, but also very critical. Um, it housed the engine, the fuel, the oxygen, the electricity, the water, you know, the things that kept everybody alive. Uh, together, they were the CSM, the Command Service Module, a very creative little acronym. Uh, and then there was the Lunar Module. And this is what actually makes the final trip to the moon. Um, and then when the team is done on the moon's surface, this is what returns back to the Command Module, which again, they use to return back to Earth. 
Now, as you can imagine, sending people off to the moon for the first time is probably a little bit nerve wracking. Um, there's a lot of variables, a lot of risk. Um, they wanted to make sure that navigation was precise. There was no room for error here. Um, so both the lunar and command modules were guided by an Apollo guidance computer, an AGC, um, to help navigate to the moon and back. This little computer was by any possible measure far from potent by today's standards. Uh, it had four kilobytes of RAM and 74 kilobytes of ROM. So just to put that in perspective, this little computer that guided everybody to the moon and back uh, had 0.1% roughly of the RAM in the iPhone 11. Uh, <laughs> with constraints like that, you don't have a lot of wiggle room. Every single byte matters. And so Margaret and her team had to be extremely efficient with their code. Uh, you can find the source code actually on GitHub. Um, so if that's your cup of tea, it's, it's kind of fun to look through. Um, the code for each of the AGCs in the root repository is about 1.7 megabytes, but that number is inflated because if you look at the actual code, you'll see all these comments included. Uh, these comments were obviously not included in the original code. They were actually hard, like written on the hard copy of these modules for documentation purposes. They've just been added to the GitHub repo so that we can benefit from sort of, you know, learning a little bit about, you know, their process and what they were going through. So the reality is that the code base is actually much, much smaller than this 1.7 megabytes. So to me, this is a, a really remarkable bit of engineering. Uh, less than 1.7 megabytes of uncompressed code to program software capable of landing us on the moon. Uh, it's it's fast, fantastic work. It's, it is impressive. The median mobile site ships two megabytes of uncompressed JavaScript. Now, I know it's... I, a little bit different. Uh, you have different languages, more verbose syntax, all that jazz, different stuff going on. I get that. But I still find it extremely humbling. 1.7 megabytes of code to send people to the moon. Meanwhile, 4.2 megabytes of code so that people can read very questionable dog facts. Uh, <laughs> Harry Roberts uh, posted an image on Twitter of an imager waterfall from their mobile site. And uh, it's, it's a lot. There's a, there's a lot going on on these little pages to display these images. We ship an incredible amount of JavaScript, and JavaScript is byte for byte the most expensive resource we have. Uh, because the wonderful thing about JavaScript is that you pay a performance tax three times, probably four. Uh, I suspect memory is an issue that is running rampant on the web, um, particularly on anything that's, you know, I, 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 you know, a single page architecture powered in Vue or React or anything with a lot of JavaScript running. I pretty much guarantee we've got memory issues lurking about, but the tooling's not quite caught up to where the um, tooling is on processing and things like that. So I suspect there's an awareness issue there, um, but we'll kind of leave that out for today. So let's just say that there's three times that we pay the performance penalty. Uh, the first is uh, the network cost, right? We have to pay a cost for actually sending down that JavaScript over the network to the device. Then we pay the cost on the device when that code gets parsed and compiled and turned into something the browser can run. Uh, and then finally, we pay a cost when that JavaScript gets executed. So there's a three-time payment. So I want to start with the network side of things. Um, if you look at the data from HTTP Archive, which was referenced, I know Sia mentioned that from the images perspective earlier, it's a fantastic resource, tracks millions of pages, and gives us all sorts of great information about those uh, you know, performance and otherwise. Uh, but if you look at that data and break it down into percentiles, um, we are currently sending 413 kilobytes of compressed code um, over the network to a mobile device at the median. Um, at the 90th percentile, it's over a megabyte. Um, desktop and mobile for compressed code seems to be about the same. Um, we're si we were shipping pretty similar amounts, a little bit more on desktop. Not a big reduction, though, for mobile here. Um, so. Again, this is compressed, which means that we have gzip or Brotly or something like that applied because when we pass JavaScript over the network, we can compress that text to save a few bytes. Um, but what there's a cost associated with this in terms of time, like transfer time that comes with this size. Um, but what's more interesting to me is the data impact, um, something that was kind of brought up today uh, a few times earlier by uh, Aaron and Taylor. Um, there was a great talk last year. Uh, Kenji from Google showed some Chrome metrics that they had. Um, and they had this really weird pattern of behavior that they're seeing in Japan. So what you're looking at here is a, a chart that shows uh, January through October. Um, 
and it's tracking page load time across all of these Chrome sessions. And what you can see is each month at the start of the month, the page load time is small. And as the month goes on, that page load time steadily increases until it peaks right at the end of the month and then drops back down at the start of the next month. Um, so we see page load time dramatically increasing as the month goes on. The same uh, Chrome data also tracked engagement. So you know how many pages are people looking at? Um, and if you look at the number of pages per users on these devices, you see the inverse happening. So at the start of the month, they're looking at quite a few pages. And as the month progresses, they're looking at less and less until it bottoms out towards the end of the month. There's only one month here that doesn't follow that pattern. So what's happening here? We have page load times increasing. We have engagement dropping, both of them doing it dramatically. So it turns out it's data caps. Uh, data caps are something many of us are dealing with. But it seems like apparently in Japan, contracts uh, line up a little bit more typically at the start of the month and end of the month. They're a little bit more predictable. Um, whereas we might have contracts kind of, you know, my contract might expire next week and yours a week later or something like that. So what's happening in Japan is towards the end of the month, as these data caps get hit, connections get throttled. Uh, and the load times start to go up dramatically and people use the web less. Um, it's been brought up a couple times again today. I know uh, Phil mentioned it a little bit too, in terms of like the impact of like right now with everything going on and the increased web use. Um, I think this is a really important reminder that data still matters significantly, um, which I think is very important because um, as Iray mentioned this morning, like we've, we've moved to these, we've got these great metrics. We've had this fantastic shift in the community where we've gotten a lot more uh, sophisticated about how we measure performance. We don't pay as much attention to things like load time and stuff like that. We focus more on things that are about how does the user perceive the page? How do they perceive how your site or application is performing? Um, but a side effect of that, unfortunately, is that we kind of lost focus on data a little bit. Um, it, we don't bring that up quite as much. In fact, one of the, I remember distinctly several uh, presentations that were early on in this sort of stage of like, hey, we're just now starting to let's focus on how things feel, um, would point out examples of sites that would load megabytes of, of, of data, not JavaScript, just data in general. Um, but, uh, and their load time would be slow, but the perceived metrics looked really, really good. And this was like a model of like, oh, hey, see, it doesn't really matter. You know, what matters is how it's perceived. Um, but this is a concrete example. Of, and honestly, everyday web use today is a concrete example of how data has a cost and data does have a consequence. So that network stuff isn't free. That being said, I wanna focus a little bit more on the device. The network data is interesting um, and it's important, but it's also a little bit misleading. It's not quite a vanity metric to say, oh, we're shipping 200 kilobytes of compressed JavaScript, but it's close-ish. Um, it doesn't sound awful, right? Like maybe you saw that 415 kilobytes at the median for mobile and you're like, ah, that doesn't sound that bad. That seems reasonable. Um, but most of the cost of JavaScript is incurred on the device, not the network. Increasingly, the sites that we build today aren't bound by the network. Uh, it used to be that was the limiting factor in performance, but not even that long ago, five, six years ago, it felt like. Um, nowadays, though, for most sites, the limiting factor for performance is the device itself. We're CPU bound because we're throwing high resolution images and lots of scripts and, and things like that at the device. Um, and so when we look at the on-device cost of this script, it's much more problematic. So again, going back to the network cost, um, we had that 415 kilobytes or so at the median for mobile that, you know, a little over a megabyte at uh, the 90th percentile. Uh, but we want to see what this actually uh, means for the device itself. So on the network, we get the benefit of compression. On the device, the device has to deal with the raw code. It has to deal with all of that stuff. So the compression doesn't save us anything there. Um, studies around gzip effectiveness show that for JavaScript, you're typically getting a five to seven time compression factor. So let's say conservatively that our uncompressed is only about five times larger. Uh, that means that the uncompressed script size that we're shipping down looks something like this. At the median, we're shipping two megabytes of code, as we mentioned earlier. At the 90th percentile, we're shipping six megabytes of code down to a mobile device. Um, these numbers start to be a little bit more scary. They start to be a little bit more eye-opening and I think a little bit more realistic assessment of the situation. But even more startling is what this means in terms of processing time. Because again, the device has to parse and compile and execute this. Um, so HTTP Archive does collect this data. 
uh, for both desktop and again, mobile uh, using these emulated Android devices. So we can look at what, uh, how much time does Chrome in this case uh, spend dealing with JavaScript on the main thread of the browser during the initial page load. The key point here is it's not after page load. It's not as people are interacting with the page. It's just from the time that you make that initial request to when the page is finished loading, how much time did the browser have to spend dealing with JavaScript? And those are where the numbers start to get a little unsettling in my opinion. Um, again, at the median here, now we see a big difference between desktop and mobile, by the way. Um, and at the median, we're seeing 830 milliseconds of JavaScript time from the desktop, which may or may not scare you depending on how hardcore you are in the performance. Um, at mobile, you're seeing 2.3 seconds. And at the 90th percentile, that is a whopping 10 and a half seconds of JavaScript work being done by the browser. Just JavaScript, nothing to do with parsing the HTML, nothing to do with anything related to CSS or anything like that, purely dealing with the scripts. Um, those are really, really big numbers. Um, getting back to both Aaron and Taylor, I thought they did a really good job this morning. I love their presentations, highlighting the various constraints and really uh, hitting hard like how the device type and all these other characteristics really impact data and impact performance and how it can be very different from one situation to the next. And this data supports that. If we look at that 90th percentile, um, the mobile experience is three times slower. We're spending about three times more time uh, dealing with JavaScript on these devices than desktop. And again, based on the emulation they're using, they're probably not even, they're not even reaching that, the, those $100 devices or $200 devices that we talked about. Um, so there's a big discrepancy here between desktop and mobile. So if we're building on our laptop devices, we're building on our MacBook Pros or whatever it happens to be, we're going to miss all of this. Things are going to look okay. They're going to look rosy. Um, and really what we're shipping out is unusable to a large percentage of people. The device plays a massive role. And so does the technology. Uh, I thought one of the other things HP Archive does is it lets you detect libraries. So it'll report like, hey, we detected React on these sites. We detected jQuery on these sites. So I thought it would be interesting to take the mobile numbers here and use that as a baseline and compare that to some popular frameworks just to see, you know, what are the characteristics? If a site's using jQuery, how much different is that from a site that, you know, the baseline or, or a site that uses React? Uh, this is the data for that. Uh, this is what happens to main thread processing time as you use different frameworks. Now, the first thing that's probably going to jump out at you because they're scary big numbers is that 90th percentile. Um, so our baseline was 10.5 seconds, which by itself didn't sound great. Um, impressively, jQuery sites seem to be a little bit uh, faster at the 90th percentile. Uh, keep in mind with all of this stuff, by the way, this is not necessarily saying it's React or jQuery or Vue that's doing all of this work, just that sites that have these libraries tend to correlate to a little more or a little less JavaScript processing. So jQuery sites seem to correlate to a little bit better in performance at the 90th percentile. Vue a little bit slower, uh, about you know two and a half seconds slower, which I guess compared to 10 and a half doesn't sound that terrible. React is the one that really scares me. That's, that's 20.8 seconds at the 90th percentile dealing with JavaScript, which is a massive number. Nobody's going to sit through that. Um, but the really the 90th percentile is those scary big numbers. But the thing that really bothers me about these numbers is the 10th percentile. Um, I chose a 10th percentile here because I wanted to see like if 90th percentile starts to represent like how bad can things get, the 10th percentile should give us an indication of how good can things be. Um, you know, we could have gone with a smaller percentile, maybe the fifth or first, but I figured you'd probably get some weird anomalies in there. So, I, you know, I thought 10% is reasonable. Like if you're in the top 10%, you're doing pretty good. But at the 10th percent, we're spending 2.7 seconds dealing with JavaScript on React driven sites. We're spending what is that, seven times more time dealing with JavaScript when we're using something like React than we are as our baseline. Um, everybody's a little bit slower. Views, you know, three times as slow as the baseline. jQuery is a little bit slow. Um, if this reflects as good as it can get, I think we have some problems. I feel like it's fair for us to expect more of our tools. I, I feel like it's, it's fair to expect um, that a good framework isn't just going to give us the developer convenience. A good framework is going to help us to improve performance or accessibility or security, those, those foundational fundamental things, by either doing something to help limit how bad things can get or providing some reasonable defaults that make it pretty easy for us or give us a really nice starting point 
And unfortunately, the data right now doesn't seem to support that either of those things are happening. Um, point blank right now, if you're using a client-side framework to power your site, you're starting out behind. Now, you may decide that that trade-off is worth it. Uh, and it totally could be. There's, there's perfectly valid reasons why these architectures make a lot of sense. Um, you know, and, and there's perfectly valid reasons why you may say that, yes, I'm willing to make a little bit of a trade-off here um, by using one of these things. But I think it's important for that to be a conscious trade-off. I think sometimes we reach for a tool, uh, reach for a new hammer, as Phil mentioned, that, um, without sort of realizing what we're trading off in the process. Uh, and I think that it's important that we make sure that we're aware of that trade-off and aware of what we're giving up when we're deciding to use one tech stack versus another. Um, and again, not to say that you can't make these tech stacks performant. In fact, we're about to talk about ways that you could potentially do that. Um, but if you're going to choose one of these architectures, know that you're going to have to invest some serious time and energy into making sure that the performance is at a high level. So all of this processing time manifests itself in these long running tasks. Um, long running tasks being you know, anything 50 milliseconds or more. Uh, this is a profile on my MacBook Pro uh, with a four time CPU throttle. Uh, when you're running any profiles on Chrome DevTools, I highly recommend throttling the CPU every time. Um, again, we're on pretty powerful machines usually, so we're going to miss a lot of performance issues. At least a four times throttle to sort of surface some of those things that might be kind of lurking underneath. Um, small caveat right now, when I run CPU throttling in Chrome DevTools, it keeps crashing my browser. Hopefully that gets fixed soon. Uh, but this is a profile of a React site in this case. And there's uh, a bunch of long tasks, all the red marks that you see across the top, as well as the little triangles in the corner of the flame graphs here. That's Chrome telling us, hey, these are some long running tasks that are over 50 milliseconds. You should look at them. Um, this pattern is pretty typical where I see a really large task up front to execute and evaluate one of the initial bundles being delivered. Um, it's a really common pattern for any single page architecture. Um, in this case, what we're looking at is 2.5 seconds of work. Um, and if you look through the flame chart a little bit, what you find is that it's React work. It's, it's React getting things set up, you know, hydrating the DOM with its synthetic event listeners and getting everything kind of connected and stuff like that. Um, that's a huge chunk of time, 2.5 seconds, where the browser can't respond to anything else. Now, there is work being done around progressive hydration inside of React that would let us choose to hydrate certain parts of the DOM um, right away and then hydrate other parts later and sort of break this up a little bit. And I'm really excited to see that become more robust and get rolled out. I sometimes wonder um, you know, how many of these problems we're inventing only to have to then invent the solutions to them. But that's probably a discussion we should be having um, after all of this goes away and we can meet and have beer again. Um, so yeah. The long tasks, uh, a pretty common symptom of anything with a lot of JavaScript, and it's one of the first things I recommend tracking um, on any site, really, especially, but any site, especially things that have a lot of third-party content or a lot of JavaScript uh, being run um, through a single-page architecture or something like that. Observing them yourself is not terribly difficult. Um, you can set up a performance observer. Uh, in this case, what we have is we're checking for any performance uh, events being triggered that are long task types. Uh, and anytime those come in, we're going to queue them up and we can send them back to tracking somewhere. Uh, if you're using any sort of real user monitoring solution uh, for performance, anything like speed curve or impulse or uh, you know, perfume or stuff, those sorts of things should be handling long tasks for you. Um, I think it's interesting because we haven't quite figured out the best way to keep tabs on long tasks. Um, there's a bunch of different approaches out there. So this is a, a totally fake thread, doesn't exist. Um, but these, each of these yellow blocks is chunks of JavaScript execution. Uh, and from a long task perspective, we're going to see uh, four of them. The 200 millisecond one, the 150 millisecond task, the 300 millisecond task, and the 100 millisecond task. Now, as far as the API is concerned, we, we are never going to find out about the 20, 40, and 15 millisecond tasks. Partly because anything under 50 milliseconds is a little less concerning. More so because if we get too granular with the timing, um, if we start to give too precise of, of timing information for those little ones, um, we start to open up all sorts of security issues and people can do all sorts of timing based attacks to figure out where you've been and what you're doing. And it gets bad security things, mess things up all the time, bad folks. Um, so there's different ways that we can look at this data and track this data. Uh, one would be to look at the number of long tasks. Uh, this is presented in Speed Curve. You can also get this in Impulse, which is Akamai's run product. Um, 
And in that case, the metrics just in this case going to report four. Um, so for tracking that, we're going to see four tasks. We don't know how long they took or anything like that. Uh, longest long task is another way of presenting this. Again, speed curve surfaces this. Um, I don't know how many other RUM products do. I haven't seen it in most of them. But to be fair, sometimes finding things in a few of them can be a little tricky. Um, but in this case, this metric would report 300. So we wouldn't know that we had this total. We wouldn't know about the other tasks. We just know we had that 300 number. The most common way I've seen it presented is uh, long test time, as Impulse calls it, or JavaScript CPU time, as Speed Curve calls it. Um, this is the total of all of these long tasks. So we're going to take our 200 plus our 150 plus our 300 plus our 100 and get 750 for the total metric. Um, this is the most common way I've seen it presented. Um, Lighthouse has a, a little bit of a variation that they're introducing with total blocking time. It sounds similar. It sounds like it should be the same thing uh, as what we just saw, but it's not. Um, it doesn't give you the total. It just gives you the, it gives you the time over that 50 millisecond threshold. So if you look at the name and kind of break it down, it kind of makes sense. If we assume anything 50 milliseconds or less is non-blocking, then the total blocking time is the stuff over that 50 millisecond threshold. So again, from this perspective, total blocking time isn't going to give us 750 milliseconds. It's going to ignore that first 50 millisecond chunk and give us 550. It's another way of looking at it. Um, any RUM provider or anything that you'd be monitoring could give you this information as well. Um, you know, honestly, I'm not quite sure yet how I feel about it. Uh, I feel like I kind of just want the sum number. Um, and I, I also worry that there's going to be some confusion. You know, Lighthouse is a huge influencer when it comes to what metrics folks adopt. Um, and I, I suspect there's going to be people wondering why Lighthouse is reporting certain, uh, you know, things for total blocking time and speed curve or impulse or whatever it happens to be has a different metric. Like the numbers are very different, um, even though it sounds like they should be the same thing. Um, that being said, you know, it's just the way the data is presented. Um, they're both telling you the same general information in the end. Um, my advice, because long tasks are such a new thing, and with any new metric, you always want to tread a little cautiously. Uh, but if you have access to this data, check how it correlates to your business metrics. Um, in, my in my experience, long task time or JavaScript CPU time has the strongest connection. Um, the number of tasks sometimes connects. Uh, longest text sometimes connects. But long task time, pretty much every single time I've ever been able to plot it against a business metric, it connects. It correlates. Um, so I highly recommend that, that as a solid starting point. I also really liked the way that Andrew presented this uh, this morning. I love this idea of meta metrics. Um, like if you have your supporting metric or your major metric here being total blocking time or JavaScript CPU time or whatever it happens to be, I love how he took these other ways of looking at it and presented them as these sort of additional supporting metrics that help to understand, help you to understand exactly what that big metric is actually telling you. So I think that's another very, very smart way to look at it. Um, but yeah, inside of any RUM tool, you should be able to make some connections here. Uh, so this is one client I worked with. Um, this is their impulse chart. Uh, it's showing conversion rate, that's your yellow, versus long task time. So you can see as long task gets, the amount of time gets longer and longer, that conversion rate sharply drops off of a cliff. Uh, speed curve has a similar, again, I, here we're connecting the JavaScript CPU time, same metric against bounce rate. And we can see that as the CPU time uh, increases, the bounce rate starts to steadily go up. Um, so these are, it's become to the point where I find it's pretty predictable. Like I can probably say with most certainty that for most of you, if you're tracking long task time against any of your business metrics, you will see a connection there. So I think it's a pretty safe bet to be uh, paying close attention to something like that. So we know that right now we're passing a lot of JavaScript down. I hope we kind of all agree it's too much. Um, we know that it has an impact on business. We know that it's leaving folks out. So then the next question is, if this is bad, what is good? Like, how do we figure out what good looks like? What's, how much is too much? So let's science this up a little bit. Um, think about the last time you upgraded your phone. Uh, for some of you, maybe this last month, maybe six months ago, maybe a year ago, maybe two years, if you're really pushing it. The average US consumer upgrades their phone once every 32 months. So that's almost a full three years between new devices. Most people are not running the latest equipment, nor are they running the most powerful. Um, you know, they're probably, most people aren't sitting there with an iPhone 11 or a Pixel 4 or whatever it happens to be. Uh, according to Statista, the average purchase price of a smartphone is $214. 
Uh, and this number is greatly inflated, by the way, by the people who do pay for the iPhones, like the folks who took out a second mortgage to get the iPhone 11. Uh, you take those folks out of this and this number drops down below 200. Um, but even the iPhone adoption, it's, you know, the amount of folks using it, something like that, it's less common than you might think if you were to just judge by our own tech community and, and the prevalence of iPhone devices there. Um, according to the IDC, global shipments of smartphones, 85% of those are Android devices. So if we were all to put all of this together and sort of create a, a user profile of like, what does an average person using a mobile device to access the web look like? Well, we'd have to say they're probably using an Android device. It's at least a year old, probably older, and it probably costs them less than $200. You can confirm this too. Like one of my favorite things to do uh, to figure out like what my next test device is going to be is watch the Amazon bestseller lists. Um, you can see what folks are looking at and what they're buying. So this is admittedly, I haven't updated the uh, checked recently. This is a couple months old. Um, but at the time, if you look, the only device that's over $200, you have to go to the eighth best selling phone to find something. Um, I particularly like the $30 track phone that is the, was the sixth most popular because you know that thing's going to be just amazing um, to browse the web with. Uh, but no, I, 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 this is a great resource. It's a fantastic way if you're ever curious to like build out what that next test device should be, looking at it, you could do a lot worse than looking at a bestseller list and just buying your cheapest device there or a mid tier device. I'm a huge proponent of testing your site on the crappiest, cheapest devices you can possibly get. You know, I've got several of these like Alcatel 1X and, and similar devices lying around that um, are just brutal using anything on the web, but especially anything that's powered by a significant amount of script. Uh, the more powerful the device, the more likely it is to hide those performance issues, particularly ones related to JavaScript. So we want to make sure we're doing some stress testing. Uh, so if we start with that baseline, that Android older than a year, less than $200 baseline, um, and then uh, Alex Russell, uh, who works uh, at Google, did this in a post, and he actually added this sort of variable of the network in, um, a slow 3G network based on global connection data that shows that we've got a lot of 3G traffic. And even when we have 4G traffic, it's often very highly congested um, and much slower than we'd like to see. Um, so if you use a slow 3G network and this sort of, you know, default uh, type of device as sort of our guideposts, um, what Alex did is he did a little bit of math and he realized that that means we have about 130 to 170 kilobytes of critical resources if we want to reach a four second timed interactive, which seems like a reasonable threshold to try to aim for, four seconds to get the page to be interactive and usable. Now, this is critical path resources, so this means we're not talking images or fonts. We're talking about things that stand in the way of that initial you know, critical path and rendering process. So that's your CSS or HTML and your JavaScript. So that does mean that you don't have 130 kilobytes to spend on JavaScript. You got to spend some on HTML and CSS. Um, so if, you know, in the more you're spending on JavaScript, the less you have in your overall budget. Um, but I'd say a fairly conservative number, like, I don't know, trying to be nice. Uh, would be to say that maybe we can pass 100 kilobytes of compressed JavaScript over the network and still hit this target. Uh, so that would be our overall number. But then what about individual bundles? Um, that's another thing that comes up often. As people are building a JavaScript-driven site or application, you're using Webpack or Parcel or Rollup to create these different bundles, and, and you try to be um, clever about the size and, and when you're pulling those in. You know, how big is too big for when it comes to an individual bundle? bundle? Now, again, I think we can science this up a little bit by looking at script loading behavior, specifically in V8, which is the engine that powers uh, you know, Chrome and uh, Edge and things like that. Or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Chrome and uh, Opera, or, you know, those sorts of uh, browsers. So here's how it works. We're parsing HTML. We come across a JavaScript file that we have to parse and compile. Now, traditionally, this all happened on the main thread. Um, so we download the file. We then, after we download, we move on to parse and compile. After we parse and compile, we're able to execute it. Um, all of this blocking the main thread, obviously not a good thing. Uh, it means we can't respond to user interactions. So most engines, V8, SpiderMonkey, which is used in Firefox, um, if it's above a certain size, uh, will try to move that parse and compile now onto a separate thread whenever they can. Um, so that means that what we have is something a little bit more like this. We still have this linear progression. We still download and then parse and compile and then execute. But at least we've offset that parse and compile time so that we have a little bit of window where the browser could respond to user interaction or do other work. Um, 
Now, the one thing that was always a bummer here is that you had to wait for the entirety of that script to download before you could start parsing. So if you're passing a 200 kilobyte script, you have to download the full 200 kilobytes before any parsing work could happen. That's no longer the case anymore, uh, not necessarily. Script streaming, which is a feature in V8, it's not in SpiderMonkey yet. They've talked about it, but they're also kind of working on building a whole new parser, so it's been deprioritized for now. Um, but with script streaming, what happens is the browser said, hey, let's not wait until the full file is there to start parsing. Because as it's coming back from the network, we're getting chunks of this file at a time. And parsing JavaScript is a pretty linear process. So instead of waiting for the full file to start, let's wait until we get 30 kilobytes or so. And once we have 30 kilobytes, we can start to parse that 30 kilobytes while the rest of the file is coming in over the network. Uh, so what this means is that we're now able to move the parsing time mostly in parallel with the download time. Um, it's no longer this sort of linear progression. We actually get a little bit of stuff happening at the same time here and speeding things up. And because parsing is so quick, so often after the JavaScript is downloaded, we're able, we're fully parsed very quickly after and execution can happen soon after. Um, so we've sped up this entire process. Now, where this gets interesting to me is when we look at the combination of this, this benefit of separate threads, as well as the streaming um, and, and being able to move the parse in parallel. So let's say we have two different scripts, uh, a.js and b.js, because I'm very creative when I name things. Um, <laughs> what we can do now is it, the browser is going to open two different threads to handle the parsing of these different scripts. Um, as long as those scripts exceed the 30 kilobytes and as long as they're loaded in a way that lets them pull it off into another thread, uh, things like async or defer guarantee that, um, I think not some non async and defer stuff can be moved off under certain situations, um, or at least they've been experimenting with that. I'm not hundred percent certain exactly how that works yet. There's a V8 expert in the you know chat room, jump on in. Um, but what this means, so what is it? This means that we now can actually have two files downloading in parallel and parsing in parallel. Um, so we're really offsetting a lot of that cost. So the first off, I want to make it clear, the takeaway here is not like script streaming is great. Let's make sure that if you have a script that's a little smaller than 30, you artificially inflate it to get script streaming. No, that's not what we're doing here at all. Um, there is a little bit of overhead communicating back and forth between these threads anyway. So it's not free this entire process. There's a reason they have a cutoff at some point. Um, but the takeaway is instead of one massive 200 kilobyte bundle, we're going to be better served by serving two 100 kilobyte bundles, for example, because now instead of having this one file, that's kind of doing the work all, you know, parsing and download is still happening in parallel, but it's happening for the entirety of that 200 kilobytes. Now we can actually open up that separate thread and have things like the full 200 kilobytes being parsed much faster in parallel, parallel, parallel which is not a thing, but I'm going to run with it because why not? Um, so you get the idea, right? We're spinning things up if we break these bundles down and take advantage of that script streaming functionality. Um, now, 30 kilobytes, again, there's a little bit of an overhead in communicating back and forth between the threads. So maybe 30 isn't the perfect target. Um, I think it's reasonable to give yourself a little wiggle room. So I would say to maximize the benefits of parsing and script streaming, we probably want bundles that are going to be in a 50 to 100 kilobyte per bundle range. Anything larger than that, you probably want to start breaking down. So again, we're looking at 100 kilobytes total and per bundle and no more than that 100 kilobyte threshold, somewhere between 50 and 100. These are not conservative targets. Um, they're targets that are going to help you hit like meaningful performance metrics. If you can get a timed interactive of four seconds or less, you're in great shape. Uh, they're targets that are going to help your company be more effective and profitable. There are targets that are going to open up your site to new audiences that may not be able to use the site otherwise. Um, but they're not easy targets to hit. And certainly anybody who's watching this right now with an existing code base, and you're looking at these numbers, you're probably ready to kick me off. Or maybe, or maybe you've already left because you're like, no, I'm not listening to the rest of this. Um, they're great numbers, but most of us don't get to start with a complete fresh reset. Most of the time we're coming at it from the other end of things. Um, so if you're listening to this and, and starting to break into a cold sweat at the idea of trying to whittle down a multi-megabyte JavaScript payload to these targets, I get it, I do. Um, most companies I work with are at that end of things. They're, they've, they've shipped it out. It's multiple megabytes of JavaScript. And now they're trying to figure out, well, how do we fix the performance issues that we've seen? Um, so more often than not, you're not starting fresh. You're trying to whittle. 
Now I could, if we were going to try to do a comprehensive, like how do you reduce the size of your JavaScript talk? Uh, I mean, frankly, that's a multi-day conversation, but I did want to give you a concrete example um, from one company I worked with who started out with a 2.6 megabyte vendor bundle. So vendor bundle being, you know, they bundled all of the different scripts from third-party sources, like their vendors into this one massive bundle. Um, so 2.6 megabytes on the device, 487 on the network. Um, ignore for a second, if any of you are like really up on your bundling stuff, you know, the vendor bundle is probably not the best approach anyway, um, because what it does is, you know, as soon as one third-party script changes, uh, your entire massive vendor, vendor bundle gets evicted from cache because the browser sees it as one file. So you probably don't want it chunked up that big anyway like that. Um, but in this situation, what we did is we tried to move forward and see how could we reduce the size of this bundle. So uh, there are a number of different tools, I don't know, five, six different ones you can use to analyze the bundles that are generated by Webpack. Um, there's similar tools for Parcel and Rollup. So if you're using one of those, those things exist. Uh, my favorite from Webpack is still Webpack Bundle Analyzer. It gives you this sort of, you can zoom in and out and it's got these nice colored boxes and the boxes are weighted, like the size of the box varies depending on the size of the actual script, but it shows you the contents of whatever was generated in those bundles. So when we looked at this, the first thing that jumped out is what you see here, AWS SDK. Um, yeah, that's 1.8 megabytes of parsed JavaScript, 244 kilobytes on the network just from this vendor library alone. Um, unfortunately, so one of the things that Webpack or other bundlers give you is this benefit of tree shaking, which is this idea that, hey, if, you're, if you got unused code, we can kind of shake it off, Taylor Swift style, that was so stupid, um, and leave it out of the actual bundle that gets outputted. Um, but you have to use ES modules for that to work. AWS SDK uses a common JS approach, which means we don't get tree shaking. So we have to pull this entire massive thing in, and we can't shake the weight off. So it turns out, though, that in their documentation, on a page that's in the middle of this very long list of pages, and in the middle of this very long page of words, there is a one-line sentence about pulling in just what you need and how you can pull in an individual service instead of the entire library. So for us, what that looked like was we had this before, uh, where we were importing the services we needed um, from AWS SDK, but it brings in the entire thing. Um, we just had to switch to actually detailing specifically which service, which provider we wanted to pull in um, by sort of, you know, providing a more detailed route. And this was, I think, a two-line change. So I think we made this change and then we had to change one thing about how it was referenced later on. But this two-line change took that 1.8 megabytes down to 194 kilobytes. That's a 1.675 or 1.675. 1.65 megabyte reduction from a one line change. Um, so the lesson here is it pays to read the documentation, even if the documentation is extremely verbose. And even if the information you actually need is hidden very, very deeply inside of that verbose documentation. Um, now sometimes you get big wins like this. If you have a very large bundle, in fact, like if you have a bundle that's you know in any sort of megabyte range, I'm betting you have some big savings. We probably have a few things you can shave very quickly. Um, but most of the time, performance improvements don't happen in one big, massive chunk. Unfortunately, I wish they did. Most of the time, it's more a matter of chiseling away. And so that's what we kind of did after this. So again, looking at the bundle analyzer, we saw View Apollo. Uh, 52 kilobytes seemed a little excessive. Uh, so we went to this uh, fancy tool called Google, uh, where you can type in a query, and it tells you what other people are looking for, too. And it turns out that everybody's been complaining about View Apollo. Uh, and so on GitHub, we saw that there was already work done on a newer version of the library to reduce the size. So what they did is originally they had these other dependencies they were pulling in that were getting bundled into the View Apollo script. Um, so they changed their process to mark those as external. Um, so what this means is that they're using Rollup, but it would work the same for Webpack or whatever. Um, it has the opportunity to say, hold on, I don't necessarily want to, I'm going to be pulling those from an external source. Um, I don't need to bundle this into that one big JavaScript file. Um, you know, you can be a little bit more intelligent about how you're pulling things in. Uh, so we upgraded the version. Uh, we had to upgrade Nuxt Apollo. That was uh, what was actually pulling in View Apollo. Um, but once we did that, we got that down to 27 kilobytes. So a 15 kilobyte savings, not bad. Uh, the next thing that jumped out at us was this ui.common.js, which is 520 kilobytes. Um, 
this is storybook. It's a very popular UI components, you know, helper thing. Um, and again, this was a view app, so it was view storybook. Uh, so this was a view storybook instance and all of these components uh, running in this other build process were being pulled into this one giant file. So what we did is we ran Webpack bundle an an analysis on that build process on the storybook instance to see what was actually in there. And it became very obvious why this file was so big. Uh, view swiper, it turns out is kind of massive. Um, but you'll notice also that like the actual components is a small subset of what this, this massive file actually ends up being. Most of this is vendor scripts. Uh, and if you've got a keen eye and Zoom's resolution isn't too bad, uh, you'll see that there's core JS pulled in a couple different times. Um, we have Lodash coming in a couple different times. I think there's like Beautify or a few other. There's a few of these sorts of third party scripts that are actually bundled several times within this one big bundle. Um, the challenge here is that, so this build process, because it's not pulling those out and not properly figuring out we only need one version or marking things as external, it creates this one giant JavaScript file. So when it's consumed in the main app, the main app can't do anything intelligent with it. It can't say, oh, we're already using CoreJS. I don't need to put it here. Uh, because as far as it's concerned, all it's got is ui.com and .js. Um, so what we needed to do was we needed to prune this down so that the main app could make better decisions about what to pull in and what not to. So the first thing we did was we used Webpack aliases to make sure we only had one version of CoreJS. Now, Yarn and NPM, if you're using either one of them, they both feature deduplication, which is supposed to try and eliminate the fact that you'd have multiple versions of the same library being pulled in. It doesn't always work depending on how things are kind of pulled in and the differences in versions. Um, so in this case, what we use is the Webpack alias. And we said specifically, anytime you see CoreJS referenced, use this version that's located directly in the node modules folder. Um, so if anybody else, any other library is pulling CoreJS in, we're going to point it to this one instead. So we get one version. Um, and the other thing we did was, again, we recognized a few libs in here like ViewSwiper, uh, Viewlidate, things like that that were already in the main project. So we needed to tell this build process that we were going to pull them in from an external source. So just like what uh, View Apollo did, we marked them as externals. Um, we said, anytime you see ViewSwiper or ViewLidate um, or these ViewLidate validator things, um, we're going to pull those in externally. So you don't need to worry about bundling those into this big bundle. Um, we're going to let the main application deal with that and pull those in and, and deal with it at that level. So once we did this, once we uh, handled the aliases and marking these ex as externals, we brought the size of the UI.com and script down by about 60 kilobytes. Um, again, not 1.6 megabytes, but not bad. So from this short list of things that we did, we were able to bring the vendor bundle down from 2.6 megabytes to 898, a 66% reduction. Now, based on everything you've heard uh, today from me and from everybody else, obviously we'd love to be smaller than this, right? Um, but the rest is a process. There has been additional work. There has been additional weight shed. Um, but this was most of the low hanging fruit. So after this, it was things like refactoring some of the components themselves, uh, tweaking the bundling strategy so that we approach splitting a little bit differently, uh, reassessing certain things that we were using and trying to find alternatives. Um, again, there are a few overnight success stories and performance when they do happen. We love to tell them and everybody loves to hear them. But I also think we got to be careful, be realistic because most of us aren't going to find one change that's going to cut four seconds off our page. It happens sometimes and it's awesome, but usually it's just a little bit here and there, um, which is why I think one of the most important things you can do is focus on how do we maintain and then iterate. Um, it's always deflating when you make massive improvements and then they regress. And if you're not doing anything other than fixing these issues from a coding perspective, you are going to regress. The other problems are going to come back and they're going to resurface. It's critical to lay down the supporting groundwork and, and infrastructure and culture to help keep the weight off and get to a point where we're making it lighter, like we're progressing forward in the right way versus going backwards. So here's how I like to do it from a JavaScript perspective. And it's, uh, in an ideal scenario, I want to be warned or blocked when I install a library. I want to be warned or blocked in my code editor. I want to be blocked if I try to submit a pull request and things are too heavy. I want to be blocked if I try to do a deploy and things are too heavy. And if I do manage to get a deploy out, I want tracking and monitoring so that I'm able to look back and see exactly how that's impacting the folks coming to my site. Now, I know it's a lot and it seems maybe a little bit aggressive, but it's the way I like to do it. And I think it's sort of echoing what Melanie was saying earlier about 
this importance of shifting left into that developer workflow, the more checks and balances you have, the better. And the closer you do it to where the developer is writing code, the better. If deploy is the first time I'm finding out things are slow or things are not performing well, then at that point, I've done a ton of work. And now I have to go back and try to refactor it all. I'm going to get really frustrated. I'm going to miss deadlines. Um, that's where you start to cut corners. And that's where the business might say, oh, we'll come back and fix the performance later. And that's how you get right back into the situation you were in. But if you can catch me writing code at the very beginning, like as I'm writing the initial code, as I'm building the feature, as I'm installing the library, I can avoid the issues altogether before I sink a ton of time and energy and resources into it. And it's very achievable. Um, I don't know how many people have seen Bundlephobia. It's a fantastic site. Um, love it. Uh, where you look at NPM modules and you can get information about the size of that module, of, you know, gzip versus parse, uh, approximately what it means to download that, if it's tree shakeable. Um, you also get information like similar packages, um, alternatives that might be lighter. So one thing you hear a lot about if you've ever read anything about bundle analysis or improving bundle size or song talks, moment day, moment JS or Lodash, those two get tossed around a ton. Uh, specifically for Moment, it's you know swapping it to something like DateFNS or, or something like that. Um, and those are good optimizations. And this is something where if I have this data up presented to me up front, I don't have to switch. I just build my app that way from the start. And I can use this to guide my decisions. So there are tools that are built on top of Bundlephobia that help with this. Uh, there's Bundlephobia CLI, um, which has a Bundlephobia install uh, fee, uh, command. Um, what it does is it'll imply a size, or apply a size limit to any library you try to install. So in this case, there's a size limit of 100 kilobytes, and we're trying to install AWS SDK, and it's telling me, nope, can't install it. It exceeds your budget. Um, this is configurable in package.json, so you can set custom size you know, to whatever you want it to be. Now, if you want to install AWS SDK, like you absolutely need it, you can still do it, but now you have to run the command in interactive mode and explicitly say, I'm okay with doing this, even though it exceeds my threshold, um, which you want that functionality available, but this makes it a very conscious decision. Then in the code editor, there's a thing called import cost for VS code, um, where anytime I'm importing a module, um, it's going to put as a little aside there, what size I'm actually adding to my, you know, when I'm doing this, like, oh, I'm adding 68K by including view. Um, this doesn't stop me from doing anything, but it provides contextual information at the moment where I'm writing the code so I can at least um, get that information presented to me in a way that I'm seeing it and aware that I'm making that decision. And then of course, on the PR, um, we've seen, uh, there's countless examples of different tools like Bundle Size or Bundle Buddy, this is Bundle Size, um, that you can integrate with your continuous integration environment or GitHub uh, to warn or break uh, the build um, if a certain threshold is exceeded. Um, you'll notice that, by the way, that bundle size does provide a threshold here, like there's a limit, um, but there's also a little bit of a wiggle room here. Uh, that's important. Um, there's one company that uh, was talking to about how they had rolled something out that broke the build if things got too heavy, but they didn't include a threshold. And so the first developer who ran into it uh, found out that their package size limit was exceeded by 82 bytes and <laughs> broke the build. Um, it was a rounding error, so they fixed that. But then the next person who ran into it, uh, their build was broke because a sub-dependency change that added one kilobyte of, of JavaScript. Um, so a little bit of wiggle room to sort of prevent that kind of thing is important, but still having something that's breaking that process before, you know, so that you stop this heavy stuff from going out ever is a really important part in making sure that you don't regress. It's all about introducing healthy friction into the process. Modern tools do a great job of reducing friction and making it all too easy for us to add whatever we want to our sites and applications. We want to change that. We want to add some healthy friction. We want to make it hard to do the wrong things and easy to do the right things. Um, Mr. Hawksworth, I'm sorry, Sir Hawksworth, he gets really mad when you drop the sir. Uh, he, when, I really liked this tweet uh, that he was posting in his talk where he was talking about what did I do to make this so fast? Nothing, I just didn't do anything to make it slow. Right now, our default stance is the opposite. Our default stance makes it very easy to add more and more JavaScript to our apps. It's literally an NPM install away. We need to flip the script and make it difficult to ship something that performs badly. If we've built a web that dismisses the affordable, typical Android device, the lower powered networks, and the people that use them and that are on them. 
And I don't think that we've done this because we're bad people. I don't think we've done this because we don't care. It happens because we can. It happens because the technology that you and I use every day can handle it, but not everyone's technology can. Our technology doesn't have the constraints that, you know, technology that uh, years ago did. We don't have to worry about four kilobytes here and there, um, which is why I think it's so important that we find ways to bring those constraints back into our process and back into the tools that we use so that we're constantly being encouraged to chip away at the piles of script that we're using right now and that we build these fast, faster and lighter experiences and that we keep them that way. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. I mean, Phil, <laughs> you mentioned Phil. Oh, no. I didn't oh. even know what you were talking. Uh, oh, that yep. was terrible. Oh, no, gosh, right. I should no. know better. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it, Emily. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> or maybe I should just start calling you Tom from now on. Perfect. Okay, perfect. <laughs> My excuse is that it's it's eight thirty where I am, and it's it's getting late. So, <laughs> um, thanks. It's been again a long day, and you've done a lot of work. Yes. You've been awesome. It's, thank you, thank You're you. Good. I appreciate that. Um, anyways, thank you for that. I I really loved the comparison that you made between, you know, a one point seven like megabyte or yeah, my 1.7 megabytes for the Apollo 11 command module. And I, I probably definitely send two megabytes of uncompressed JavaScript for sure on my site. <laughs> so yeah, no, that I think that gave us a lot to think about and I'm hopeful that folks will go back now and take a look at what they can do to monitor their bundle size and really you know, keep track of their JavaScript so, yeah, hopefully, all right. I, so I'll be around if anybody, by the way, wants to, you know, today, tomorrow, or honestly, I'm kind of in the Perf Matters Slack channel stuff all year. Yeah. So if anybody has questions or wants to ping me, feel free to do so. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Estelle. Thanks to everyone who spoke today. Thanks to all of the amazing attendees. Um, everyone has been really great, and there's don't been a lot of yet. folks. Don't leave yet. I'm not um, leaving. No, no, other people. I just okay. Don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> folks have been really active and participating in Slack and participating in the chat, and it's been really great. Um, it's really hard to do this remotely without getting any feedback from the audience. Um, so we super appreciate all of the feedback and kindness that everyone has shown. So um, with that. I will hand everyone back to Estelle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. This has been awesome. You've been awesome at presenting. And please don't leave because we actually have um, a, a show for you, which um, we will ask people to actively participate. But we're going to start with the show. So if you want to take a break, the break should be to get your Zoom mates, as in your kids and your pets, uh, to come watch the first two performances are super kid friendly. I assume the rest will be kid friendly. Um, but the first two, the, I like to make the theme of our uh, conference parties a five year old's birthday party, because I think we are all little kids at heart. Um, and if you're not, we're going to try to convert you back to a little kid. So um, before you make your popcorn, which the popcorn was for this evening, uh, let's go on with our first two performances. But before we do that, I just want to give a shout out um, and a thanks to all our speakers. That was just a fantastic day. I'm exhausted. My brain's exhausted. So I'm ready for this party. Um, I learned so much and it was actually great to have it online because I could walk around with my computer while I was, you know, fixing everything and um, actually pay attention this year. Unlike actually in person where I miss some of it when I go into the hallway check. So, um, before we get started with our party, I just want to give a shout out to our sponsors again, uh, GoDaddy and Chrome uh, Dev uh, are our gold sponsors, Mozilla and Front End Masters are our silver sponsors, and we also have three community sponsors. We have Speedcurve, um, uh, Precise Moves Chiropractic, 
and uh, Sticker Mule. So thank you to everyone. Now, um, uh, Michelle, are you ready to go on? Because I don't see your uh, video. Um, I see you off video. Are you ready for your performance? Yes. So let me do a brief in, um, intro to Michelle. Michelle has been behind the scenes today, uh, making you go into uh, the right uh, conversation room. And if you do want to talk to each other, if you don't have a room to go to, oh, there aren't that many chatting people chatting right now. So why don't I just put, tell everyone to go into the room with the name of Aaron, A-A-R-O-N. Um, you can actually voice chat and watch the performance at the same time. Um, or you can just stay here and uh, we will um, make it interactive after a few performances. So let's, uh, let me pass it on to Michelle, who um, is our party coordinator and um, our social activity uh, person for the conference. And take it away, Michelle. because it's not coming through very well. Would love to just see you pre present it without the music in the background. Thank you. If it was easy, everyone would do it. But sometimes I do have to make it look hard. <laughs> 